2022 Legends of Runeterra World Championships. It is my pleasure and honor to be here alongside all of these incredible casters to bring you the final day of Worlds action. This is going to be a big day. Oh yeah. Day three, we are looking forward to crown a new brand champion. The world champion will be decided today. The players have struggled for two days of competition so far, and I know that they're going to throw down when everything is on the line. Right now, it's time to clutch up or shut up. This is the last chance to get through and find the win. You cannot lose here. It is that single elimination. You have to put everything out there. And to quote one of our good friends who dropped out in the top 16, what am I? You got to play a beautiful game. I think all of our players are going to be playing beautiful, incredible games today. But it's been already a long road to get here. We've had two days of competition action, 24 best of threes total as 16 players started off in this world championship. And we've already whittled it down to the top eight. Those eight players will be playing in a single elimination bracket today. And all the matches are best of three. And you're absolutely right. While on days one and two, Maybe had a little bit of wiggle room there playing those round robins, but today it is for all the marbles. You lose, you're out. So the stakes are super high when you look at the matches that we've got going on today. But when we look back at days one and two, there were so many incredible moments, so many incredible players already. What were some of your favorite moments? Oh, by far the Teddy's game um, where he played Vayne against Leona, where he had this, those perfect hand reads. He took, he took a risky line to have a read if there is any pale cascade single combat. Once he had a read, he just went uh, full in and he closed the game within two runs. To execute at that level where it's almost like you can see your opponent's hand is exactly the sort of thing we're expecting from a world championship level competitor. My favorite moment certainly was uh, Kicker just completely pivoting after his sun disc was destroyed into a rock bear rock beat bears. down <laughs> showdown. <It's> rock bears. <laughs> Absolutely love the rock bear beat down. That was insane. Uh, for me, it's got to be Aragorn with that Talia Ziggs running the black flame, filling up the stack. It was such a creative and interesting deck list and lineup decision from him. One we did not expect to see at all. It wasn't really heavily on our radar. And then Aragorn coming in and piloting it so expertly as though he had just millions of reps on this deck. <laughs> I think all of us were surprised how well Rock Berms performed. Yes. And how well they lined up with the 5-5 five -five stat line. It's been really cool to see all of these incredible tech choices. I mean, the, the player expressions as well during these games. We've gotten some high highs, some low lows, but to see how these players have performed under the pressure, <laughs> like how they feel, that was that was great that timing, Bowie, thank you. Um, but it's like to see that though too, like you can feel how much this tournament means to every player. Oh, most definitely. If you're now in the top cut, if you're gonna lose a game, you are almost out. You have to bring your A game. If there was a time, this is it. And these are the eight players that are performing today in the single elimination bracket. They've made it all the way here through the seasonals, through qualifiers, through days one and two. And we have some incredible players battling it out for a $200,000 prize pool. But I feel like on top of that, on top of the title, the biggest incredible trophy of all. Alan, you know what it feels like to hold this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that's really where it's at, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a sign you want. Ah, I would love to have another one. <laughs> <laughs> next year. Next I'm year? Next year, Alan. Maybe next year. Maybe? We're Maybe. replacing you this time. <laughs> uh, yeah, you got you to gotta hand the, the reins over a little bit. But this is how the bracket is going to play out today, where all of our players have lined up. Is there any match that, when you're looking at this bracket, sticks out to you as one you're excited to see today? I think that, first and foremost, I want to call attention to Aragorn and Bois. These are younger players who, in their, you know, kind of interview starting off, said that they were kind of just happy to make it to this level. Um, they were happy to make it to the qualifiers and up through the top eight, but they need to keep that hunger. I hope they continue to strive and say, I can go for it all. All right, but we cannot miss the most exciting and skillful matchup that's probably going to be up there. 
Baya against Rero. That will be a really, really exciting match to watch. Yeah, I mean, easily at the start of the tournament, we had predicted Baya and Reroll as two potential favorites to win the whole thing. They're matching up here in the round of eight. That's going to be an absolute masterpiece of a match. We definitely cannot wait to see that one. That whole top side of the bracket is terrifying. Yeah, that match is essentially, I think, a grand finals from an alternate timeline. If this <laughs> bracket shakes Good out any that. different way, um, we're going, regardless, going to see monumental matches here. I feel like you could look at a lot of the matches in the top of A, literally across the bracket, and you'd be like, oh, well, both of these two players could have made it to the grand finals. Like, it's yeah. all grand finals matches in the making here. But when you look across the regions that are being represented in these top eight finalists, Alan, there's a pretty good possibility you might be handing the trophy over to a European player. Okay, guys, no one is surprised. Five EM <laughs> EA players made through. The only question is, is it going to be 3 AM? Is it going to be 1 AM, 2? And how many APAC players? How do you guys feel about it? <laughs> I mean, as we've gotten into the kind of makeup at the top eight, we know that South Korea has shown up big. They really didn't have a chance to prove their, you know, medal on the bigger stage last year. And now they are showing us that they've been overlooked and they're here to compete. Well, I will say it's one of the big things with the APAC, APAC being combined together this time around, mm -hmm. being able to have, you know, the strength of SEA, Vietnam, a lot of the other regions in the SEA region that are coming together with Korea that helped them kind of prep and get a lot better this year than they were last year. And now we have some of the best of Korea here to play with Chenia and Reroll in the top eight. I'm not convinced, even if you play the numbers game, that yes, Europe's got five players in fighting for that title, that they're going to be t able to take it over Korea this year. I think that, oh, I just am so excited to see, like, how these players are going to perform under the pressure today. But also, how are these interesting tech choices that some of these players are including in their deck really going to play a role today? Because we've already seen how impactful the cards from the new expansion have really played a hand in the meta that has unfolded in this tournament so far. Oh yeah, by far the one of the highlights, Silas and Suppress from mm, Smooth. Yeah. Looking, yes. and it's not over. He's bringing it back to the top cut. Yeah, if you're talking about sick tech, I mean, that was definitely the highlight, especially the Widowed Huntress coming through as well, getting these darkened weapons into play to combine with the World Ender and get these explosive turns. And then the thing is, is I know we talked about Rock Bear a lot, but we even said it yesterday, Rock Bear Shepard may be the best performing card from the new set. We which is the biggest <laughs> surprise to us, right? We knew Aatrox was going to be good. We knew some of these, you know, uh, darkened cards, the, the Huntress coming in. We, we knew some of these cards were going to be solid. But Rock Bear Shepard? None of us were sitting around doing our prep before this tournament came and was like, yeah, Rock Bear Shepard's about to dominate a lot of the group stage. <laughs> Also, Black Flame with Black Flame. <laughs> <laughs> you can't forget about Black Flame. With Talia? Or just out of nowhere? Does it no. count as tech to call out champion strength <laughs> one more time? Oh. Look at this awesome tech. I've Sometimes. got eight mana win buttons. If Let's anything, go. though, that one underperformed our expectations, which was surprising because it's still a very powerful card. I'm not going to say it's a weak card. It just no. underperformed what we thought it it's might just do. inconsistent. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, champion strength is going to play a hand in the matchup that we've got coming up for you first today and that is our first quarterfinals match that will be between Teddy and Maddie 24 Mayo. I, I, I've got a big thing for this one right Maddie last bastion of hope for the Americas he's the only one who made it into this top eight he is on the top side of the bracket with three seasonal champions he's the only one who doesn't have a seasonal under his belt against those three powerhouses he has his work cut out for him and he's starting with Teddy, who people have thought had played the cleanest on day one. He is a big underdog in this, but I know Maddie is an incredibly skilled player. He has what it takes in the skill department to take this match. All right, but the, what Teddy is doing, it's completely different level of Runter at this point. He's a beast. Like, the, the, what he's doing, like, no one ever done it. We'll be watching his games and analyzing the, the way he play. Yeah, I think Beast is absolutely appropriate to describe this player. He's been playing ferociously, but there is sort of, at, especially at this level, an X factor that these players can sometimes tap into. When the stress and the stakes get so high, the players just focus up. And Maddie had a very unique meta read 
And if those matchups do come through, it could be very spectacular for him. Well, there's only one way to find out, and that's to get ready for our first quarterfinals match of the day. So let's send it over to Boulevard and Silverfuse to bring us through that action. Thank you so much, Necro. My name is Boulevard. Joining me is Silverfuse. Who, Silver, I'm sure you are more excited than anyone for this top eight to get started because half of the competitors left do have Jinx in their lineup. And in fact, both of these players, Teddy and Maddie, our first match of the day, do both have Jinx decks. Hey, it was a solid bring, a really great call. In this case, they both have champion strength as well. And seeing it with the Poros and Jinx, there's so many win conditions and so much pressure that these decks put on. And not just that, but the narrative perspective as well. Maddie really has to fight through Teddy, one of the favorites of the tournament, as the desk was mentioning. But here we're going to take a look at Teddy's lineup. We have the Aatrox, Vane Quinn, the Mono Jinx champion strength, as well as the Seraphine Ezreal Victor that has been going crazy so far. Silver, I know you're really excited to see this Jinx in action. We're hoping that at least one of these slip through the ban phase. I mean, really, all these decks, though, from Teddy are just so solid. This lineup is incredible, and on top of that, his play has been incredible. I really think it's going to be tough for Maddie to be able to win here, but let's take a look at this Jinx deck. We do have the Champion Strength Jinx. We have the Acorn Hex te Technician to be able to lower the cost of the Champion Strength, putting more pressure. Poro Cannon able to discard and make plenty of units on. It's just, this deck is a masterpiece. And you can see here, it's broken down by region. Only three Demacia cards in the entire deck. It's just Ranger's Resolve, Broadwing, and Champion Strength. This is almost a purely PNZ deck, and a lot more draw power coming out of this than the list from Maddie. You can see three stress testing there. Going over to Maddie's lineup, we actually have two Champion Strength decks. It's the Nora Poppy, as well as the Teemo Lucian Jinx, playing a little bit more than just the Mono. And finally, that Conservatory that has been a little bit of a question mark from us of around Maddie 24 Mayo, you know, going two and three with that deck in the group stage. Yeah, it's proven to be pretty tough here. I mean, really, each game the Conservatory deck has won has been incredibly close, and it hasn't really had any clean wins. But let's go ahead and take a look at the Poppy deck. It has Nora as well, so you're able to flood the board and then capitalize off of that through the Poppy as well as the Champion Strength. You know, I imagine for the next few weeks, we're going to be taking a look at decks, and we're just going to see Rangers Resolve, Champion Strength, maybe one other Demacia card against, you know, pretty much the rest of it just filled out by the one region. And this time, Poppy, actually a very good secondary win condition. We were talking about this a little bit in some of the other lineups where players were not really having a secondary win con than that champion strength. Yeah, and not only that, it also does run the Golden Ages. A lot of players have cut this card, but saying, you know what, if I don't draw the champion strength, I still want a way to rally my powerful board and be able to end games. And we've got a couple of healthier units out of that list, but it looks like we are going to get into the bans here. And I believe I am seeing that both Jinx have been left open and Conservatory was actually the ban. Wow, that's not really expected here. I mean, there's something about this deck where Teddy felt like his lineup didn't go well into it because we've seen the struggle of this deck. So I'm surprised. I mean, Teddy is a brilliant player, so I assume he just didn't like some of these matchups or maybe some mind games were at play. We've got a Jinx Mirror for game number one, Silver Fuse, and it's Jinx in the opening Mirror. hand for both players. And we even see two in hand. I assume probably won't be keeping those. Uh, you kind of want to find her later in the game to be able to put her down. But I think Let's this is an interesting matchup because Maddie has ways to generate additional value here. Maddie is also the one with the champion strength in the opening hand. That is something we are going to have to keep an eye on as this game progresses. Maddie, the one that's really looking to get it and will have the attack token on six, not five. And also, too, Teddy is stuck with a double Jinx here in hand. I mean, we love Jinx and we know she's powerful, but having two, meaning that you either have to play a pretty expensive Get Excited, and there's not really the removal here, too, where it's like, oh, you've removed my Jinx. I guess I'll just put down a second Jinx. And it looks like it was actually a hex or a um, anomaly picked up by Maddie. That is going to be changing every single turn until we can get that online. But Maddie, definitely advantage here having that champion strength in the opening hand. And like you said, the Jinx is kind of awkward. Yeah, I must point out that this hex tech anomaly, personally, one of my favorite cards. I mean, you would never guess why, but it could allow us to see something really interesting happen that's not expected. I'm worried that we will see something expected. Another champion strength. It is something that it can turn Ooh. back into. It is an eight plus mana card. And if Maddie can find two copies of that to slam back to back. But before we get into the champion strength, as the players are kind of building up their boards here, you know, we mentioned Maddie, the one probably going to be less likely to trade, but Teddy doesn't have much agency in that. There's Teddy doesn't have anything to trade with. You don't want to throw those Poros down and, you know, take off the units for it because we mentioned Poro Cannon plus champion strength alone is 20 damage. Yeah, I mean, if though Teddy does find a champion strength soon, these Poros are looking pretty nasty. 
And we've got, you know, a couple of units on board for both players. Both players actually banking two Spellman into the next turn, thanks to the Eager Apprentice giving that back over to Maddie. But once we look at the hands, that get excited, that Jinxes get excited for Teddy could be a big difference maker here as Maddie really cannot empty the hand. Yeah, Maddie's hand, uh, I mean, does have those high cost spells, but does have plenty of ways to discard in the future. So there's potential that Jinx will see level. I mean, there's so many different ways to take this. And that's why discard aggressive decks are so interesting. And I'm actually kind of concerned for Maddie. Picking up the Get Excited, very good, because this anomaly is looking like something that's going to be a little awkward to get out of the hand if we want to level the Jinx or protect her from a Get Excited. And on the side of Teddy, if you can get off that super mega Death Rocket before the champion strength comes down, that will be game ending. But Teddy does not look happy about the current hand state. Yeah, I still feel like that double Jinx is... It's tough to deal with because if you play a Jinx into a Get Excited, that tempo isn't really where you want it to be. Looking at these seven mana spells for Maddie, you know, the, the burning, piercing darkness, dawning light, whatever it's called, not really a great option, not available actually on this turn. And I'm really keeping an eye on this. Maybe we can get a big removal spell. And honestly, Ruination, something that might be in the cards here to really shake things up a bit. With Hextech Anomaly, anything is possible. And we will see that first Jinx get removed. Yeah, no Ranger's Resolve coming out of Teddy, saving this for probably a Super Mega Death Rocket down the line. And Rummage picked up means Teddy is... Ooh, Hex Obliterator, though, for Maddie. Oh. If Teddy tries to throw down the Jinx this turn, we could get a big punish. Oh, are we and going to see is. it right now? I hope so. I mean, Maddie's still... Oh, oh man, she's going, going for the, the champion strike. On. Maybe just kind of hovering the eye, seeing what this looks like, because this will just yeah. rally. It won't give scout over. It's not game ending. It's just board clearing. Yeah, I mean, being able to clear the Jinx, too. I mean, we've seen how strong she can be when she does go off. I mean, I've wanted to see it more, but she will be removed. That's just the power of her, though. You have to get rid of her because she, when she levels up, she does so much damage and would clear Maddie's board. Yeah, and I think Maddie might have been, you know, sort of contemplating that champion strength under the assumption that Teddy will have one in the future. They're both just kind of staring at each other, and Teddy's the one with the elusive right now. That is sort of the big pressure point that Teddy has. Doesn't have the payoff for it, but Maddie's unaware. Yeah, at the time, Teddy's hand is looking pretty awkward, but did find that rummage to hopefully be able to discard in the future here. I mean, if he's able to draw into a solid card, I can see this flipping on its head pretty quick. Another Jinx pickup, a stress testing for Teddy, and I do want to point out, Teddy choosing not to level the Jinx last turn could have done it with Rummage and Ranger's Resolve, but would have had no mana left to play the Super Mega Death Rocket. And with just one more mana, I think that rocket clearing Maddie's board could have been a huge swing, but now we're seeing the champion strength. And... Oh, Teddy staring down the champion strength, not able to do anything about it. No response, plus four, plus four, and scout to Maddie's entire board. Gonna push through all of the blockers here, but with Rummage and two more Flame Chompers, I'm pretty sure Teddy's not going to die here. Yeah, I mean, this Rummage is going to come in clutch, allowing you to, to not have to play one unit at a time. That makes an incredible difference here. And looks like we will see it right now. So Teddy can plan his future moves by seeing what this draw is, and he finds his own champion strength. Oh, and then actually, because of that, gonna pull back the daring Poro. There is still Scout and a Challenger on Maddie's board, so this Poro likely to end up going down anyway, but Teddy is gonna force the block. And that's part of the reason why Alan was saying Teddy has played so clean. He's thinking about his future turns. He's not just saying, oh, I need to live this turn. Hopefully this works out. He's drawing, he's looking at his board, he's planning his future turns to be able to take down Maddie. And he can actually take a couple of hits here. You know, there is a Get Excited as well as two Jinx in the hand of Maddie 24 Mayo, just one Get Excited in the deck. So you can't fall down too low here. You do have to be a little bit respectful of the ranges. And I think that's why we saw Maddie pull the trigger on the champion strength this turn, just knowing that you can get through enough damage, clear Teddy's board, take their champion strength off the board, and go for the Jinx win con. I mean, Maddie's still here. I mean, he's still looking pretty good here. I mean, Teddy, you kind of saw the head shake, 10 health, does have the champion strength, but lost most of the units that would benefit from it. And now you can use champion strength just to get scout onto a challenger, but with only one challenger, things are a little awkward. And get excited in the hand of Maddie with three mana means that you actually could kill the Petrocyte Broadwing. No mana for Ranger's Resolve if champion strength is played. 
Yeah, I mean, Maddie's looking good here. You can see Teddy's like, this is not the way this wanted to go. I mean, we saw Maddie at the start had the champion strength in hand, and that allows you to formulate your game plan in a way that you're able to take advantage of it and making sure not to play it earlier, waiting that one extra turn to get the most value possible. It's Teddy's turn. The rope is coming. You can see the hand's not even on the keyboard. Teddy just kind of contemplating, what am I going to do in the next game? This one is looking all but doomed here. Teddy, no way to refill the board and that's stress testing Silverfuse sitting dead in hand we were wondering about this when we were going over the deck list you know sort of forced to rummage for blockers here so not able to get that fleeting draw I mean on top of that we do see that he has so much draw in this deck and was still drawing the champion strength second in this case being able to play champion strength first being able to clear the board is what needed to happen in this game and now we have no challenger on the broad wing that is buffed up by the champion strength very easy blocks from maddie 24 mayo who should be picking this up on the next turn once the jinx levels but teddy just unable to get on board stay on board didn't have the tools available that double jinx nowhere near as good as the first champion strength of the game and the fact that this didn't have challenger to challenge the jinx but here we go we're going for the attack Got a rummage for Teddy with the stress testing. That's three draws down the line. Trying to look at the deck list here and see if there's anything that could save them. Jury Rig is a potential blocker for the situation. Save a little bit of HP because you just need to stay above four so that this rocket doesn't kill you as Maddie can just play out the rest of their hand. And let's see what he draws. He gets a fleeting Jinx not going to help him here. Ooh, oh, not, not looking good. I Deal. I do not think Teddy going to be able to do anything about this super mega death rocket from Maddie, who you can start to see popping off a little bit, is in the zone, knows that this one is all but wrapped up. Yeah, and we'll be going on to game two quite shortly here. I mean, we see Maddie jamming out, <laughs> having a grand time. Champion strength first helps a lot. Yeah, and Teddy was the one with the more favorable attack turn for that. You know, would have been able, if they had the board, play it on turn five, get the scout off of it. It's kind of weird if they're just bumping into each other, but that's not how it played out here. And we do get to see the Star Guardian Jinx level up animation, a little bit different than the traditional. And the Super Mega Death Rocket should be coming in for both players post haste. But one will be destroying a Nexus and the other not doing so much. No, it's gonna, well, it's gonna clear out an entire board just a little bit too little too late. The champion strength has already resolved. The damage has been done. And Silverfuse, Maddie 24 Mayo, the last representative from the America's Shard, gonna be picking up game number one over seasonal champion Teddy. I mean, giving America a nice breath of fresh air because we needed it, especially against someone as strong as Teddy. Maddie keeping our hopes alive for the Americas to advance. However, Teddy, an amazing player, so game two could go to anyone. That is true, but for the time being, this is a big win for Maddie, and that conservatory taken off the table from him means that the decks that are left are ones that he has not lost with yet with this tournament. Uh, Ted, he's only lost on the conservatory in the group stage. Yeah, I wonder if Maddie kind of felt just a weight off his shoulders when he saw that conservatory ban. I, I, it's kind of hard to say because, like, he brought the deck, so he's probably not like, oh, yeah, this is my weak point. I'm sure that he still feels comfortable on it and actually had some decent matchups lined up with it on paper. You know, the red card, the make it rain, doing a lot of work against specifically that Jinx matchup that we just saw. But now we're getting straight into game number two, and it's going to be another champion strength deck for Maddie and another one for Teddy as well. Both players with it in the opening hand. It looks like Teddy has the attack token on odds. Ooh, this could just come down to champion strength on five being the big winner. Yeah, Maddie's got, you know, Nora as well as the team maker actually ships it away. A lot of ways to generate portals and additional units here, though. Maddie probably going to have a wider board once this comes down if the portals come out in a timely enough fashion. Yeah, also, too, with this Nora, we'll be able to stop Poros in the future. Acorn in the opening hand for Teddy, and no turn one elusive for Maddie. Teddy's got the attack token. That's going to be a seven mana Ooh. champion strength. That could be really impactful if we've got enough elusives to rally when the time comes. Yeah, that is. I mean, these Acorn slots making this champion strength already only eight mana, going to seven mana instead can make some impactful turns. Not just that, but if Teddy does still stick to the traditional game plan, play my champion strength on five when I have the attack token, because it'll have a reduced cost, he'll have mana for Ranger's Resolve. And usually if both players go for the champion strength, they're just running their boards into each other. If Teddy has the tough keyword on top of that, that could close out the game. 
I mean, yeah, the stats on top of Ranger's Resolve make removing almost impossible. Makes the Jinx Rocket not hit as hard. I mean, we don't see Jinx in the hand at the time. We are seeing a slightly awkward hand for Maddie. He does have the Nora. Hopefully for him, he can pull out some impactful portals. He's got more elusives than Teddy does, and the portals, you know, they, they could be anything, Silverfuse. They could be an elusive, they could be a detrimental card. I mean, I think one of the cards that I'm really looking for here would be Stony Suppressor as something that could really shake up this matchup as a randomly generated unit. Stony Suppressor! That would... <laughs> oh, I've seen it happen before. It could happen! At the moment, though, I'd say Teddy's got a better chance at going wide here. Actually picking up a stress testing as well. Sort of a maybe an awkward card to play here specifically. You do have Jinx and Champion Strength that you could still pick up. Not enough mana left over to really sort of feng shui with that one. But Maddie, you know, kind of a, a cut and dry turn here. We've got the Otter Post. We've got a two drop that we can throw down and start to play more for the board while Teddy builds it up for his attack turn. And we do discard a stress testing and find a flame chopper that way. However, that rummage in hand right now is looking pretty good. And even if the rummage doesn't go onto this flame chompers, fleeting cards get discarded at end of round. It's just going to summon itself. It doesn't need to be discarded by a card effect. I was more thinking of you have two discard targets besides that into a potential champion strength in the future. You have a full board with challengers ready to go. Yeah, with Maddie not playing the Jinx, there's nothing to deal with your one HP board. You could actually pull both elusives out of the way and hit with Acorn one more time, and there's no real punish for those one HP chompers. Yeah, I mean, that extra Acorn pull, I don't think it will be super necessary, but it could be. Passes up on the Rummage. Only six mana, no champion strength going to be available for this turn, and Maddie going in with his elusive is going to get a portal into the top four as well as a Hungry Alcat immediately to the hand. And important to note, even if these units weren't elusive, Teddy wouldn't be trading here anyway with his champion strength in hand. No, and I'm really excited to see we're about to get into turn five. Teddy has a little bit more development, but there's a prank in the hand of Maddie. Do you roll the dice on that one here? Are you trying to fish out the champion Every time. going into this? Every single time, and he did not hit it. Ranger's Resolve might be a good hit here, though. We talked about how that could be a big counterplay if both players fire off this uh, champion strength on the same turn, and yeah, gonna prank up that Ranger's Resolve two, three mana. I mean, not hitting the champion strength, though. If he would have hit that, he would be able to play champion strength first. Yeah, it would be kind of awkward because on Maddie's attack turn, it'd still be nine mana for Teddy. So, like, the cost reduction and the cost addition still kind of playing out well enough in the future. But now we're getting a rummage to a six wide board for Teddy, really getting ready for this big champion strength. He is ready to go, and I'm looking to see Maddie's face. He's trying to see, hey, does this have champion strength here? He's waiting for it, and there it is. He <laughs> saw a little bit of a grimace there, saying, oh no, that's not what I wanted to see. Seven mana. I mean, knows the Rangers Resolve, there's two of them, so there could be another one going to play his own champion strength here, but Teddy has a wider board with challengers. And Maddie's units don't get scout here. It just rallies if you didn't already have the attack token, and Maddie has more elusives, but it's not going to be a game-ending push from Maddie at least. I mean, there's still so much damage and pressure coming in, and Maddie having to use his defensively, he will get some elusive attacks in, but it's just not chipping away enough, and seeing this hand... It's looking not great here, and unfortunately, Acorn gonna not be able to reduce Ranger's Resolve back down to one mana in a timely enough fashion for it to play out in this turn, but Maddie being forced to block here, we're gonna see three units left on the side of Maddie and four on the side of Teddy once this combat is over. And still, I want to point out these challenger units. I mean, Flame Chompers has always been a pretty good card, but since Lulu and now this champion strength, it just makes uh, being able to trade with it. Oh, no attacks from Maddie actually not trading into the acorn and letting this go back over. This is going to live at one, which is not a very high number when Teddy does have the reach of the get excited or jinxes in the future. Not only that, but Teddy still has the board. Oh yeah, Teddy's board is incredible. If he finds any way to discard these stress testings to draw additional cards as well, I mean, he, well, he does have the Zanai Urchin in hand, but I mean, he can just continually refill his hand and find this extra damage he needs. Three portals off the top and a few elusives to boot for Maddie 24 Mayo. 
I mean, if he had a champion strength here, it <laughs> would help. A second copy. Wouldn't have the mana to play it, but it would be impressive nonetheless. Unfortunately, because Maddie didn't get to push any damage last turn, this Golden Age is not really looking like lethal either, even with the amount of elusives. And we're just going to prank up another Ranger's Resolve. I mean, there's both of them. Oh! So was that for a second? I thought it was a. It's the stress oh, testing. I'm gonna hit the stress testing with it. Interesting. Not wanting to give Teddy the option to hang on to the fleeting spells. If it was a champion strength that was drawn fleeting, you don't want them to be able to cast that for a, a nominal amount of mana and just hang on to that spell for the future. It would be game ending. And we will see the attack come in, trying to trade in with these acorns. And Need clearance power. more will be blocked. Looks like this is going to be a proactive Ranger's Resolve on the side of Teddy to preserve one of the Acorns as well as this 2-1. Both of the Acorns. 2-1 still showing is dying here because yeah. damage will go to the Nexus. This will turn into a 3-3. Three, three. But Teddy, like you mentioned, hanging on to the Acorns, but still so many elusives on the side of Maddie that you can't push one of these through. And Teddy really needs to find either a Jinx or a Get Excited to get this one finished out. Another champion strength, of course, would do it as well. Going for another prank here. Yeah, I mean, what will Maddie decide to prank? I mean, one of these is fleeting, so it's going to be going onto the board. And it is going to be the prank from Maddie anyway, who. Looking a little disheveled here. The pokey stick for Maddie, not enough, but actually that's very important protection. And a champion strength off the top for Teddy who has the Rangers resolve with the Poro Cannon. Silver Fuse, I think this might just be the end of the game. It's looking like we're going to be going to a game three. And this has been so quick from both of these competitors. The champion strength coming down so fast. And when we look at the decks that are left for both players, it's champion strength again. Teddy is playing a couple of copies of that card in his Vane Quinn Aatrox that'll have to take the win over this Poppy Nora if he's going to move on to the semifinals. I mean, I feel like we're finally seeing the true power of this card. When you draw it and when you're able to play it on five with a full board like this, I do believe that these are the better builds of it using the Poro Cannon, using Jinx. I mean, there's just so much pressure in it's non-stop. A champion strength off the top for Maddie, but no mana to play it in response this time around. Teddy gonna have sole control of the board, gets scout and plus four, plus four onto all of his units yet again with three elusives on the board and only three elusive blockers for Maddie. This is gonna be the GG Shen actually thrown up from both players and the surrender from Maddie tying up the series 1-1 one, one for Teddy. Yeah, saving some time there. Really want to take everything step by step, thinking about future turns for this game three. It is maybe the most important game of their lives. Yeah, and now we're going to see Teddy move on to this Vane Quinn Aatrox, which playing champion strength, but not nearly as committed to it as we've seen out of the Jinx build. You know, only 11 followers in the list. And while the Darken are going to help up with that a little bit, getting those Darken thralls online from the Blood Letters, just kind of flooding the board a little bit more. This is not the dedicated champion strength build. It's not going to match Maddie on board. And we saw Maddie have a little bit of an awkward hand start, and oh no! And another awkward hand start. Two Double. Golden Ages in the opener. Double Golden Ages. Oh, that's brutal. On the side of Teddy, not a bad curve here. The Steadfast Elkin really going to hold down the early game alongside that Darken Ages. I mean, Maddie's going to have to play this game carefully. I mean, Double Golden Ages is just. It's tough. Champion strength again in the opener for Teddy, and actually not a bad hand to open with it because we do see the darkened blood letters. Those darkened thralls, sure they can't block, but they'll be five five scouts all the same if you let them sit on board for a champion strength. And these Demacia decks with Vayne and Aatrox often have a pretty good time against some of these uh, champion strength decks because they have so many challenger units. They're able to pick off the small health units that you're looking to add buffs and rally. But when you have challenger, they're not too much of an issue. Speaking of not being an issue, with two pranks in Maddie's hand, this champion strength might not be an issue. Could if you know, the RNG favors Maddie. Could prank this card all the way up to 12 mana, unplayable until turn 9. Yeah, turn 9 is a little bit farther along than what Teddy is looking to play it, but it is kind of a second or maybe even third win condition here because, I mean, a lot of times the World Ender is the win condition. That's true, and actually we see two really good prank targets here, either the Champion Strength or the Tumble, and like you mentioned, it's secondary. The primary win con for Teddy here is Challenger into Challenger into Vayne. <laughs> And we do see the champion strength get that extra two mana added to it. 
And I think that's important for Maddie, just not wanting that as an option for Teddy as a defense against Maddie's copy of Champion Strength, should one come in a timely enough fashion. Portal actually going to hit an elusive unit here. Maddie, something like three for four on elusives off of these portals so far this series? I mean, that's a, that's just a skilled player. <laughs> and actually, one with Augment as well. This knee Android going to get more powerful when Maddie pranks again. We've also got the Yordle Squire in hand. That shield, this elusive damage could rack up rather quickly. I mean, with elusive and a potential top deck of champion strength is maddie ever able to push it through here it's possible it depends on how much of the board teddy can clear up this turn you do have two challengers as well as a dark and harp to put on the fleet feather and maddie does not have any copies of pokey stick right now to defend against this so a few units going to be lost here this knee android probably not going to be as impactful as we might have hoped unfortunate here for maddie i mean if you had two other options in hand rather than double Golden Ages, and I don't think having the Golden Ages in here is an issue as it does add another win condition, but getting two of them stuck in your hand is so brutal, especially in a match like this. If we could see a Poppy top deck from Maddie, you know, would do a lot, not just in terms of building up the board, but keeping them healthy against the challengers that Teddy is outputting and would synergize very well with this Golden Ages, but we're going to lose an Otterpus, we're going to lose the Neandroid. It looks like three damage. I don't think Maddie's too keen on blocking this vein. Essentially, Matty needs to find one of his win conditions to stay in this game. A 9.4% chance to draw Poppy. We saw something similar yesterday in the final moments. Player had a 10% chance to draw the card they needed. Didn't quite find it, so the odds not looking great for Matty for this Poppy. I mean, this next draw is critical for him. I mean, a champion strength. You've got the mana for it off the top, Matty. What do you find off the top oh. of the deck? It is a third Otter Puss. Uh, at the bottom of the vari variance bucket just not where you want to be oh, it's so brutal in card games because variants uh, when it hits like this it's so hard when you're one and one a uh, game is on the line your and world championship bid is on the line it's just maddie pranking uh, two copies of the dark and blood letters gonna pick the one on the left if i saw that correctly and i mean this is the problem with the champion strength decks right yes you want to draw the champion strength on curve the game and in card but you play so many one drops that it's just so much more likely that that is going to be the card that you draw but these pranks not really paying dividends for maddie in a way that they would have hoped yes it was good to hit the champion strength initially but now that we're hitting dark and blood letters it's not feeling anywhere near as good and this vein starting to get away from maddie I mean, what do you do here as Matty? You can buff up your units. You can go for an attack, kind of. Yeah, I, I, the question here is how much does Matty want to attack? Because you do need to preserve your board to give yourself the top deck out of the champion strength. There are no more units in hand for Matty. These five are what he has to take home with him. So if he starts sending in trades now, and th it's not really up to Matty. Teddy still has two challengers, one with quick attack even. And if we just want to go in with the Nora, sharp sight in the hand for Teddy. I mean, Teddy has all the answers right now, and unfortunately for Maddie, this draw, I, I can't get over how devastating it must feel. I love how he's still focusing. He can tell this isn't going his way, but he is trying to find the only way out, and there aren't many ways out. Maddie seems to be very concerned with the option. Okay, going to go in for a full attack. Pull it back just a little bit there, Sport. But what I was going to say is, as we get further along in the game, you know, Teddy's champion strength was not discarded. The cost was just increased. It is still a threat to come down on turn seven, which is Maddie's next attack turn. Oh, yeah. Maddie would love to switch hands with Teddy right now. Even a 10 mana champion strength, Maddie would be more than happy to find. We're actually going to get a, a tiny spear onto the Otterpuss and a full send of the units from Maddie, understanding that Teddy doesn't want to block with this Fleet Feather Tracker, wants to take advantage of the quick attack and might be able to push through a little bit of damage here, but I don't know what range we're looking for. Yeah, I mean, I feel like Maddie feels like he has to do something here. He knows the clock is ticking. He knows the champion strength is in hand. So you might as well try to make trades now because once that champion strength comes down, there's no winning anymore. And we might still get the sharp sight in order to take out the Nora. Hasn't happened yet, and I'd like to think you'd get those portals under control. We've seen how many elusives Maddie has been able to pull off of that, and just a portal elusive into a champion strength could be enough to find the win and secure the series. But for now, Maddie very much on the back foot, losing quite a bit of his board. And we'll have to see if that Nora does get a block. It looks like we do see the sharp sight come out. Nora will be blocked. 
Thank you. This tracker stays alive too. Four units lost for Maddie, two units lost for Teddy, one health left on the Fleet Feather and the Vein, and a Darkened Thrall summoned as well. 9.7% chance, uh, equal odds to draw either Champion Strength or Poppy from this position, but now Silver with just an Otterpuss left, I don't think that's going to be enough. An Otterpuss and two Golden Ages. Oh, and there's that Poppy that we needed to see earlier. And Maddie can't even proc the Poppy because he's going to lose the Otterpuss here. And Poppy, she's scared to go in alone. She needs a team around here if we're going to progress that level up. So these Golden Ages, these Poppy, these are not just the impactful cards that Maddie needs. It's too little too late. Yeah, this is looking a little bit too late. I mean, he needed to see something. Oh, what did he need to see? Just and not two Golden Ages The hands? Darken Ages oh. equip pulls the Aatrox for Teddy. The World Ender could be coming down in a couple of turns as well. Already down to 10 mana. And Maddie can't play anything this turn. You cannot just throw your Poppy to the Wolves. We're actually going to have to see a Golden Ages just to preserve our unit from this Fleet Feather. Yeah, I mean... There's no way of really refilling the hand here. I don't think there's a way out of this one for Maddie. No, and I think this actually might be lethal anyway. The Darkened Blood Letters onto the Darkened Thrall would be 14 power coming in at Maddie 24 Mayo once this uh, Otterpuss is pulled off to the side. So Teddy, if he wants to go for that, he might be eyeing the Tumble instead. A couple of different options with this one spell mana remaining. But, you know, going to play respectfully of what Maddie could still have. Four mana is a lot, and there is a little bit of interaction in this list. Including Pokey Stick. Yeah, Pokey onto the Fleet Feather would completely derail Teddy's strategy if that's how he wanted to take this one. But Maddie, not looking happy with the position that he's in. And it looks like Teddy will not be going for the Dark Enthrall here. Oh, I'm going to pull it back. Debating. And actually, Teddy is hovering now onto this Dark and Blood Letters, but going to put it on the Fleet Feather. Yeah, I mean, that's no more mana left here for Teddy. We'll see a swing here. We know that Maddie can't do anything about it. I mean, could play a Poppy, but I mean, Poppy really is. If there was a world where you could win, she could not die. Yeah, I do not believe that there are any portals left for Maddie either. No units going to be coming out. We've got the Otterpuss still online, but Maddie can't go in for an attack here thanks to the Aatrox. Maybe even have to just rally for a barrier. Inspiring Light still not enough to get through the Aatrox and a Cataclysm top deck for Teddy is catastrophic for Maddie, who didn't even leave enough mana for the potential top deck of the champion strength. I mean, this game was a bit brutal. A surrender but... from Maddie 24 Mayo means Teddy will be moving on to the semifinals. America's eliminated from the world championship. I mean, Teddy is a spectacular player. Even though we saw the hand from Maddie Brick, it could have gone either way. But we know I mean, Teddy will also have a really hard match in the semifinals, no matter who he plays against. But oh, he just. Oh, he's just so good. That first game going the way of Maddie really gave us hope. But as we mentioned on the desk a little bit earlier, in a bracket with three seasonal champions between Teddy, Reroll, and Buy Attack. Teddy, uh, you know, fresh off of a win in the seasonals and now fresh off of a win here in the semi or in the quarterfinals. Our first player guaranteed to advance to the semis. We're going to throw it back to the analyst desk to break it down. Already off to such an incredible start for today. I mean, we've already been singing Teddy's praises throughout the course of the tournament, even leading up to this point. Been very impressed with the level of restraint and calculation being seen from this player. I mean, okay, uh, before we jump into that, Champion 3, strength, gifts, and it takes. We, yep. That was a clear example of the card. Just You, you don't uh, get it on 5 with the decent board, and it's just go next. Yeah, the matchup you know, seems pretty cut and dry, the way the champion strength kind of lines up. But I think that Maddie did something before the games even started that put him in such a good trajectory was to ban the Seraphine. I think mm. that as a player, he did everything that he could to put a winning matchup line up together. Yeah, I mean, for sure. And then we, we saw Alan was calling it out the way that you win that matchup as Nora into that Vein Aatrox is to full mulligan for champion strength. Maddie did it. He just didn't find it. It just didn't happen. Sometimes that's how the cards fall. And with that, Teddy is going to be able to move on and continue his uh, pursuit of the triple crown of Runeterra with his win in EU Masters, win at the seasonal, and now trying to win the world championship. One step closer, and I mean, I just like, Teddy seems like such a powerhouse right now to be able to take down. And Maddie, even going into this matchup, 
I feel like the narrative was always that Maddie was a little bit of an underdog here, but maybe a little bit of a hope too when Conservatory was banned from that lineup. What did you guys make of that ban? So I believe that Teddy might have not playtested enough the matchups because on the paper, it's usually that Noxus Bilgewater was beating Damasia midrange decks. But when you actually play the Vayne Aatrox into the Anitf uh, Conservatory deck, it's actually heavily favored by the sheer amount of the tough units you just get, and uh, the deck cannot uh, bypass that. But uh, he was perhaps also scared with the Jinx, because the deck has a... V if it doesn't get resolve, yeah. getting off your champion strength is really rough. So he just didn't want to get the, this matchup, and it's pretty much like 70% and you need that exact the exact cards champions plus resolve plus board and that's very hard into the conservatory yeah and Maddie finally got a chance to play the pop the Nora poppy right that had been banned away consistently and Teddy was confident that since I have this vein Aatrox and Silverfuse mentioned this on the desk it has secondary and tertiary win conditions different mm -hmm. things that I can try to still win the game of champion strength doesn't come through yeah and I was still really happy to see Maddie take a game against Teddy here and really yes. bring him down to the wire at the end because if he finds champion strength in that matchup, Maddie is going to be able to take that. So he, I think, did Chile proud. Mm -hmm. He did the Americas mm -hmm. proud. He had a great performance making it to the top eight here. Yes, he was our sole representative. I would have loved to see him go further as, as an Americas <laughs> caster myself. <laughs> but I'm very happy with how Maddie played. Earlier. Good job, Maddie. Good yeah. job. Good performance here at Worlds. It's been awesome to see Maddie play. But with that match, we will see Teddy move on to the semifinals. But who is his opponent going to be? This next match will determine that as. It's going to be by attack, going up against reroll. Two heavy hitters, two favorites coming into the world championships. I don't know who takes this. I am, I am behind my boy, but <laughs> Baya. Behind Baya. Better ship it. it. Yeah, I mean, by attack's been playing clean this whole time. He has this Seraphine Ophelio stack as a wild card. We know that it hasn't been as dominant as Teddy's Seraphine build but whenever you open up a chance for a deck to generate so many cards and outvalue you, it always puts this uncertain slant to a matchup that a top-level player maybe is uncomfortable with. They want to keep as much as possible under their control. We were looking at these decks before the show, and this seems very close to call, but for me, reroll Pegasus. Let me know over from Guangdong that <laughs> reroll is the GOAT over there right now. He is so good. He's playing very clean Runeterra, and he's shown it so far in the tournament. So going up against Baya, also been playing clean. The real winners of this match... All of us, everyone at home, <laughs> who's going to get to see some excellent Runeterra. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and throw it over to Boulevard and Silverfuse to take us through the second quarterfinal. Thank you so much, Necra. And now that I am back on camera, I want to talk about South Korea, man. Reroll <laughs> going up against by attack in a, a pseudo mirror match, right? Both these players have Red Gwen. Both these players have the Vayne Aatrox. And it's worth mentioning that in the group stage, Baya did not run into any players with either the Red Gwen or an Aatrox deck at all. I mean, yeah, that's shocking. <laughs> I mean, we've seen it so much, especially in day two. I felt like almost every game had those. And here we're going to take a look at by attacks lineup. Like we mentioned, the Red Gwen, the Vayne Aatrox, and the one standout performer, the Pursuit of Perfection, is a Felio Seraphine Victor Targon build. Really looking to get sort of one of the memeier finishes that we've ever had in competitive Legends of Runeterra. All right, meme? It used to be a meme. Okay, once it becomes a popular, it's not a meme anymore. That's just how it works. And we're taking a look at the Red Gwen here for Baya Legion Rearguard in the main deck. I know that's sort of been one of the, or I believe this is actually Rerolls variant. This is the one with the uh, Ballista. So yes, this will be Rerolls Red Gwen list, a little bit different, but both players on the Legion Rearguard. We saw some Crimson Pigeon. We weren't really sure how we felt about that, but again, Rerolls lineup has Elise in the Red Gwen, just Vayne Aatrox, so kind of swapping the champion spots there. And then the third deck is Varus Sivir Auction. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's interesting in the red win, most players have been cutting this Elise and going for the triple cat arena. And to me, Elise feels like it's not slotted as well into this meta right now. Yeah, uh, quite a few fearsome blockers coming out of some of the hardier decks from Bias. So it is going to be interesting to see if the players want to take the full mirror match. If we just leave Red Gwen and the Vayne Aatrox mirrors up. I know we had a little bit of predictions earlier. Taking a look now at rerolls Red Gwen, you can see the Iron Ballista there, the only player on this card. I mean, Generally, these decks are quite similar. I mean, the big difference here, yeah, the Iron Ballista. I haven't seen anyone really slot this in. It 
I mean, the big news too is Triple Redeemed Prodigy. We have seen the work that this card has put in. Not only that, but I mean, so we can talk about the matchup, you know, the slight differences, the, you know, two Fallen Reckoner as opposed to three from Reroll versus Baya, but it might still just come down to who draws that Harrowing first. That has been a big win condition for this deck, or can you get a Katarina online? And if we are looking at Katarina, Baya's playing more copies. I mean, yeah, in this case, your mulligan would mean a lot here. Both Red Gwyns are left up, it looks like, so we could see a mirror match. Yeah, it's the double Aatrox ban. Neither player willing to go up against that. You have to assume that Baya, even though he didn't run into Red Gwyn and Aatrox in the group stage, was prepared for it coming into this tournament, given that he included it in his own lineup. There's no doubt, especially in Europe, who was very much favoring Red Gwyn, that he didn't see it throughout the whole qualifiers as well. And now we are going to get the Sivarox on Varus from Reroll, a deck that I am very excited to see. You know, the Unforgiving Cold has been a premier card throughout the entirety of this tournament. Does very well in this matchup, but Baya has the Harrowing in the opening hand. Actually, going to ship it away. I mean, on top of that, there is two pairs of the Rite of Negation here. So a pair with the Rite of Negation could stop that Harrowing. So I can see not wanting to keep that in your starting hand and wanting to apply as much pressure as you can. And Reroll actually finds a one drop while Baya does not. So this Redeemed Prodigy in the opener might not be able to get as much value as you would have hoped in a matchup like this. But we are underway here for match number two, the quarterfinals 2022 World Championship. And looking at the first card, we have the Predict here. It does have a Fanatic, which is a Cultist, Shapestone, and the Merciless Hunter. There's some cases where Merciless Hunter hitting three and being able to trade in could be big. Yeah, we see the timer almost run out there for reroll. I'm not sure what was selected. We'll see it on the draw here. Maybe it was a skip. No, it was the Merciless Hunter, like you mentioned. So no off-turn Katarinas for Baya. And we have seen these darkened weapons early in the game on these one drops be quite impactful here. I mean, obviously, Redeem Prodigy, too valuable to trade ever. Yeah, I really cannot afford to block with that card. You need to get, because this card itself does not have Hallowed, right? It needs no, to summon no. the Ghastly Band. That's where you get your Hallowed proc in. And Katarina, there's a Quicksand, but there's a Blade's Edge, so I'm not sure how this one's going to play out. Reroll can't develop another blocker and use the Quicksand. Katarina probably going to get through for an early level up for Vaya. And that's exactly what you want when you're playing Katarina Gwyn. If you're attacking on turn three, you want to get the Katarina online. If you're attacking on turn four, then you want to get the Gwyn online. It's this sort of awkward thing. Okay, actually just not even going to go for it. It would have been a huge commitment for Reroll to try and kill this Katarina, right? You would have had to use the Quicksand here, lose it to the Blade's Edge, Merciless Hunter it on the next turn, swing into it. And all the while, by attack, the Redeemed Prodigy just stays on board. And it looks like it is going to stay on board regardless as we are going to take out this Bakai with the Blade's Edge, and Katarina level up, first one of the quarterfinals. And Redeemed Prodigy, They're not getting one no attack in, but potentially two attacks in. It might be a Merciless Hunter into Sivir. It's a pretty good cleanup for it, but Baya does have that second copy, and we've seen these Hallowed Triggers get out of control very quickly so far this event. Silver Fuse as high as 10 plus into the death pool in some games. And... I mean, pretty solid board here from Reroll, though. The tempo is looking good. Yeah, this isn't going to be a game where Baya can just throw down Katarina after Katarina, which is why so many players have been critical of this champion for so long. You need a board to back it up, and it's been a while since Nox has had a sticky enough board or a region they could pair with well enough in order to just continuously throw it down. And taking a look at this Akshan Sivervaris deck, I mean, lots of low-cost cards in it. I mean, once you get past the early game, not taking too much damage, we'll be able to continuously apply pressure. I mean, Sivir is also just a monster. Yeah, now we've got eight damage coming in from Baya. No shot that we're blocking with the Gwen here. This Gwen Katarina level up combo is something that we've seen swing a lot of games back, but that quicksand in Reroll's hand, the ability to take the quick attack away from both champions while Baya has no interaction for it, now finds a glimpse beyond, but it might not be enough if Baya loses this Gwen and this Katarina, not even out of the game. We have the Eternal Dancers. We can bring back the Katarina. That's the thing about this Gwyn deck. You can take care of the units on board, but they will always be back. And now we're just going to see the Quicksand onto the Gwen, a block with the Sivir. This might be a glimpse beyond from Baya. It might not. There's a lot of things that he can play down if he keeps the five unit mana, but it is going to be a draw. And we will see the Glimpse Beyond, as mentioned earlier, refill that hand a little bit more. And we can say goodbye to Gwyn for now, but we'll see her again. She's not going anywhere. 
Yeah, Baya drawing an Arachnoid Sentry. Still has some two drop to throw down. It will be the Phantom Butler. Lethal not looking likely for the next turn on reroll, but you know, without a harrowing, Baya's not having a likely kill turn either. Katarina not particularly well set up here. I mean, this hand for reroll though, he's gonna be able to put Baya down really, really low. Yeah, could throw out a four drop here, could be the Varus, could be a weapon and a Merciless Hunter. Quite a few options available for both players, and I want to see how Baya wants to play this turn defensively. Do we feel like we need to start getting some Reckoners online? Is it going to be the Eternal Dancers and Arachnoid Sentry? Because Reroll did develop into this, though that Sivir is what you really want to be stunning, and no interaction through the Spell Shield currently. And not feeling too worried here, we don't see that Arachnoid Sentry coming out, or the Reckoner, I mean, the Arachnoid Sentry especially. So being able to calculate this turn and saying, hey, also, do I need this Arachnoid Sentry for my own offensive turn? I actually really like this from Baya, understanding that there's almost no chance that Reroll is just throwing down an Auction pre-combat. Probably wants to get more online, otherwise it would have been more damage on the open. So understanding that uh, Reroll is sort of telegraphing further development. If you do want to play the Sentry this turn, you've got a little bit more of a window. And, I mean, having to take this step by step, by really deciding what he needs to do here and able to not take too much damage as well, even if you don't die on this turn, don't want to die on the next attack turn either. Absolutely. You don't want to die on any attack turn. You want to be the one to win the game and Baya really thinking about the options remaining for this turn. You're not sure, you know, Reroll played the weapon after the Auction. That was the further development you were expecting. Is there more to be played? And now Auction, no longer a blocking option thanks to the Fallen Reckoner. I mean, on top of that, this Sivir here has to be getting pretty close to leveling up. I mean, Absolver isn't a fear for Baya at the time, but could be in the future. Yeah, it would definitely end things on the next attack turn. And it is worth noting that because this is not the Demacia variant of Sivir Auction, you don't actually have to be worried about Cataclysm or Golden Ages or any of the other rally style effects that we've seen. So it's going to be pretty honest in terms of who has the attack token here, at least for reroll. Baya going to play cheat with that one a little bit, but get a Merciless Hunter down and a challenge available onto the Reckoner. And also, too, I mean, reroll is out of mana. Baya does not have to worry about Momentous Choice. No, it's, it's only going to be a, about six damage pushed through here, but I, I don't think that matters too much. Without the Varus leveled up and that Overwhelm available, you know, you're kind of wondering what break points do I need to hit here on my opponent's life total, because with that reach from the Varus, there could actually be a big difference between, say, two and five. Yeah, this double fearsome, I mean, making it or one of them is going to get through here. And now, gonna push it down to five on the side of Baya. Varus unlikely to get high enough for a big overwhelm push through given the hand state of reroll. And there's there's really no way to accelerate this auction, is there, Silver Fuse? We would need to top deck some choice cards that are able to target our own units and you know maybe getting the Dark Enthrall back online, but I think it's kind of committed at the moment. Yeah, as mentioned earlier, I mean, this isn't the Demacia variant, and there aren't really ways to do much reach without units in this deck. It's just unit-based. Yeah, and by a, really not going to give reroll enough time to slot through everything. It is actually going to be a Sivir level up here. I mean, reroll is pushing so much damage. Baya, I mean, does have options here. I mean, there must be so many lines going through his head right now. All right, lucky find available. Probably going to go onto the Sivir because she is leveled and will spread the keywords. Tough. 2 quick attack, not the best options, and it looks like we are going to go for the tough. Protect from the Blade's Edge from the Katarina in the future. We are now Ravenous Flock Proof. I mean, making Sivir Ravenous Flock Proof, that sounds great. Furious I mean, Wielders, whoa. a huge top deck for reroll here. Those Eternal Dancers were pivotal for Baya to be able to get back into this and just not able to flood the board here, really, and fight through what reroll has, that interaction, that key piece, and it's so good for reroll. It'll get another lucky find. The Sivir is such a safe target for this card and such an ideal target for this card. I mean, yeah, Baya, after seeing that Furious Wielder, I was like, maybe there's a line for him, but... That makes it so much more tough than before. I mean, Baya looking at it, you could get down the internal dancers, but it, it's really just bringing back a Gwen, and then Sivir can still safely, maybe not safely block it, but trade for it, which would still leave Baya very vulnerable given that it's only at 5 HP and doesn't have any interaction in hand currently. You know, no Ravenous Flock, no Quietus, no Vile Feast, no nothing. So it is going to be Arachnoid Sentry to stun out this Merciless Hunter to kick things off.
is going to try to go wide here to be able to block and not die in the future. But as Gwen getting on the back foot, still up there can help, doesn't have a ton of hollowed stacks here to capitalize off either. It's looking really tough. And I'm curious to see how reroll plays once the priority is back to him. You know, you only have seven mana, which means you can only play one of these four cost cards in your hand. So if you just pass back and buy a ghost for further development, that might be the green light for the Varus to come down and really start to push through that lethal threat. And, you know, once buy taps out, you also know that you're safe to throw out the Furious Wielder, get another lucky find. Maybe you find the Overwhelm and the Absolver isn't even necessary. Yeah, I mean, seeing Baya at four mana, only one unit on board with this board as reroll, he has to be feeling pretty good here. You are still looking at lethal, and actually, we might be contemplating a Zolani, which is something that Baya really has to keep in mind. That is another game-ending threat that could overwrite any of these units, uh, the Akshaw and the Merciless Hunter. None of these are as important as a 7-7 Overwhelm when your opponent is down to five and the only unit on their field has two HP. Yeah, Baya does have, you know, no block, a stun, Sivir is up, but you can't really pressure her here. You mentioned earlier, Flock is out of range, even if he did have it, there isn't, I mean, Katarina doesn't really do anything. No, you'd have, Just... and it doesn't even really get you the attack token, right? You'd have to go in with this first. It's going to be a Ruined Reckoner, For and the Midnight Raid us. could come through to try to force a block from the Sivir, but I don't think Reroll is going to fall for that one. I'm not sure how many Hallowed uh, Triggers are in the Death Pool exactly, but I am very confident it's not nine. I mean, now that Baya is tapped out as well, Reroll, I mean, he just has to really play a unit here. I mean, there's definitely one better than the other, but I love the consideration here, taking things step by step. Ambitious Cultist into oh. Bone Skewer. That's... Maybe not the perfect top deck, but another point of interaction. And I'm curious to see if Reroll, you know, how do you want to play this next turn? Is it going to be a Zolani development? I'm actually, I would say maybe a little surprised not to see the Zolani right there. One mana still available for Baya. No real threats at that point. I think he just kind of like saving the spell mana here. I mean, he can bluff a lot of things on his Look next attack. Yeah, it's ah. looking all but cleaned up as long as Reroll can find the lethal on the next turn. If Baya gets another attack token, another chance to set up, develop, and go in, then we might actually see things start to swing back. But this is a pivotal turn. We actually see Baya shaking his head on camera. Yeah, I mean, it looks like the time might just be ticking now. There were, this this board isn't going to be enough to push through. It's not healing. It's not really doing too much. And we just see the ink round into the blood letters. <laughs> yeah, the blood letters put back on to the auction, down to four on the Warlord's Palace. Possible that it comes up in this game, like we mentioned, if Reroll is unable to finish things out on the next attack turn. But it is looking very good for this South Korean seasonal champion. And if things do end up looking bad somehow, still has this Bone Skewer is a little bit of an out. Coming in for six on the Arachnoid Sentry would threaten the life of any of these units if Reroll throws out a blocker, but getting a unit off the board, not the worst thing in the world, might even offer up this Cultist as an option. Could just take the damage. It's no additional burn coming out of by attack, no decimates, or, you know, there is no copies of Noxian Fervor actually for either of these competitors in their Red Gwen deck. We've seen it as a one of in some of the lists, but these players are a little bit more focused on the more traditional board based gameplay, not going for the cheeky burn or cheeky removal. I love how Baya does. He's still looking at a way to win this game, though. I mean, he definitely looks disappointed, but I don't think he's completely given up, and I think that is a big thing when it comes to players at this level. It's actually going to be the Bone Skewer onto the Auction. Baya, no answer for this one. And it's just going to be the unit taken out. Auction back to the top of the deck. Bloodliners unable to be re-equipped as it was put down already this turn. And the Midnight Raid disappears. An open attack from Reroll. A Legion rearguard top deck from Baya attack means that this will be lethal. Reroll going up 1-0 and oh here in the quarterfinals. I mean, two outstanding players. I expect nothing less. I want to see who wins the next one. Is Reroll able to take it in two against a player as strong as Baya? It's hard to say. Baya has, you know, a couple more chances to win with this Red Gwen, but the, the last deck for Reroll is also Red Gwen. So at some point, this is going to come down to a Red Gwen mirror match, and Baya might just throw it out for the first game. We're not at a point where we're playing for tiebreakers anymore. The game count does not matter for this tournament in particular, maybe as a matter of pride, but we'll see how Baya wants to switch it up, and it is going to be the Red Gwen mirror with triple one drops in the opener for Reroll. 
Golf Host Mulligan. And these decks are quite similar to each other. I mean, small choices here and there get, that get changed, ratios. The big thing is the Elise and the Katarina, in my opinion. But after that, I mean, it even comes down to, I guess, two Mark the Isles for Umbaya here. Maybe he's able to do an extra combat trick or push damage that way. Not much difference, though. Yeah, when we're looking at Ravenous Flock as the main removal tool, Mark of the Isle can really upset that math. It kind of depends on exactly what unit's going down onto here, but Reroll has the attack token on two with the three one-drops. We'll see if it's going to just be the full suite if we throw out the Redeemed Prodigy, but a very early game-focused hand from Bi Attack as well, and actually very similar hands from these competitors, both with a Prodigy, both with a Katarina. I mean, this match will be tough to navigate with the way that this is set up. I mean, we see both have Katarina, no Gwyn's yet. I feel like Gwyn could be a big player in this game. And don't worry, folks at home, I have pen and paper in hand. I see a lot of hallowed units on the board already. I'll be able to keep track for you of which side has more, what numbers we're getting up to, because we already see four hallowed units on the board on turn, on turn number two. two. And many of them will be dying as One well. One for reroll, two for buy attack. Quick maths, we know what the attacks on everything is going up to, but now we get into the Katarina turn, the attack token for Baya. And to me, I think a lot of this might end up coming down to draws. I mean, Gwen and Harrowing are going to be huge. A little bit of damage pushed back here. Five, actually. A little bit more than a little bit, if I do say so <laughs> myself. Uh, but Reroll getting a good setup here with the Redeemed Prodigy. Now going into the attack token with some spell mana as well as the Katarina. And just a second Katarina from Baya. Not the punish you were really looking for, like the Arachnoid Sentry picked up from Reroll. However, this Blade's Edge being able to take out another Hallowed unit, but still, these stacks are going up so fast. Yeah, Baya going to already be at three if this Phantom Butler goes down. That's quite a bit, but reroll, you know, no slouch either. Going to go up to at least two once this Prodigy gets in there and the Ghastly Band is summoned. We'll see exactly how everything plays out. And I got to say, the Ravenous Flock in the hand for reroll, a very important tool here. If Baya had one as well, maybe we could see things play out a little differently, but things looking good for reroll to potentially potentially come up in this mirror, but a lot of game left to be played. I mean, getting this Katarina online, for Baya, having two Katarinas, not really where you want to be, but, I mean, Reroll is looking like he's going to get this Katarina online and going to be ready to go. I mean, he only has two in the deck, but he drew her when she mattered. Yeah, and we get the Redeemed Prodigy down for Baya, unlikely to commit that one as a blocker, but actually, no, we'll throw it out to trade on the Prodigy of Reroll, saying, hey, I need to block something here, and my butler not going to get it done against a Blade's Edge. We'll see if Reroll wants to use this Blade's Edge here or potentially has the read on the Glimpse Beyond saying, no, I can hold it back, I can save it a little bit, sort of force you to not develop further this turn so that I can play my block, and is happy to trade it, so to two, actually up to three hallowed for both players, level Katarina in the hand for Reroll, and a full cleared board on both players. And we'll have to see if Baya ends up playing into the Blade's Edge, says no, we're going to go ahead and save the mana here, good call. <laughs> that, that Ballista, <laughs> one turn early on the Eternal Dancers. Here comes the Katarina for Baya, but Reroll has the Sentry Flock combo. Sentry and Flock ready to go. I mean, Reroll making sure that's still his best choice. Does this Katarina? Ooh, really? Okay, yeah, just saying, hey, Baya, if you want to go in with Katarina, I will also go in with Katarina, and we can play this fun little game of chicken, as this would push Baya down to six if both players do go in for their respective attacks, and if Baya just leaves his Katarina out round on board, you know, Reroll still has that Sentry Flock combo. I love the pressure this Katarina puts on, too, and also making a zero-cost blade, too. I mean, that value there says, hey, you want to develop more? I got you. <laughs> yeah, and I that's a huge read because last round, Baya passed with two mana left for development because the Blade's Edge was in hand. So Reroll is actually playing pretty proactive here, saying, I dare you to play into this. And I love to see so much proactivity from these players. Get on board, get in your opponent's face, start shouting at them. And we actually see the attack here from Baya attack. You know, if we look at the hand states for each player, Baya, very favored if the game goes long. But I do not think that is going to be the case. Silverfuse, six attack on the Katarina coming in. Reroll just going to take it. Oh, this is just, uh, feels like top laners just kind of punching each other. You know, two top lane Katarinas for some reason, like the tank Katarina once upon a time. Yeah. Just kind of bam, 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 back and forth. 
and we're gonna see the Katarina return for both players. No board states left over. Baya unable to develop the Phantom Butler into the Blades Edge unless he wants to commit the Glimpse Beyond as well. You really don't want to lose that unit for free, and there's no tempo last on the side of reroll. Still gonna bang three spell mana into the next turn. And Baya trying to decide, hmm, what do I do with this two mana? And we're going to go ahead and pass both discarding the Dusk Blade here. And actually, so this Iron Ballista will have seven attack it once it goes in. Baya cannot develop Phantom Butler as a blocker. Needs something a little bit more impactful. The Eternal Dancers, but there's still mana for the Arachnoid Sentry in Reroll's hand. Reroll might be taking it here. I mean, this this one of Iron up. Ballista is such a difference maker in this moment. You can see Baya sweating, scratching his head. How do I get myself out of this situation? This Iron Ballista that I'm staring down is that really what eliminates me. I mean, we've talked about how in these open deck lists, throwing in a one of copy can be incredibly impactful because it makes your It's opponent. the Eternal Dancers. We get the stun the from stun. You can see Reroll give the oh, thumbs he up. Knows. He knows that he's got it. Baya, you know, has a draw spell here, but what are you going to do with one spell mana? No damage units, no Ravenous Flock top deck. Reroll looking like the favorite here to move on to the semifinals, eliminating the seasonal champion by attack. And Baya knows at this point, he's like, just give me a Reroll second. certainly Reroll. knows at this point too, jamming out, getting in the zone, preparing for the rest of the day. I mean, Reroll has been looking incredible and he continues to play well. I loved the proactivity in this game, yeah. saying, hey, you want to develop into this? Like, I saw you not develop earlier. You obviously have something that you can't play into my blade, so I'm going to keep doing it. I feel like a lot of players would have, you know, as they see the Katarina come down, they go, okay, yeah, this is a pivotal champion in the matchup. I have the Arachnoid Sentry Flock. I need to get this out of the way, but not Reroll. Reroll says, oh, you want to play this game of chicken? I have the higher life total. I have the bigger Katarina. I'm more than happy to play this with you. Just such great play we, from him. We even see Vile Feast in response to the Glimpse Beyond. The game is all but over, and Reroll still looking to play perfectly here. And that's exactly what he needed to do. The pressure is here, and wow, Reroll, what a game, what a series. No playable cards from Bio Attack means Reroll gonna take it 2 0 over one of the favorites from the EMEA region. South Korea knocking out one of the EMEA competitors. Four more to go. Wow, what a game. And I mean, you've been talking about South Korea coming in and being strong the entire time, and they have performed so well. We knew that this upper half of the bracket was going to be one of the stronger ones, right? Three seasonal champions top loaded into it. A 2-0 rather unexpected result for this with the Red Gwen, the deck that has performed so well for Bi Attack over the course of this tournament, not quite able to clutch it out, but we are going to throw it back to the analyst desk to break it down for you. Now we know the two players that are going to be going into the first semifinal match, and that's going to be Reroll now heading into the semifinals. After a mirror match between those two Red Gwen decks, what was the difference maker there in that match? Draw and attack token. The way that uh, both players drew. Uh, uh, unfortunately for the reroll, he had the attack token with the correct units on those, and it was just the tempo. Like he, later, like he was set on the back foot by uh, and it's just unfortunate for him. Yeah, the players were playing incredibly aggressive. I learned a lot from watching that match, to be honest, because I realized I'd been kind of piloting the Red Gwen matchup incorrectly. I'm trying to answer the Katarina. I'm trying to keep the internal dancers under control, but they're like, no, I need to end the game. I want to go for the beatdown, and it pays off there. Oh, you just need to go face. <laughs> just go the next send it. Ghost, send, send it, it. all to the next yeah. ghost. I actually, you know, speaking of going face, we got to see a bit of a throwback with reroll tech again, a single iron ballista. Now, of course, he did have a big lead there. It's not necessarily like the iron ballista won the game, but it was the finisher at the end. It was the nail in the coffin for Baya not being able to deal with this overwhelm. It made it so he couldn't test the waters with the butler as a blocker because the iron ballista's overwhelm would have gone through. Instead, he asked to play a beefier unit and the arachnoid sentry is able to clean it up so it was very cute to see this one of that really we haven't seen much of recently come in and take the win yeah re-roll we could tell by the build of red Gwen was prepared to be aggressive rear guard running phantom butler alongside the redeem prodigy his pseudo replacement that a lot of players have been swapping him out for and that ballista just wanted to hit hard and hit fast yeah and then game one the action the severe varus draws were excellent 
exceptional. Mm -hmm. Why I couldn't really do much there because he went for the value play with the Katarina level up and he just got out tempo and he, he was never able to develop that Katarina and cash in on this level up. But after seeing such a fantastic set, reroll now advancing to take on Teddy at the next stage of the bracket. I want to take a quick moment to just say that, you know, Badge Attack put up such a huge, like, fight to get to this point. We're all proud of the boy. He's so young and has been putting up consistent results coming out of a powerful shard in the EMEA region. And I know that even earlier in the year, right, when he was kind of popping off and then he felt that he was backsliding a bit. Every competitor goes through this. He was like, no, no, I lost my touch. I'm washing out. And I said to him, you know, you've got to stick with it. We all have your back. And he made it all the way here to top eight against such an incredibly stacked qualifier. Yeah, he was able to improve on his result from last year's Worlds, right? He, mm -hmm. he made yep. it to the top 16 last year, but this time around able to extend it to the top eight. A really great run, and he ended up in a crazy field there at the top eight, having to start yeah. with reroll. All right, Baya, you did fine. It's not your <laughs> fault. <laughs> I mean, we already said that Baya versus Reroll was just a grand final that just dropped out of an, a portal. This, yeah. this is in any other timeline, this probably would have been our grand. That's about as nice as Alan gets to throw <laughs> the boy when it goes to Baya there. That's about as I was like, I was waiting I mean, for something a little go. spicier to come out of Alan. Maybe we'll no, get there just yet. I'll anyway. be mean to him later. <laughs> okay. I could have only got a bit better game one. No, no, we don't need no, it. He did fine. No. Well, Korea's starting to even the score here. Korea versus EU. Now it's two versus four. One down, four to go. Listen, well, listen. We are still a pretty ahead. <laughs> we still have four in. <laughs> uh, hey, Europe has been a, a titan of a region for the entirety of just the season in this top oh, cut that we have. Oh, don't give him any more fuel. <laughs> I, I know. I, before we get into a long TED Talk, we've already finished one half of the bracket to see who's going to be moving on to that first semifinal. And we've got the second half of that bracket and our last top eight matches coming up after this a little bit, sort of force you to not develop further this turn so that I can play my block and is happy to trade it. So to, to actually up to three hallowed for both players, level Katarina in the hand for reroll no and a full cleared way. board on both players. And we'll have to see if Baya ends up playing.
Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the 2022 Legends of Runeterra World Championships. We have two quarterfinal matches. We know one of the semifinals that's going to be coming up, but we still have two more quarterfinals to go, and there's so much excitement coming our way. I mean, we Can't kicked wait. off with two incredible matches that you two got to have yeah. the pleasure of yelling about. It was <laughs> phenomenal to watch Maddie almost bringing it back against Teddy, and then on the other end of that, we have Baya falling to reroll. That iron ballista sort of stunting the Phantom Butler development, that is one for the books. That was absolutely insane. Especially because it was a one of in the deck, oh, yeah. right? So it was really cool to see how that just one individual card choice really made a difference in things. But when you look at just the games overall, like just give us some, give us some thoughts. Like, how'd you enjoy the first two quarterfinals of the day? I mean, it was absolutely insane, right? We knew that this was going to be a stacked top half of the bracket. Some of the best players in the tournament in the world front loaded into this top spot. You know, three seasonal champions and Maddie able to take a game off of Teddy was absolutely incredible. And I think we were all very surprised at the conservatory ban. But as we mentioned, Maddie probably not as down on the conservatory as we are not thinking about the stats mm -hmm. as much, not thinking, OK, this is the only deck I've taken losses on. Probably just kind of feeling it out, you know, brought the deck. I would imagine he felt good about it. Might have been a little sad to see it go. We have another matchup coming our way, though, with the third quarter finals right around the corner. And this one, wh where is the bias for Allen going to go? Because it's an EMEA versus EMEA matchup. Silver Fuse, talk to me about the Aragorn versus Bowie's matchup that we've got coming up. All right, I think Alan might agree with me that this Talia deck is so cool and that he wants to see it go farther as well. So I think the bias might be in that direction, especially with Aragorn coming out 3-0. I mean, that's a really strong performance. That's true. It does. It is such a cool deck. I said at the top of the day, one of my favorite things from yesterday was getting to see this Tilia deck pop off. So I, I definitely have become an Aragorn fan over this weekend. But Boise, the interview we got with him yesterday, he was so sweet. He was so he, he said he had nerves, but he's been playing it cool the whole time. He's been playing very clean. I think this is honestly feels like a battle of titans, but it's two players that we didn't have as much info on coming in, and we weren't as high on as far as thinking that they were going to pop off. So getting to have this surprise see these two be so incredible has been awesome to watch and something we mentioned at the top of the day was teddy and maddie playing two of the four jinx decks in the top cut boise and chenia both yeah. left with lulu jinx so honestly i think i might be fine to just all in on jinx for the rest of the tournament so i, I think i'm rooting for boise on this one <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I got to go here from, from Alan and Skarzig right now. I'm going to toss it over to them to take us through quarterfinals number three. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the casting desk. Adam Skarzik Watson here with Alan, the world champion, once more to break down this next Titanic matchup. Welcome, everybody. We'll be watching Aragorn against Bowies. Oh, man, that will be a sweet matchup. But first of all, I'm a bit sad. One EMEA player will be eliminated in this. I mean, it was going to happen eventually. A little bit of crossfire there. This is a matchup that I was personally really excited to see. We've got two young, hungry competitors. Aragorn really stopping the show and surprising a lot of our audience with this Black Flame to Leah Ziggs. I mean, to not uh, forget, there is also that Unworthy Soul attack, which uh, works extremely extremely well with uh, Talia because every time she attacks she enables that with the flow so it's a free mana will of Ayanya essentially. Yeah you get to recall a unit that sets up beautifully for a potential uh, overwhelm play so that those rocks can hit through until Talia's blocker is missing. Great way to stifle these slow mid-range developments that other decks are trying to make use of. Counter Furious Wielder perhaps. Overall I love how Aragorn has been able to elevate the Talia Zig shell to that next level rounding out the lineup as well with powerful lists, the heavy hitters of Red Gwen and an Aatrox list. I want to mention that Aragorn can have uh, some interesting strategy here coming because he he says either, okay, I have triple Unworthy Soul, I could try to match up that Pantheon Varus with that, with that tech and uh, just uh, beat them down with that Black Flame and uh, ban out uh, Lulu Jinx. On the other hand, he has Kane Aatrox, which lines up into Lulu Jinx extremely well. And then he, if he expects a ban on Zig Stalia or Red Gwen, he can just uh, dr drop out Pantheon Varus mm. and match only Red Gwen and Lulu Jinx. So Aragorn can go for two different strategies, also based on what he believes Bowis will ban. 
Bowies did say in his interview yesterday that he was very prepped and comfortable against a lot of Red Gwen and Aatrox list. When we look closer at that Pantheon Varus, we have two copies of the expansion's protection to maybe stifle some developments, especially with Furious Wielder win on board, but with so much potential overwhelming amounts of damage coming from the Talia Ziggs, it could be too slow to scale up. We know that there is the potential brick of all of your weapons being on the bottom. I wouldn't be surprised if the Bowies goes for just Ben on Kane Aatrox and says, all right, I'm, I'm targeting your Red Gwen, and in the process, I'll try to hit your Black Flame. So we could see Aragorn banning out Lulu Jinx and just trying to get that Red Gwen and Pantheon Varus. Mm, so Bowies is going to take the Red Gwen out of the occasion, and you were correct, Alan, as always. We got the Lulu Jinx ban. We don't want that big swarm to come through. Even though it's not a champion strength deck, we know that Lulu Flame Chompers is incredibly powerful for locking down the early board into that Biggle Dust finisher. So now we're getting into game number one. Bowies on Red Gwen. Aragorn starting us off with the Kane Aatrox. And we see from Bowies already turn two redeem prodigy turn three katarina turn four gwen extremely good curve and pantheon varus doesn't really have a ways to deal well with the sorry kane atrox doesn't have a really a good way dealing with those early threats once you start developing these units and, and putting weapons on them, you need them to stay alive to get multiple turns of value, especially with the Darkened Spear. And that's exactly what Red Gwen wants you to do. They don't want you to block. I want to push through tons oh of early God. damage to put you in a fork. Early corner top deck on top of that follow up. Let's count arrow. to five. Jeez, look at this hand. So basically, here you just say, I'm gonna just curve out. On turn six, I'm just gonna throw another threat. Turn seven, I'm gonna finish the game. We saw this earlier as well. An early one drop with the Dark and Aegis pickup can do a great job of stonewalling the early game. We'll see if Bowie's wants to sacrifice this Redeem Prodigy just to get the, the uh, Ghastly Band and another Hallowed proc going, or if he's gonna play it a little bit slow. This curve looks good enough to maybe chill. So this is important to make a decision if I want to attack because this is going to be buffing your further units. Mm. Like you want your um, uh, buffed up Katarina. If you do not make this trade, later on your Gwen might have hard the time attacking into the Aragorn because she will be lacking that buff from the Hallow Stacks. So Katarina does come down in response to the Buru Cultist. Uh, There's going to be some bonus damage coming through thanks to its effect and the Darkened Spear going onto this unit. Big HP, big tankiness now. The Blade's Edge might just be saved, floating that mana. I don't know if Bois is going to go incredibly aggressive and send it to the face. Bois probably doesn't want to block with this hand, but again, ah, that's a 6 damage already coming downtown. And he's afraid that if there is a more development, he might just lose to the uh, tempo. And like, yeah, you're going to level up your Katarina, but uh, she might not have time to come down anymore. So Gwen comes through, we've got one Hallowed stack coming, shares with the Katarina. She is big enough to attack in safely, potentially, but Aragorn with the beautiful top deck of Unforgiving Cold. Keeps the four mana available, but Bowie's can't respect it. Has to try to fight for board dominance here and gets blown up by the Frostbite. That's absolutely devastating. We get out the Katarina with cheap damage on the Gwen. This is a very, very tough spot for the Bowie's. Katarina now denied. There's a second one in hand, but even with this outcome, might not have the tempo to play it. Attack token now in Aragorn's hand. Another unforgiving cold. He's going to just have his way with this game. The problem is he doesn't have much to go for now. Like, Aragorn has slowed down in development. This turn, you have a swing into do nothing. Perhaps he's going to heal up his cultist by equipping the spear, but not much besides that. Yeah, we have Momentous Choice, Aatrox finally coming. Aragorn may feel content to just float this mana, right? Just have a little bit more towards the World Ender. With these Darken weapons, the Assimilate can be very powerful. Bowie's down to eight HP, not too much to deal with here. So what Aragorn is doing here by passing, he's hoping maybe to see some flock so he could play Joral this turn, mm -hmm. so he would have some sort of development. And if Bowie's does play down a Katarina, there is always the threat of maybe a Furious Wielder 
uh, with that mana being available too. Yeah, also bluffing stuff is a very nice here, but again, we have to keep in mind that he could only Furious Wielder with the 2-4, uh, because risking the death against the flock would be mm. unsmart. So Katarina does come down after all. Again, the Blade's Edge not going to do much to clear this 3-1 because of tough. But as the attack token comes back over to Boise, we have another attempt of Katarina and Gwen to synergize and take over the game. But Aragorn has the counter once again. So if you're Boise here, you already know that Opon has no Furious Wielder. It would 100% of the time come down on Katarina. You save up mana, you take out the big threat. It's very correct to do it. So at this point, you must be thinking, all right, so it's most likely Aatrox, maybe some weapons and two random cards that you are unaware of. So with this trade coming through, that does mean that Katarina is going to come back to the hand. We do have the mana to simply replay her if we like. Bowie's not looking too uh, scared right now. Despite the double unforgiving cold, he's They're fine getting these going. out of his opponent early, trying to set up for the harrowing now. I promise you do not have anything else to do this uh, this turn. So he decided to go for this line where on next turn you are on next attack token you are sending in the harrowing. Next turn we'll see probably Katarina tries to apply a bit more pressure, like he wants to kill that uh, Gwen to get more hollow stacks for the hollow harrowing. This is a very looking very good for Bowie because of the Aragorn just missing on turn five turn six development. Yeah, Aragorn had the early pressure, had the defense, but no way to convert. This has been the big strength of Red Gwen throughout the World Championships, is that players put on early pressure, but can't keep it consistent, and it gives them so much time to set up for harrowing, start getting the reckonings down, and claw back into a winning position. So, Aragorn afraid to develop all in, in on Aatrox. So here you are thinking about, it's either Aatrox or Joral. If you develop, because you want to take down the Katarina, if it comes Ooh, down. World Enders with four mana already. That's a very cheap World Ender. We we had back to back attack on every attack token from those one cost units with the weapon, causing World Ender to come way sooner than we expected. So if Aragorn goes ahead and assimilates this board with the attack token, Bowie's might be forced to go for a defensive harrowing just to be able to block down. We're gonna probably see just the defensive play from Bowies and just uh, try to stay alive this turn. We know that the Darkened Aegis went back to the hand. We've got a Darkened Spear in play. Yeah, Bowies just gonna go for the Harrowing immediately. That's all oh, because of the Katarina being leveled up, so he's gonna rally this turn. That's a very interesting play. Because one Katarina was killed, is in the death pool, and then the other Katarina was able to level up. This rally comes through. Now it's going to be the Harrowing, the power of the Shadow Isles coming down versus the World Ender. Aragorn has to stop and calculate just to make sure that this is appropriate. Yeah, the, he has some alternatives to do. He can uh, do the um, Aatrox spell, the Deathbringer. Mm -hmm. He can play or just do the world ender he has to do the math how on the hollow stacks on the katarina procs katarina alone deals four damage and on top of that you are taking minimum seven yeah the the gwens both of them now the one that is alive the one that's ephemeral are also going to double dip and then triple dip on the hallowed stacks from the first attacker so this is going to be extra damage being boosted across this ephemeral board as well as the snip snip getting a little bit of burn damage through over the top so here we definitely we want to make sure we order correctly the attack if you are bowies once aragorn decides what he wants to do make sure we buff the weakest unit or we could decide to buff be fearsome because uh, we still are no fearsome blockers and that means aragorn has to pull the trigger on world ender if you summon a big board i have to respond in kind aatrox now at 10 10 and the assimilation begins uh how much hollow we have i my count right now is three could have missed one or two there but we've got double Anaka with the attack token. If these do stay alive on the attack, the swing back from Aragorn will be lethal. Boas has to end it now. He has his one off, I think. He can double block the Gwen, which are buffed. He can block the first unit attacking. And then it slips through three, two, four. Yeah, he's one off with the dagger. 
One off for Bo is so tragic. Even though the early game was walled out, he confidently played towards this harrowing win condition. And Aragorn popping off now with the Anaka, the Darken that when you attack, it checks the top six cards of your deck, pulls a follower or a Darken weapon out immediately into that attack. This is a much wider swing than it appears. Seven, nine, nine plus four. No, that's lethal without dagger even because he just attacks with Katarina. All the, he has to block both Gwen he has to block the 2-2 two -two, and then he has to make sure that uh, because Aatrox blocks so he'll skim back up by 2 then he has dagger to, so that's 14 damage and yeah he's one short yeah you could is there a world where you dagger one of your 1-1s one -ones here uh, doesn't go for the full swing yeah he realized that he doesn't have lethal unless opponent okay what if you just the attack with the one uh, the, if you buff to the one hp units and you dagger them then that would be lethal yeah the you deny mistake. the two healing from the atrox maybe didn't see the line and now with the world ender online these jeralls are also zero mana yeah i think that was the play just bait opponent into blocking with the atrox incorrectly because of the timer because this board is ephemeral, it's going to go down no matter what. Even if Bowie gets another true attack token, it's not going to be enough. Blooming Cultist pulled off of the Anaka, and another one also pulled from the top. It's Stratu. Two more card draws coming through. A full swing versus Bowie's. That's a uh, that's a board. Take There's going to be scholars analyzing the math on this one. But I think Boas, as Alan said, maybe did miss a line, and Aragorn gets to swing back big to take game one. I'm thinking if there was a post, like a guaranteed lethal, but I think it was the, would be only capitalization on Aragorn misplaying. Yeah, and at this level, you can't take into account what if my opponent plays badly, but Aragorn taking that one in a flashy fashion going to take us into game two. Now that he's picked up the win on Red Gwen, the second win he has to find is going to be on the Talia Ziggs, the deck that got through. So far to zero, when we see F3. I had that all mixed up. Yeah, Aragorn just won on Kane Aatrox. Yes. Yeah, he, the Red Gwen was banned. He Now he's pulling out the Ziggs Talia. I did get that right. Will we see a free zero black flame deck? Black the world. flame. It's oh, it's such a wild card deck. These players look at it and they say, oh, you know, this looks like a bit of a meme. It looks like it could be too slow, but it's popped off every time we see it on the stream. I thought that Bowie's might go for the respect ban, just recognizing that this deck is stronger than it appears. But the key card Aragorn's going to need to carry through the early mid game is that Rock Bear Shepherd. We see Quietus in hand for that Rock Bear Shepherd. Excellent answer to that play. Very good tempo swing. As we jump in, oh, I did see the top deck there of the Rock Bear Shepherd. Bowie's going to open us up now with the Boisterous Host getting a little bit of chip damage. And we see Katarina as well in hand, looking for that level up on turn four. The curve was so strong last time from Bowie's. The harrowing isn't as big of a late game component for him because of Red of Negation in Aragorn's list. So he is forced to play a much more aggressive idea in this early game. Katarina comes through to prepare for next turn. The problem Bowie's has, like he has not much going on for him next turn. Like he doesn't have any good development. Mm -hmm. Only if he can do is just play removal. And if, you know, Bowie tries to go for a cheeky play, blocking with the Boisterous Host into the Dagger to finish off the Devout, opens up the right of Arcane, and it's not looking good. Yeah, most definitely. He was, I think he should consider pinging Nexus, because he didn't have much of a play, but when he top deck the Foyer, suddenly made this turn way, way better. Yeah, gives you a proper development. You have plenty of mana floated. The Foyer does give you a lot of long-term grindy value, which this matchup might not go that long, but it's going to certainly boost Boas's mid-game. It improves your long-term grind, but it downgrades harrowing by a lot, especially when you are casting harrowing on your own attack token. Yeah, Bowie's, I think, has basically signaled to us that he's not going to be relying on that 
at all this turn. Rock Bear Shepherd comes through. Bowie's immediately goes for the attack, wants to try to force this Rock Bear Shepherd to block down, has the Quietus in hand, so this means Aragorn could get another proc if Bowie's is too afraid to pull the trigger here. I really like holding the Hoist back because of the just not having any blockers in the hand. He doesn't want to trade inefficiently and he wants to preserve stuff in case he just get, loses tempo. He knows that he has leveled up Katarina, but he, like he said, he's extremely slow. Normally with the foyer, you like to play it on your defensive turn to get another Ghastly Band as a free block, but Bowie's just trying to go much more aggressive, finds the quietest, gonna slow Aragorn down in the mid game, but without a lot of pressure coming from Bowie's just yet, Aragorn finds plenty of time to still dig for the Talia and Black Flame. Oh, we're gonna see the Katarina drop and we're gonna see the, some pressure. Now Aragorn has to decide how fast do I want to play this matchup. Desert Naturalist coming through, destroying the foyer. There was a huge opportunity for a tempo play to get rid of the sarcophagus, get that restored devout as a 5-3, but understands that the foyer gives too much lasting value. And this is just another 2-4 blocker. It's a very good long-term play that Aragorn just did. Like, and honestly, that uh, it, it, he would just get outgrown. He realizes that he cannot close the game anytime soon. There is no Talia. There is no big swing that he can do. I wonder if Bois is going to pick up on that. Going for the Desert Naturalist to answer the foyer means that you have no tempo in hand, and Bois may be feeling a bit more comfortable from this position to take some slower lines and kind of agitate Aragorn by being stubborn and sticking to this long-term game plan. So next turn it looks very interesting from Bois because if you go for Katarina, there is not much else going except uh, potentially playing the flock with the dagger. On the other hand, you have you could go for the clean dancer development. Oh, beautiful swing here with the right of Arcane, getting rid of that uh, potential attacker for the next turn. And this is fantastic use of the 2-4 body that can't block alongside the 5-3 Fearsome. The Voiceless Host has to sit, sit back and take it. Red Wen always suffers when you are on the back foot. Bowie's now going for Eternal Dancers to get a resurrection here to cast another can't block. It responded with Unworthy Soul to recall this experience expensive unit, perfectly finding its target. Last turn we had a skill proc from the Desert Naturalist and Rite of Arcane to get the flow, to get the discount. So here the Bowie's alternative was to play Katarina, dagger the 5-3 and then flock it just to get, not die strictly up. Because you, if you look at the Bowie's hand, he's not losing in value game anytime soon. So mm -hmm. he might have decided to slow down the game and just outgrade the opponent. And he was aware that in the deck is free of unworthy soul and it's way better if opponent passes your Katarina, not the dancer. Yeah, so by going for the dancer, Bowie's was being certainly a bit greedy there. And I think that you can say, oh, what if he sends the Eternal Dancers to, you know, the death pool for Harrowing to come back. But as we've said time and again, the Harrowing really isn't going to be a realistic uh, lot match uh, matchup winner for this particular stance of Right of Negation. Exactly, and there is not only one copy by two, which is way, way worse. Boys might have perhaps in the mind that might be second right of Arcane. Oh, I love this combo with the Ancient Preparations to predict, and then the Preservarium to immediately draw that card. Aragorn has another right of the Arcane, going to try to keep this board clear, trying to force Bowies into a harrowing line, and the right of negation is sitting there waiting, and even the Endless Devout coming through. This is a lot of pressure on Aragorn's attack token. We didn't see Black Flame. We didn't see the pressure of Rock Bear Shepherd come through. This is just pure mid-range development and control. I mean, 5-3 Fearsome punching through. You have no blockers. 5-5, five, five, lining up with stats very well. Might, have a, might as well have elusive because you cannot block it efficiently. It just takes down your unit by unit or eventually connects the face. It's really hard spot for Bowie's to deal with with the stun coming through on the 3-3. Bowies was absolutely trying to get a fearsome blocker in play. Desert Naturalist gets another piece of chip damage on the Nexus. Next, uh, will we see Katarina play now? It looks a bit of tempting to start uh, trading perhaps with some units. Like uh, Aragorn might be thinking, okay, I can leak the damage from the damage from Katarina, I have right of uh, negation. I don't have to be worried about the 
Harrowing. But then we have a right of Arcane as well in a hand to answer that. But he would love to drop Zix ASAP because there he should be leveling up soon and dealing the damage with the landmarks would be spicy. Yeah, I wonder if we're going to see an overwrite on the Desert Naturalist. It can't block anyway. Get the Ziggs down. Get the free damage that's about to happen from these landmarks hatching. Aragorn has proven to uh, want to be uh, the, the control player in this matchup. So I think that at the end of the day, playing so cautiously is going to keep this mana open for the right of the Arcane. Bowes is floating a lot of mana. He's leaking, uh, sorry, he's leaking a lot of mana because mm -hmm. uh, last time he allowed an uh, opponent to unworthy soul the dancer, he lost uh, four, uh, two mana there, and now he's losing another one. Like, this is all uh, tempo uh, costly plays. With Bowie's trying to find a more respectful line, trying to navigate all of this removal, he's slowly falling behind. I want to see him take bigger risks here to get back into the game. Eternal Dancers getting back into play, however. No second unworthy soul to answer this. What uh, dancer are summoning? Is it even anything big? It would be Fallen Reckoner, if I'm not mistaken. We're going to get another camp block that's just going to go over onto the 2-2. Still looks like a lot of strong chumping options from Aragorn. Yeah, most definitely getting another Minotaur would be pretty big. Fallen Reckoner. He can also utilize, if there would be this time Unworthy Soul, you could utilize the Fervor to answer the recall. And we see some uh, flock. And he's still uh, giving a board space to Aragorn. Normally you want to see pl uh, flock, big play in defense. Because like when you see a full board from the Zig Stalia, like removing their uh, units on the before you attack is not particularly too efficient. Oh wow! And puts the Redeem Prodigy first, so that the Eternal Dancers doesn't get the Hallowed buff. It only revives a Ghastly Band. It can only revive units that have equal or less attack. Misses out on the Reckoner. This is huge. Yeah, that's a that's a misstep from Bowie, definitely. Mm. And by using the Ravenous Flock earlier, we don't get the chance to, if we're going for a greedy chump against the Eternal Dancers, to get that free attack and keep the the Dancers healthy. We don't get the chance to push through more Overwhelm damage with the Revived Reckoner. Bowie's now re-situating his game plan here after making such a mistake. And we're gonna see right of Arcane after combat to take down that Dancer. And Argon will be looking to seal the game on the next turn. Yeah, he's so gutted from this position. The Eternal Dancers and Arachnoid Sentry are still alive. Right of the Arcane, because of that chip damage, comes through to finish off the Eternal Dancers. Another big swing coming, and Ziggs dealing burn damage to the Nexus. This sarcophagus is gonna hatch into a 5-3. Looks like a lethal swing coming through to me. I mean, definitely Bowis needs to use Fervor here to get one, uh, get rid of, of one of the attackers that's at 3 HP. And then we're gonna see either Shepard come down or another unit taken taken out so you can safely swing with your 5 free Ziggs and the Desert Naturalist. Yeah, the, the Fervor comes through. Bowis can't respect Right of Negation any longer. Aragorn could let this come through or not. Decides to put the damage over to the Ziggs. Gonna try to finish it off with a Ravenous Flock in the hand, trying to avoid as much burn as possible. This is a very interesting play because he just gave away all the information about his hand. Aragorn knows there is a Katarina Flock and Fallen, fallen Reconner, res, Revived Reconner. Mm -hmm. And the Revived Reconner, the Risen Reconner cannot block. It's just an ephemeral unit. Well, we are looking at uh, Lethal next turn. Like, again, Bowis will not... Right of Arcane again! Aragorn's been using the Ancient Preps to predict and find all of this removal. Bowie's now with an empty board, throws up the Shen emote. Aragorn, no Rock Bear Shepherd required, no Talia required, no Black Flame required. We're seeing classic Shuriman mid-range beatdown. Here comes the swing. Those five attacking units, either fearsome or 5-5, five five, just putting some heavy, heavy lifting. Yeah, I think that even with that misplay of the Eternal Dancers, getting that revived Minotaur probably wouldn't have made a big difference there. Aragorn was in full control the entire time. Aragorn had an amazing hand, and that Fallen Reconner wouldn't have changed much for sure in this matchup. And yeah, Aragorn moving through. 
We saw players really struggle to keep Red Gwen contained, right? You can remove the early board, but then you have to worry about harrowing. And fortunately, the Shreeman deck with Rite of Negation can do both. We knew that Bowies could not rely on harrowing as an out there. No Hail Mary. Yet yeah, most definitely very clean play from the Aragorn. Small misstep in one game by Bowies, but overall very well played by both players. Just the matchup difference, draw difference. Again, we are the we are seeing the best players in the world competing, and yeah, those are some amazing games. Yeah, Alan's always going to be happy because no matter what happened during that set, an EMEA player was going to advance. And to hear more about what we just saw, we're going to take it back over to the analyst desk. Thank you so much, Skarzig and Allen. And yeah, I mean, Bowie's put up a heck of a fight in that match. It looked really close in that game, too, until that one play. Well, and really, the big highlight for that play is just how much pressure these players are under, right? Bowie's has been playing very clean the entire tournament, and he just gets one pivotal moment here. And as Allen said, it's very likely that that Reckoner didn't actually make a difference in that spot, but it just goes to show how much pressure these players are under that a player who's been playing as clean as Bowie's can get into that situation and make more of like a clerical error than a decision problem because you saw him immediately react. And I think that's why we praise Teddy so much. Even in the situations where the game is already secure, you see him going through the motions and making the perfect plays, building good habits, even in the situations where it doesn't necessarily matter. Like it might not have mattered that this Reckoner came out here. I mean, you could just see the look on Bois's face. Like it's heartbreaking to see that from a player because that was an immediate reaction. I mean, for all we know, it could have even been a misclick and he just entered the attack too early and without seeing the ordering. I mean, it is rough when you're going through those emotions and you know that the game, I mean, this game makes it so your world championship is on the line. I mean, there's single elimination. Once you're done, you are out. Yeah, I hope he's not beating himself up too much over this because like I, I know that you want to play your absolute best game. You want to play without mistakes and yes, if you lose but you played, you know, without mistakes and there's not much to, to think about but I know, I think Boyes just needs to look back at that, realize that hey, that mistake can happen to anyone and at the end of the day he was in a situation where he had done everything else right and that didn't cost him. I mean, we've definitely seen players make it into the top eight and, and it wasn't like completely perfect matches all across the board yeah. with the matches that they played. And so it's been impressive to see all of our players move on to this point. And I hope Boise can hold his head high, just knowing he's made it to this point, made it to the top eight. That's huge for a world championship. Yeah, I mean, and now let's talk about Aragorn making it on to that semifinal. Yeah. Phenomenal play throughout the entire weekend. And once again, he gets to bring out his closer the Talia, he's undefeated with it, and he finds another win. I love that the Talia <laughs> deck gets to move on. I, I love watching it play every second of it. I'm like, yes, I'm ready for the Talia combo, ready for Black Flame to come out and just end these games. I just think it's such an impressive deck list that he's put together. And while the Black Flame is definitely the flashier inclusion here, I want to go back to that unworthy yes, soul. Definitely. I mentioned it yesterday, and that tempo pushback on the Eternal Dancer was pivotal for Aragorn in this matchup. And we saw a lot of Zixtalia out of the EMEA World Championship qualifiers. They were still on the Bandal City version, and a lot of them were playing three copies of Hexplosive Minefield and found it very clunky. Without playing Bandal City, now moving over to Ionia, we've removed a lot of that, and I just really like this more streamlined version that we're getting out of Aragorn. Yeah, it truly was the biggest moment of that matchup is when that unworthy soul was able to send back the dancers and that's the big reason that even that misplay didn't matter right is because the tempo was right. so in favor of aragorn that he was able to just clean it up i mean it was like you said Cass. it's been so cool to see that not only this deck made it through but also uh, in the future uh, do you just ban out the ziggs talia knowing that aragorn has been able to take every single match win that he's had with that deck. I think people need to start thinking about it, right? Because I don't think many ban strategies were considering Ziggs Talia when they were coming in. And maybe some of the matchups that they find to be uh, unwinnable, maybe the Red Gwens or maybe even this Kane Aatrox are things that they can actually let slip through in those closer 45-55, 50-50 matchups, whereas this Ziggs Talia might be a much worse matchup than they initially anticipated. It's one of those things where you have to kind of fight against past bias. Even in metas where Ziggs Talia has been a good and prominent deck, it has always been pretty far from the best deck in the game. So it's it's almost never something that you're thinking about when you are implementing your ban strategy. But so far on the day, Red Gwen, one of the more dominant decks in the early stages of this tournament, not doing so great in the later stages. 
I mean, that sometimes looks like it comes down to tempo and just how the pace of the games have really gone today. It's been a little bit quick, so we'll see if maybe Red Gwen can pull out a win further down the road. But we have to talk about our next match because three players have moved on to the semifinals. We've got one more to figure out. So now it is time for Smooth Swallowist versus Chenia. Oh, this is what I've been waiting for. I love Smoo's enthusiasm, and Chenya has just put on quite a show for us. I mean, another South Korean representative. We'll see if we can get, well, two to top four, which would be two for two in top four. <laughs> Expected. Okay. <laughs> Couldn't imagine any other way. Do I, do I have to be Alan now? Is that the thing? Because I was fighting Alan earlier, but now do I need to fight? Do you I, disagree on this I one? I feel like Alan needs a representative. It's hard to disagree. Right now. It's hard to disagree with Shania. <laughs> However, I think Smooth played a little bit looser yesterday. Or not yesterday, but the, uh, on day one, and, and his lineup overall was very strong. I think if Smooth tightens it up, I actually think he does have a really solid uh, game against Chenia. And I actually am a little bit more worried about Chenia's Varus Aatrox. That's a deck where I think the Varus, not as synergistic within that archetype as the Kane would have been. You know, the spells, we saw it play out on Pantheon Varus, where you can't really tutor for the Varus if you haven't already gotten a weapon down. Things get a little bit more awkward, but I don't believe we've actually gotten to see Chenia play Lulu Jinx yet. I think that's been banned almost every every time, so I'm excited to see if that one can surprise us. I mean, rightfully so. I mean, Jinx, been looking pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I know you all have your favorite things to look forward to. It's very clear what you all are focused on, <laughs> but we got to look at the match now. So let's head back over to Skarzig and Allen to take us through this fourth quarter finals. Welcome back to the desk, everyone. We're going to decide our final player to move to the next stage of the bracket, Smooth Swallowist versus Chenia, a matchup that is going to be very mid-range focused. These players focused a lot on Darkens for their new World Ender set deck building, and Smooth got the tech. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, Smooth is looking very good into this matchup, because if we look closely at the matchups, Smooth has uh, two grindiest decks that can go tall, which is Varus Aatrox and Pantheon Varus. On the other side, we have a Vayne Kane, which is really, really awful into those. So if the Smooth decides to take out Varus Aatrox from the Chenya hand and leaves out Lulu Jinx and Vayne Kane, then uh, he's in trouble. And Chenya has to take out one of those grindy matchups, leave probably Poppy, Poppy for the smooth, take, uh, try to take down the champion strength deck, and then uh, battle on that. That's never a situation you want to be in to say, I'm going to take the risk versus champion strength. Chenya, meanwhile, has managed to make it this far, but we've seen the shakiness that's come out of these dark and built, the, the Varus Aatrox, the Vein Kane, very shaky to start out and powerful once they get established. And I don't think that Smooth Swallowist is the type of player that's going to give him the time to get set up. Oh, most definitely. But again, uh, he's uh, from EMEA, you know, how how's to go with the tall boys. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Vayne Kane looks fantastic on paper. We know that for Chenia, the Blooming Cultist and the Buru Cultist have been putting in so much work. He has already demonstrated his top player X Factor. If you count him out, there is some sort of scenario where the Vayne and the Tumble lines up beautifully to take a win in a best of three. Which deck would you like to see the most, Karzik? Which matchup would you like to see? I am honestly looking forward to another showcase of Smooth Soloist's uh, Vayne Aatrox. The Widowed Huntress and War of Akathia has been fantastic inclusions for him. Both of the Bandle City decks being banned out now. No Lulu Jinx, no Poppy here. It's going to be a darkened showdown all across That's the board. very good for Smooth. There is a weak link of Vayne Kane, but we've seen what uh, Chenya can do with that Blooming Cultis, even though this is uh, no, uh, not a good matchup. Uh, uh, this card uh, kept surprising us and sneaking Lethal in the spots where we never would have expected. But fortunately, Chenya finds the Lunari Cultist, an early weapon, so we can get some stats down, great attacking and blocking potential. The gems also evening out a lot of trades. And we can see opposite, Smooth is taking a lot of time agonizing over the mulligan, even after throwing away the vein in the Aatrox, really shaking his head. Oh finds another weapon to go with the Roar of Acadia. Oh my god. Ah, this head from Smooth, Roar on free with double weapon. Following up of high by Huntress, isn't this the best possible opener for his deck? We look at the deck and it has 
three, six, nine, twelve weapons, eleven weapons. Yeah. And we have seen over and over again will smooth brick it's just not possible. look at the smile he knows look at the smooth smiles he, he's ready he's so confident and laid back we've seen it all across the group stages we saw it in his winner's interview he is so confident in his prep his prep group his friends have his back and the roar of akathia has his back two two mirages coming through a three four and a five two we've got the darkened spear coming through now to further buff the stats that he's going to draw chenia has a great stable position but might fall too far behind now and it's not over there is huntress to follow up with the harp on top and we see the there is an forgiving hold in uh, chenia's hand but th that's the question what smooth will target with his uh, huntress if it's gonna target the uh, cultist it's gonna go down mm -hmm. the the Widowed Huntress potentially getting the quick attack and Challenger so devastating. Just keeps the board under control pretty much for free. And even if Chenia lands the Unforgiving Cold, isn't trading up the way he would like. It's only delaying the inevitable. Here comes the Huntress and she finds a harp. So if he moves his the pass right away, he recognizes that's either a bluff or not a Forgiving Cold or a Furious Wielder. And we'll see what he decides to play around. I think that Smooth might send it, right? The rest of the hand is all weapons. If you get the Unforgiving Cold out of your opponent early, before there really isn't a counter punish for their next development, it's fantastic for you. In these mid-range matchups, the Unforgiving Cold is the card that makes players hesitate to push their advantage. Definitely love the play, just forcing it out as soon as you can. And it could be also Unforgiving Cold. Uh, it could be also a Furious Wielder, where it wouldn't uh, give you him as much value as Unforgiving called it. Wow, and with the Huntress pulls the Buru Cultist instead of the 1-3. He wanted to go all in to dominate the position as we head into the mid game. Now with Chenia on the attack token, finds the Blooming Cultist, the makings of the comeback starting to brew. Yeah, the all-time favorite. The Blooming Cult is finding, like, in three different games, Lethal for Chenya. So definitely he'll be putting up some work with that card. Yeah, we can have the Blooming Cultist come through. Maybe we can equip it with the Darkened Fan. We start to get Dragon Links coming through. That's additional chip damage and stabilization. I don't know if the healing will matter in the long term, Alan. But Smooth finds Vayne. She's boosted from the Darkened Harp. These are some big green stats that I'm very nervous that Chenya won't be able to deal with. So far we've seen the strat from Chenya is just get a stalemate and keep pushing the damage with this blooming cultist with a weapon and finding the lethal in those uh, stalemate spots. That's exactly how Chenya was able to solidify his spot in top eight. In a mid-range matchup, you know you can block and block and block while your opponent is forced to tick down on your elusive clock. Smooth now needs to convert this position with an Aatrox and find a world ender ASAP. Yeah, not having Aatrox for smooth hurts, but remember, you can just tutor your Aatrox, and it's not a big deal even if you don't draw it early. After all the equipment from the Widowed Huntress and the Roar of Akathia, it's about to come into the hand. The World Ender is going to be incredibly cheap as well, as Smooth is forced to take five damage here. I mean, that puts him on the two turn clock pretty much. All right, show it to us, Smooth. It's a faithful wolf dog at the top. Summons a Geral, wants to take down this blooming cultist. It's only a 4 3 right now. Doesn't look like there's a way to save it. Yeah, we'll see. Probably equip. Oh, he probably doesn't want to commit yet uh, an equipment. He'll rather just, just try to bait out uh, stuff and see what uh, Chenya does. And he has a catch to follow up if he needs to kill that blooming cultist. The Even with the Geral's buff of mana. You know, you, the Furious Wielder could still come through. Smooth going to put even more attack power on the draw to cover any defensive combat tricks from Chenya. So the reason why this is correct for Smooth to do, he would have, normally you would held on uh, on that harp to uh, pull it out with the catch. But he, if he doesn't play, like from the hand, this equipment, he won't draw Aatrox. And he really needs to draw Aatrox. Yeah, Smooth recognizes his own win condition, doesn't seem worried at all about this Blooming Cultist. The game is still within his grasp. 
Chinia now thinking I was, there was an edge play, right? Of ambitious cultist, maybe getting some crazy spell to help out in the situation. But with the Jeral, Smooth already heading off these edge plays off at the pass. Chenya keeps bluffing Furious Wilder or another uh, unforgiving cold. Smooth played a bit into Unforgiving Cold because if he didn't equip the weapon, Unforgiving Cold would have went on Vayne and Mirage. Now it's gonna go on the um, Joral if there was one. When we looked at the first Unforgiving Cold, Alan, we saw that Smooth was okay with tanking that. There wasn't too much of a punish lined up. But if there is second Unforgiving Cold here and the Blooming Cultist does not go down, it means that Chenia can get continuous damage that could allow him to steal the victory and it all connects. Buru Cultist stays alive but the Blooming Cultist is down. That's more swings in for the World Ender discount and because a unit went down, Faithful Wolf Dog also discounted to one and can pull a weapon if it wants. D there is a 10% chance he's gonna just naturally draw the Aatrox. Also he can tutor the Aatrox next turn but he won't have mana to play it. Here comes Faithful Wolf Dog, pulls the Darkened Spear. With that, he can, this doesn't tutor Aatrox. He has to naturally play the weapon. That is true, the Wolf Dog is an auto-equip here. We see a Fish Fight. That's gonna be excellent against Aatrox. Fish Fight, fantastic to reach up and beat these big stats. Smooth has these Darkened Harps in rotation. The longer this game goes, the bigger the stats are naturally going to be from Smooth. Chenia has to rely on Aatrox to claw back. We've only seen this a couple times where an Aatrox is able to salvage a behind position. The HP is, is even, but in a mid-range matchup, if you lose control of the board, you're going to go down. This is a very interesting play because what Chenya is looking at, he wants to play the Darkin weapon from the Aatrox when he dies on the Cultist and when he wants to play World Ender. But World Ender will be 8 mana, so he'll be 1 mana short to do that, unless he attacked with the Cultist. And Smooth is more than happy to take this trade. If your Aatrox goes down, you're getting a little bit of healing, but this big threat is no longer worth it to me. We can get the natural equip of the weapon to bring Aatrox to the hand for Smooth. He definitely, Smooth is thinking about some combat tricks and if he wants to set up somehow lethal next turn, but uh, like he, re he should realize that he needs to block here because of the World Ender threat. Yeah, if Aatrox just gets to attack for free and survives, World Ender just goes to eight and Chania can let that rip and all of the discounts on the Darken in hand would allow him to take over this game. So Smooth taking another big risk versus the Unforgiving Cold. This is like he checked for Unforgiving Cold the last turn, yep. technically. And like he needs to take this trade because World Ender with the Aatrox on board would be de devastating. And now, like if Chenya wants to get an Aatrox back on the board, he needs to play weapon into World Ender. Ooh, beautiful! The Blood Letters, just a one mana cheap weapon, triggers Aatrox to the hand. Smooth has six mana still for this Aatrox, and I am. So excited to see how cheap this World Ender is about to be on his side. It's lethal for Smooth next turn, and there are no cards for Chenya to save him from that for now. And all Chenya can do is just get a wide board, hope for the best, equip that Darken Blade to hope for a counter World Ender and go for a Darken Showdown. <laughs> the ambitious Cultist pulls Sharesies, which is kind of nice. Darken Fan already being established to set up for the World Ender too. Once this assimilates, Pra the Breachwalker will generate three copies. So we're going to get a lot of uh, wide blockers for Chenya if he has the time to cast this spell. Smooth doesn't know if it's worth to, for him to cast the World Ender. He might be considering attacking first before World Ender. Oh, he lets nope. it rip! Eight mana, fully tapped out. Here comes 10-10. Overwhelm Aatrox. The rest of the Darkened Weapons on the Mirage and the Wolf Dog about to assimilate. We've got a Naka from the Darkened Spears. This is going to pull a wider attack. We saw how devastating this can be. Chenia to respond with one of his own. We're gonna see a six wide attack from the smooth coming down. And we're gonna see a five blockers from Chenya. So, so no matter what Chenya does from this point, there is still some damage coming through. We have a tumble from Vayne that can be used next turn. 
I think Smooth didn't think through. There, there will be five blockers with the fun uh, weapon. And there is Lifesteal now on the Ephemeral Breachwalker. Attacking uh, from the Smooth initially might have been slightly stronger. Yeah, the open attack before that World Ender comes through, you know you're winning the stat lines already on board. I think it might come down to what this Anaka pulls. There is the chance that if it pulls another Darkened Spear, it will trigger again and try to pull another. Oh, that's not it. Uh, oh, that's a four. very underwhelming. So now we have three blocks all across the board. It looks like Chenya is going to stay alive here. We got the 1-1 trade into the Aatrox. A lot of lifesteal and the natural healing from Aatrox is going to keep Chenya stable. So Chenya is looking for lethal next turn with the Varus and the Dawnbringer. But the problem is if he raids with the... Oh! Sharesies off of the Ambitious Cultist, moves the Darkened Aegis over to Aatrox. He's now tough, will survive this trade. Smooth gets outmatched off after this big World Ender swing. The random pull from the four drop cultist. That's yes. Absolutely insane pull from the Chenya. I saw the Sharesies would have some synergy, but I didn't quite spot that line. Chenya staying focused on any way he can swing this game back into his favor, and it looks like he's done it. With Chenya's Aatrox staying alive, it means that the Jeral's are now zero mana. Re equipping the Darkened Blade to get another, another Jeral. Jeral down. The open attack for Chenya looks absolutely devastating. Stating, smooth Swallowist, no unforgiving cold in this list, of course. I mean, that looks like a very dead smooth. We've got Elusive from Pra the Breachwalker, Overwhelm on Aatrox, all of the blockers being pulled to the side by Triple Thrall. But there is unforgiving cold to answer the condemn. Oh, that's a 10. Never mind. That's just, just 10 Triple mana called them. Draw, plus six mana. What is a combat trick? Smooth Swallowitz won't get a chance to respond to this. Even if there was Unforgiving Cult, he wouldn't be able to play it because it's 10, 10 mana for any four cost spell. Unbelievable. Because Smooth got so many darkened weapons into play through auto equipping, right? The Roar of Akathia, the Faithful Wolf Dog, they. Uh, didn't tutor Aatrox fast enough. We didn't get that immense pressure to close out. And somehow Chenia finds a way to take a game back that looked like he was about to lose. It seemed like Smooth just forgot what the, uh, the Darkened Fan does. And he underestimated that there will be actually five blockers for this turn. And he just ignored Chenya's World Ender. The Darkened Fan has absolutely been popping off. Getting the Assimilate on Pra is something that really only comes into play with with the World Ender, and I think that's maybe why players kind of shied away from it initially, but fortunately, Chenya sticking to this tech is really paying off. Tate now is one up in this best of three, has to find another win to take it all. Chenya going to rotate over to the Vein Cane. So even though we know that uh, Chenya is one up, he's still unfavored to win it all because how bad this Kane vein matchup is. His only win condition in his matchup is just blooming cultists. So if Smooth realizes that and keeps remover, keeps challengers just for elusive, he possibly cannot win. He has such two grindy decks left for that matchup. Yeah, Buru Cultist comes through, just a 2-2. He doesn't want to give up this trade. He's hoping for another roll into Buru Cultist, Darken Aegis to get continuous value. Smooth, meanwhile, finds his one drop into two drop combo. Steadfast Elkin with the Darken Spear. It generates tough onto itself when it's equipped and then gets plus two HP. And now some more deck buffing coming through. Sanya was definitely looking for a better hand. This is not it. It's so, so reactive. Oh, and just follow up with another Buru Cultist. This is absolutely brutal. The single combat is great when you're even or ahead, but when you're behind and you have the smaller stats, this is certainly a dead card. If Smooth continues to put on the pressure before Chenya can stabilize with this combat cook, it could be too late. And we see a Roar of Ikatia top deck, but there are absolutely no weapons. There is Huntress, a Roar of Ikatia. But Smooth thinks, all right, 12 weapons, not enough. I guess I have to put more to draw at least more. 
So Broadwing into Elkin to get a challenger could be nice. Smooth just gonna go for the open attack, recognizing if I develop, there's a potential for combat. Cook recognizes that line, and we'll see if Chenya goes for Shepherd's Authority. This is actually a favorite weapon of his. He loves to say, I have big stats. It doesn't matter if I can't block, if I force you to. Oh, th this is weapon for his uh, elusive. Like, he realizes what's his win con. <laughs> this is not meant for... He wants the, the, this weapon of the combat cook ASAP, and he just wants to get that blooming cultist as soon as he can and get that Shepherd's Authority on top of it. But the Steadfast Elkin has been able to get a couple stacks with the Spear. If we can get some more big stats, this looks fine. Another Roar of Akathia and no weapons. Smooth, how many weapons are in this deck? You have to find them soon. Kane coming through. This is so unlikely that Kane can come down and start attacking into these smaller blockers in a safe manner. That's exactly true. Like, if Smooth was bluffing here combat tricks, trying to get Chenya off the attack, but there is a single combat in case anything goes wrong. Oh, I actually really like if he trades away the Steadfast Elkin here to get the Darkened Harpoon back in, the Darkened Spear back into the hand to just re-equip it. If he didn't go for it. He could have went for the Huntress play, where he equips it on the Huntress and then attacks next turn onto those two too, but he decides to go for Rory if he can't instead. Yeah, even if you don't have the weapons, it can still generate two, three twos for you. And now Kane threatening to level up here pretty soon. If Chenia takes over this mid game with a level Ross, this could be a quick 2-0. Smooth being offered a vein, but no weapons to trigger alongside the tumble. I think that Smooth shouldn't have left this spear stranded. Chenya just top deck the best possible card in this matchup aside of Blooming Cultist. He top deck Repost, protects, like, this is such a premium card in Damasia Mirrors. It's crazy. All he needs to do is just hold it for mana, and that's it. Aatrox boosted to a 7-7. The stats look great on paper, but the Concerted Strike comes through instead. Gonna take down the Aatrox. If Smooth tries to react with the Deathbringer sweep, there is still that repose to guarantee. And with the Concerted Strike resolving, Kane is going to level up. That combat cook is doing some heavy lifting with the pressure. And then we have it now. Kane leveling in this matchup is so unlikely. I was really hoping that this elf that this Elkin would carry. It was a great early game play, but there was no mid game to speak of from Smooth, and Chenya is pulling ahead with these power plays. Has the champion right. now? This Karzik. I can make a bet for ten bucks. This is elusive Kane coming. Elusive Kane. Ooh. Yeah, he has a repost to protect it. He has the Shepard's authority, he can equip on it, but probably he'll keep up with the weapon he owns. And Blue. he's just gonna throw the elusive wink on. Blue Kane making an appearance. A very rare card that we see when you're offered against the Darkened Frost. But here comes Bakai Reaper. We've got two Come Kanes on. now. Give me Blue. Give me Blue. If Chenny is the champion, he'll be able to tune in to this primordial world champion force that Alan was able to tap into Blue. for his l run last year. Uh, he went for Rost. He went for the gr more grindier approach. Yeah, he goes for Rost. He doesn't pick up on that world champion energy that you're laying down. Well, I mean, he's ahead on board. There is no blockers. It's still pretty good. It can pull out the blockers, uh, but... The problem, he might find uh, an issue closing the game if there are big bodies uh, that are gonna come down. And Chenya has the repost. He has the momentous choice, looking to just do some buffing here. Can you push through seven, four, five, six, one short? If he does repost here on the uh, on the cane, and then he plays the cane spell, he's offering eight. Yeah, because that has he, to be blocked. Yeah, he drew the cane. Eight more. Smooth did see that, knows that we have the champion spell in hand to trigger a bonus attack to send Ross in for another dip. Here's 16 damage coming through, boosted up now with the Darkened Scythe. If Smooth develops a blocker here, he's playing perfectly into this scenario. The only card from Smooth Hand that can block this and stay alive is Aatrox. Nothing else. Everything else just uh, dies. And Smooth trying to evaluate the situation. How did I even get here? Really rough draws. The weapons are finally coming through, but we just couldn't make use of it with the Roar of Akathia. The funny thing is, if he went for a blue, he had a guaranteed lethal. 
Yeah, I mean, you were right all along, Alan. Such a shame for Chenia not to hear you and go immediately for that play. But again, these players don't want to go all in with these aggressive plays. Chenny is still showing a lot of respect, saying that there are ways for Smooth to take this game back from me. So I'm going to go for something that gives me some stability in the long run. Ah, that combat cookbook putting so much work with the Shepard Authority. It's such a devastating weapon. It's a 4 free. It's crazy how much value it puts in. It, and when Chenya was kind of down and out against Smooth's early game, all he needed to do was play the Cook, and the Shepherd's authority was monstrous. It doesn't matter that this Cook can't block, it just puts out immense damage. Still, uh, Smooth is thinking like he needs to develop a unit that's gonna be at least 5 HP. Yeah, if I've, you don't develop know, here, sorry, you develop six. next turn, the same thing happens to you. It needs to be 6 HP. And, and here's now the Age Box, 6 HP because of the Darkened Blade, and here comes the swing. This is going to pull Aatrox into combat, Rost usurping the World Ender and going for the KO. Beautiful. <laughs> That's crazy that Vayne can just take out Aatrox like that. And now we're back over to Smooth. He has the Darkened Blade, he has a carrier for it. But even with a World Ender, there's not enough cheap Darken weapons to make use of that discount. And the problem is, uh, there is Furious Wilder that was just top deck. There is so many combat tricks that the Rust can just keep grinding out. Yeah, if we try to equip the Darken Blade and assimilate to revive the Aatrox, the Furious Wilder is going to stop that in its tracks. Bane's a 5-6, but at this, po at this point in the game, even those boosted stats aren't going to be enough. Chenya can keep passing, there is no point doing anything yet, he has a solid attack uh, on open. Yeah, with the with the challenger and the overwhelm on Rost, you're guaranteed to push through eight here. And Smooth trying to find a way to get a stable position, but it's just not looking possible, Alan. I can't think of possible any outs for Smooth. I think this is just locked in. Unbelievable that Chenya has gotten, I would say, better with this kind of clunkier darkened build. We've seen how it can be so slow to set up, but once it gets stable, once you give it that time and opportunity, it pops off just like this. So we've seen what he's like, his main win con so far across the those three days is combat cook, put a, put a pressure with combat cook, equip weapon later on elusive, or here we have just that combat cook at turn eight, he's still going. He's like unwielding. And so with that, it means with this incoming attack, Smooth has to get, there's a one of concerted strike in this deck. There's one single combat to respond here to the open attack. So the, definitely Kenya could start with the single combat here because again, he has an answer to concerted. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to be worried. I'm surprised that we see a pass here from the Kenya. The single combat was a very safe play. There was no punish. And now here's the open attack. Rost dragging the vein. Again, these boosted stats do matter to stand up to the overwhelm. Faithful Wolf Dog has to block the combat cook, and that still exact lethal doesn't have any combat tricks to respond to this. Chenya can simply lock it in, and that is going to be him advancing 2-0 and locking in that spot in the next stage of the bracket. That's like even if there was some combat tricks going here, even if you could buff HP on the vein, he can still follow up with the single combat to lower HP, push the overwhelm damage. He still can play momentous choice. He still can play the furious wielder. Chenya had plenty of the cards to follow it up with. Yeah, smooth, still so humble, glad to be in this position regardless. And Chenya celebrating, locking in that spot. It must feel fantastic for the Rost to actually make an appearance. Normally, these matches are all about Aatrox, but the other champ, Kane, coming in strong. Big congratulations to Chenya. Yeah, he played extremely well. Mm -hmm. He identified what are his winning lines, and he went for it. Smooth. Had a good draws, but just not not enough.
Yeah, the roar of Acathia showed up big in game number one, but just could not help in game number two. The lack of weapons to bolster that early hand meant that he fell too far behind. And once that combat cook came down, once your opponent gets that stat line lead, there's not much you can respond with. That's crazy that he had 12 weapons, drew one, and he couldn't do anything. He was just lacking uh, his fuel. His whole deck is built around those weapons. He doesn't mind drawing more weapons than units, but if you draw more units than weapons, it's doomed. And if you are doomed with no weapons, the world is also doomed because of the Darken weapons. Here at the World Ender Expansion Runeterra World Championships, that's one more for the books. And we're going to hear more about it from the analyst desk. Thank you so much, Skarzig and Allen. And it's been so amazing to see just like how a lot of players have been teching these Aatrox decks to make them their own. And Smooths was so interesting because we just heard Allen touch on it. 12 weapons in this deck, which was very unique compared to the rest of the Aatrox lineups we've seen this weekend. And it was a weapon that made all the difference in this matchup and actually in a couple matchups throughout. We, we talked about Smooth finding that win with the Silence and suppress which was a massive tech another massive tech we saw in the various atrox for chenia <laughs> is the darkened fan this has won a couple of matchups <laughs> for chenia and as you can see here on your screen being able to give additional blockers for Wild. this big attack from smooth completely flipped the game and it wasn't just that there was the share z silver Oh yes, the randomly generated cards striking once again. They have come in big so many times and just oh, that flip was because of Sharesies. It went from Aatrox, you know, making a trade to dead Aatrox and the board became Chinia's. And then in the second game, you know, this repost from Chenia sort of, uh, players love when a card comes out to talk about, oh, this will skip your opponent's turn. That repost from Chenia here in game number two really did skip Smooth's turn, just had no choice but to develop an Aatrox and sacrifice it. Otherwise, you cannot afford to float nine mana when you are, you know, open on board in this mid-range style matchup. That was so heads up. Well, I mean, when you look at it too, like a poor smooth, like 12 weapons was a boon, but it was also a bane at the end of the day when it, it just didn't find any in that second game. That was so unlucky. Yeah, in the first game, he kind of had everything he wanted. He, the deck was doing exactly what it's supposed to do, right? The reason you run the 12 weapons is so that your Roar of Akathia is going to be incredibly powerful. He gets to play it on turn three with Bank Mana. He puts all the pressure onto Chenia, and then Chenia... Barely able to flip that around off of Fan and the random generated card, but game two was not the same whatsoever. No, but even in game one, you know, the way that Chenya navigated the early game, it actually played really poorly into what Smooth had developed. We put the gem on the Buru Cultist so it could trade with the 3 4, then the quick attack comes out. All of a sudden, Caught in the Cold is not, you know, sort of uh, unforgiving cold, rather, not trading onto both of the quick attack units like it could have had we diversified the threats a little bit. So even, everything was going great for Smooth in that opening game, but like you said, it did not play out. Yeah. Game Smooth two. was just like such a good sport about it though like I, it's been so fun to watch <laughs> him like react so yeah I, I mean just like you know what he's thinking when he's starting to throw <laughs> yeah. that mustache a little bit you, you, you can see the gears are turning in his head but Chenia just what a master class coming out from this player too to be able to stabilize and also find an out in some of these more precarious situations and he's moving on to the semifinals. Yes, he As absolutely expected. is. <laughs> okay, okay, okay Boulevard. Boulevard. Okay, Boulevard. <laughs> At the end of the day, though, Korea has been able to tie up the score 2-2 two two with Europe, starting the day with five players coming from EMEA. Now down to two, Korea still holding on to their two representatives. Wouldn't have had it any other way. I've been saying this since <laughs> day one. I mean, when you do look at the regional matchups, both semifinals will be EMEA versus Korea. So I think that we have a lot of really intense action ahead of us. We're going to go to a short break, and when we come back, semifinals here at the World Championships. This is going to pull Aatrox into combat, Rost usurping the World Ender and going for the KO. Beautiful.
Welcome back to the 2022 Legends of Runeterra World Championships. We have four players still in the running to get that coveted trophy. And we are at the semifinals already. Amazing. Yeah, can't wait for the matches. It's getting tight. Like the, all the players that are still in are so clean today. I just can't stress it enough. I mean, yeah, they've all been looking really solid. We've seen some incredible play from Teddy and he's going to be coming up soon. I mean. Korea, too. I mean, they have been on it. Yeah, Korea versus EMEA seems to kind of be the narrative that's brewing here, and the players are backing it up. We don't have to make up anything, folks. The, the script is already written, <laughs> and the players are bringing everything they have to the table. Boulevard and Allen have just been going back and forth about this, too, right? So we have our two champions of both of these regions, but looking at the semifinals, we will be having Teddy versus Reroll and also mm. Aragorn versus Chenya. Those are the four players that are left remaining. But when we look at that first semifinal matchup that we're going to cover, Teddy versus Reroll, let's talk about Teddy's performance so far in the quarterfinals. I mean, there is nothing to say wrong, bad about <laughs> the Teddy, like it's been flawless. But also Reroll, like those players are on point. Like the level of this year Worlds, is on top. I mean, it's been insane to see the lines that these players have taken. They've been so strong at identifying what do I need to do to win this game? And it's lines that, you know, when you first look at the board state, you're, it doesn't come to mind right away. So being able to identify that this is the way I'm going to win, I mean, incredible. Yeah, we there was an unexpected ban from Tenny, right, against Maddie to ban that conservatory. We know that he's a player that isn't afraid to maybe deviate from his natural ban strategy a little bit, not afraid to take big risks of letting their opponent play a stronger champion strength deck, right, is confident that his piloting skill is going to come out on top. 
I mean, but reroll as well. That's another tough opponent. We already saw how reroll and buy attack went earlier today. And that was a matchup we were all looking at because what a caliber for both of these players to be meeting each other in the quarterfinals. He was very sharp in every line he took. It was the winning line. He didn't took any losing lines because you can sometimes play to win, There's, but there are sometimes players doing a play to lose. Just a last hope uh, plays. But all the way, he, what he did was winning. Yeah, looking here, we see the aggressive lines that Reroll was taking in order to bully down by attack and that Red Gwen taught me how to play the matchup properly. Oh yeah, I can't get over setting up that Katarina to be able to then stun the Eternal Dancers and then as well as that Ballista coming in clutch. It was so cool to see all these little unique choices. And as we look at the semifinals matchup too, we're gonna see even more of that as like, how do these lineups really compare Teddy versus Reroll? What are you looking at as to be a highlight of this match? Uh, another player making the mistake of letting that Seraphine through, in my opinion. Oh no. Reroll is a confident player. He has that red Gwen in his pocket, knows how to play it, but we've seen it time and again that back alley bar too strong. I think Rero's lineup uh, goes really well into Seraphine. I would be very surprised if we're gonna see the ban mm -hmm. because first we have Red Gwen. Red Gwen doesn't like to play against Seraphine, but that's from Shadow Isles. The bundle version is completely fine. Vaynatrox just goes through Seraphine like a machine. It, does, like, it doesn't care about the Seraphine at all. And Action Severe Virus, it's it's extremely efficient as well because we have double right of negation. We the, like no matter what it's thrown at the stack, it one spell can just take all of those away. We have seen the power of elusives too, so maybe that comes into play. I don't know. It could be. I mean, the players are already getting in position. I know that we're kind of divided on who's going to come out on top, Alan. But Silverfuse, <laughs> oh, is there no anybody? Division. I'm trying to recruit <laughs> no some division. extra people on my side. <laughs> oh come on, Silverfuse, you got to pick a pick a side. Pick a side. I like the way that rerolls decks line up here. <laughs> and he's been playing incredibly clean. I mean, they both have, it's so tough picking, but I really just, I like Reroll's lineup. And that's Seraphine's gotta to. go down. That's really the long and okay. short of it. We could debate this all day, but the players are gonna be the ones that are battling it out here in our first semifinals. So let's go, Casanova and Boulevard, take it away. All right, thank you, Necro. We have an incredibly high-powered matchup coming to us. And, you know, Boulevard and I have been at odds for a very long time. But for this one, we got to team up. We got to power up to become Bully Nova. Let's go by our powers combined. <gasps> Bully Nova, let's get into this one. Excited to see Teddy versus Reroll, EU versus Korea. And these are two of our favorites for the tournament. Oh, absolutely, Casanova. These two seasonal champions coming in to duke it out. The upper side of the bracket we said at the start of the day it seemed to be the stronger one. And, you know, we talked about Baya versus Reroll, a potential finals from another timeline. Teddy versus Reroll, it's just the same story over again. Yeah, this time, though, different decks, even though there are slight variations of similarities to the other lineup, right? We did see Baya running a Seraphine list, though that was the Aphelios version. This time around, we have the Ezreal Vic Victor with Bandol. You heard Alan say it. Some of these decks from Reroll might be fast, causing the Seraphine to be a weak link, but watching Ty uh, Teddy pilot this has been a thing of beauty. But Reroll has been playing so much more aggressively with That's these mid-range decks than we see out of other players, so I understand the ban onto the Jinx saying, hey, you know, you can go six wide consistently and that's a little bit tougher for me to fight through but this Ezreal Seraphine is only playing eight followers in the main deck that is something that Reroll can push right through without as much issue it's going to be very tough to deal with the board we look at a lot of the one ofs we need to find some of these stronger ones against a strong board things like wallop to slow things down it's also going to come down to what does the conchologist generate can we get a dark bulb acolyte to stack up some attack and not just that but I think this is finally the matchup where that one of Elise in Reroll is actually starting to look like an okay tech choice. Yeah, we did criticize it quite a bit because in a lot of the mid-range matchups, she's pretty dead. She's not a very good spider. She kind of just gets squished. But going up against Seraphine, she actually can get underneath, get a lot of pressure in the early game, and you need to just run this deck over. Yeah, there are actually zero main decked fearsome blockers in this Seraphine Ezreal. The back alley barkeep, sort of the only one that you can guarantee coming out and getting online. And of course, we just see all of these different one-ofs. And a lot of the tech choices not lining up you know, phenomenally against real like this new caustic rift card that we see from the new expansion, looking to clear out more champion strength boards than these more mid-range ones that reroll has brought. Absolutely. So now jumping over to reroll.
Reroll to focus even more heavily on his deck list. This lineup, Alan said it very early in the week that he felt that this was one of the strongest into the overall field. One of the biggest reasons being that Akshan Varys Sivir, who's one of only two players to bring this, it's looked great so far. But on top of that, the aggression he's brought with these mid-range decks to get underneath people when generally mid-range does good into the aggressive variants because it slows it down, plays greedier, Reroll has still been able to go under. Yeah, it's just, you know, the combination of the Absolver and the Varus just offers so much more overwhelm options than you're really getting out of any other mid-range list. And of course, that one of Sivir still able to push it along. But of course, this Elise deck that we need to talk about, because it is, the Elise might end up being the star of the show. Should she be able to show up on turn two? But again, that Iron Ballista played so well earlier on. Yeah, and even look at the bans here. We've got the ban onto the Jinx champion strength away from Teddy. We've got the ban onto Ukshan Sivir Varus. So we will see that Red Gwen matchup potentially into the Seraphine later. But for now, it is Vayne Aatrox going up against Seraphine Victor. Yeah, just a little bit too scary to play into the Varus and Absolvers. You need to take that one off the table. And instead, it is going to be a dark and heavy matchup still. You know, we don't see as many weapons out of this build from Reroll as we have from some the other Aatrox competitors, just three copies of Darken Ages and Darken Heart. And one thing that he's continued to do, though, is look for those weapons in the mulligan to make sure that he has one to enable his cards, enable his Ranger Knight Defector, right? He's always looking for that, trying to stack up for his World Ender, but like you said, he plays a little bit more aggressively, so sometimes he's not even looking for that World Ender. He's looking to finish a little bit quicker, and this is one of those matchups where you kind of want to do that. We saw Teddy mulligan very aggressively, only keeping the Victor. There was the option of, you know, one of his one-ups Wallop, which can slow things down. It's slows things down, it doesn't stop it. And Victor, he's going to need to be able to stack up very high, get those keywords to find ways to turn this around. Oh, and no catch in the hand for reroll does mean that this vein is just going to go down to the exact lethal for damage. Not quite enough to protect it, but there was a second copy of the champion in hand, so maybe we'll see v uh, Victor and Vayne just kind of square up against each other and see who can take it home first. Yeah, Teddy just, you know, recognizing, hey, at this point, I just have to throw out this Thermo. If I am able to grab uh, one of your combat tricks from you for this, it's overall okay. And if I get to kill off of Vayne, that's perfect. So looking for that interesting play here to bring out yeah. the Assault. I, so the Blinding Assault I'm fine with. The question here is which weapon is Reroll going to equip to it? You have the Darkened Heart for the Quick Attack. You have the Aegis for the Tough. There is a group shot in Teddy's hand if you go for the greedier Quick Attack, because at the moment, yeah, the Aegis is all it's going to take to safely kill the Conchologist. Yeah, group shot. Shot, pokey stick, mystic shot. There's actually quite a few, you know, drop the bomb. Uh, there's, there's quite a few ways to actually deal with this if the Aegis isn't on top of it. So being able to put that on your challenger, incredibly powerful. And like you said, being able to take out that Conchologist and still keep this challenger available, that's going to be a lot of threat later down the line. And I don't think Teddy can afford to play Victor here because it's going to be really Demon's funny weapon. if we throw down... Demon's okay, it's no longer an option, but I was going to say, you know, if we take out the Conchologist, Teddy plays Victor, then we swap out to the other weapon now that you're oh, tapped out. Yeah. But Instead, it's going to be Vayne coming down, continuing to tick down this tumble. Yep, here we go. So just take out that Conchologist for free. Teddy's still sitting on four mana. Not a lot of clean removal options in hand. Yes, he's got the group shot, he's got the pokey stick, but there's nothing on the board that he can actually hit with it. Waits for the initial combat. He knows that reroll is tapped out. Now is the time that he can play his Victor down, and reroll only has the option to drop Victor down to one health, cannot actually take it out. It's definitely awkward here if your priority is to level up the vein, right? You can't really send either of these units in. They both die to the victor. You don't have the mana to re-equip the weapon. And while this Ranger Knight Defector coming down next turn is looking really strong into the hand of Teddy, at the moment, things just a little bit more awkward than Reroll would like. As we mentioned, he's been playing very aggressively, and this is a really big shift in tempo. Yeah, I mean, that's all Teddy wants, right? He wants to stop the tempo, slow the game down, build up this victor, get Seraphine online. Because if this game continues to go fast, Teddy is going to lose. That is just how this works. Reroll wants that tempo to continue. So any little bits that Teddy can find to slow this down are huge. We see the draw from Teddy. Okay, this is important. It has been a minute since we have seen Teddy not have that back alley bar on six, that pivotal namesake card of the Seraphine decks, keeping everything chugging along with the reduced cost. And Challenger Fearsome, not the best combinations of keywords, definitely a little anti-synergistic. Yeah, fully anti-synergistic, right? Fearsome trying to make it so people cannot block you. Challenger is like, hello, please come block me right now. That's what I would like. And the other side of this, right? Teddy not having the bar, but he does have some card draw. We'll see if Teddy wants to dig to try and 
find that turn six. He'd have to use things like Pokey Stick and Rummage early on in order to do so. And it's not exactly where you want to be at and just firing those off at this stage of the game, especially with a Rummage, you'd love to be able to wait and double that with the Seraphine. Oh, absolutely. It's one of those things that you're always thinking about and kind of tempering it against, well, you know, what am I sitting on right now? How badly do I need to find my cards on curve? You know, might use it to look for that bar because the rest of the hand from Teddy, nothing really jumps out at me as an auto play for this turn. It's a very reactive hand and reroll with the mana left available probably done playing proactively for the remainder of this turn. I kind of like this trinket trade. Just see what options you get and be a little bit more mana efficient than just throwing away, you know, an extra two mana there just to bank the three. So instead, we get to play that out. We just go for the otter puss, get another blocker down just to continue to stall things out. And maybe that prank can find a decent target if we have some extra mana, which we do currently, right? We've got one floating that we could just squeeze a prank in. I think it's a prime rummage target for Teddy, though, That's which true. might be the That's setup. Right. If you yeah. do feel like you need to rummage... Uh, uh, earlier on, you want to have that prank already in hand as a good discard target, not forced to discard some of your other cards. And it's actually going to be Heroic Refrain off a of Bandal Tellstone. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Going Tellstones, going to actually fully tap out, knowing that there's only three mana left for reroll, but feeling that this is a powerful enough swing. The Victor theoretically can go down here, I believe, to a catch, but that is not there or a sharp sight, but neither of those are in hand. And there was a little bit of a read that reroll didn't have a catch from earlier on yeah, in the game, true. not equipping the Dark and Aegis in response to the Thermo Beam. So Teddy, you know, making the read, understanding, yeah, a couple of draws have happened since then, but it's still very low odds. Yeah, and it's going to pay off, at least for now, of course, being able to take that down, but we are going to see the tumble come through. Oh, yeah, and the re-equip of the Darkened Harp does mean that Victor is going to go down here. Teddy totally tapped out. Again, no bar online means that group shot is going to be one mana, not quite enough. Goodbye, Victor. Yeah, very notably, one of Victor in this list. So we're not going to have to worry about that at all for reroll in the rest of the game. Seraphine, Ezreal are the bigger win conditions as a whole, but Victor is a very nice mid-game bridge against these kind of mid-range deck lists if it can continue to stack up those keywords. And we see the new Bandle City spell, Puzzling Signpost, top deck for Teddy. Not a great target in this deck, although the World Ender, I would say, probably yeah, primo, right? It's absolutely the biggest thing that you're going to hit, but Reroll seems so far away from an Aatrox big Darken game plan. Yeah, you can look for that. You can look for Condemn in certain spots. It's not always going to be your favorite, especially if it's been reduced quite heavily, but there are a few targets that you can hit with it. Of course, the World Ender is the biggest, and Aatrox has now been, you know, pulled out of the deck, tutored by all these weapon types. And I love reroll slipping in the Dark and Harp while Teddy's defenses are down. Priority goes back to me. The first thing that I do, get an extra health and a tough back onto my Valor. Absolutely phenomenal play from Reroll here. So much mileage out of this Valor so far in this game, and it's not done yet. It's still here. It's still causing problems. Teddy has so much stuff that deals one damage in this deck. It's a problem we talked about with Conservatory, actually, being able to not deal with things, getting the tough keyword from the Harp, or even just the tough keyword from Rager's Resolve. In this case, it is the Harp, and it's giving Teddy so much trouble. And now the Ranger Knight Defector, again, another They're card tough. that just has yeah. tough. It works out so well into this ping-based matchup. Literally half of Teddy's hand says deal one damage to a unit. Yeah, I mean, Teddy right now very heavily thinking through this. You can see on his face, he's just kind of not sure exactly what he wants to do game plan wise into these toughs. He knows he needs to stall out the game. He needs to find bar so he can really start kicking things off, especially since Seraphine not incredibly close to leveling just yet. And since you mentioned the bar, we talked a little bit earlier, you know, is Teddy going to rummage aggressively for this? What Teddy might be puzzling out here is what do I discard alongside this prank? And is it puzzling signposts? It feels really rough because you know Aatrox was just drawn. You know there's a lot of weapons in hand, and that World Ender is going to come pretty fast because of all the attacks. Here's where it gets awkward, though. Reroll, you know, only playing the Dark and Aegis and the Dark and Harp, his World Ender is probably the lowest impact in the tournament. Unless you have a Harp out, th once the spell is put on the stack, Aatrox will level up and you get the cost reduction, which I think is what he cares more about. But we're going into combat, full scout attack here from Reroll. All right, so here it comes through. We've got two spells being pulled out. One of them is Pokey Stick, and the other is Puzzling Signpost. Destroying the equipment. Yep. Does have that alternative mode, and that is going to be Valor taken down. The Dark and Aegis destroyed. And that's actually a really good point because of the fact that World Ender, yeah, maybe not as high impact in this specific version of Bane Aatrox than anyone else. Teddy recognizing that, hey, actually, this equipment is giving me a lot of trouble right now, and using this later on a World Ender is maybe far less impactful than just removing the equipment in the short term. Yeah, I mean, the Jural 
is a huge difference maker in a matchup like this. Teddy really needs to be able to play things out as cheaply as possible, put multiple spells on the stack and combine these different cards together so Jeral can really upset that, knows that Reroll has a second copy of the card in hand, but it might be a little while before it comes down and this Hex, uh, this Hex Obliterator can you afford to save this for Aatrox? This Ranger Knight Defector is not slowing down anytime soon. Yeah, getting Hex Obliterator is huge, though. You need some of your bigger removals into Demacia because of just the fact that, hey, the units are um, bigger. You need to have big number take out the big health. That's what we need for Teddy. And he was able to also find this Squire. The Yordle Squire is going to be able to create another card. So that, that might be that discard fodder we needed for this rummage if we wanted to dig a little bit further. Yeah, and now Teddy, the rope has come. Actually, just going to immediately pass back over and reroll has quite a few options on how you want to play this one. The Fleet Feather top, de the Fleet Feather Tracker top deck does leave Aatrox open as an option, but actually just going to immediately throw the Aatrox down, get the World Ender in hand, and Teddy might be eyeing up that Hex Obliterator. Although Sharp Sight and Catch both still available on turn seven, it's been a long time since you checked. Yeah, the last time he checked was, I believe that was turn three that he went in with that thermogenic beam. So we've had four draws since then. I'm sure Teddy's been tracking if some of those draws have been played. I think maybe two of them have. So there's two that he doesn't know. Still going for that Hexbliterator though. And he's going to be able to handle this first Aatrox. Although, now that Aatrox is gone, that clears the way for Seratu. The 8-6 quick attack Darken, the harp in hand for reroll, no clean answers for Teddy if that were to come down. And Seratu is the best way Demacia has ever had to draw cards in the later stages of the game and really get back into things. Yeah, Seratu going to be able to let reroll kind of keep up in value with Teddy and also start finding these answers to the removals, especially because Teddy has already played some of his bigger removals. So having any other way to kind of stop that, slow that down. Pings are already doing nothing to tough. They'll do even less when you have tricks. This is so unfortunate. If Reroll had one more mana, they could catch to swap out the weapon and then summon Suratu, but on eight mana and the harp locked in on the Ranger Knight Defector, we're just going to have to go for a more honest, traditional Demacia style of building up the board and going in for an attack. Yeah, not going to be able to play Suratu as an attacker until turn 10. That is very slow against Seraphine. Teddy has kind of stabilized for the moment. Right now, this board is still horrifying, but at least Teddy is not dropping down to, you know, sub 5 HP here. I believe, is he going to take 6? He, it he can get a blocker down. It depends on what comes yeah. out of this combat, Cook, because we're going to have two challengers. If we see reroll, take the lines that Chenia has and go for the can't block weapon, get this really big, could be falling as low oh, as 6 here. That's true. This could be a bigger swing than it initially looks, but Yordle Squire going to be able to First off, be a chump. Still there. have the Dark Ball back. Shepherd's Authority Shepherd's offered up authority. a pan of pain. The tough has been so pivotal in this matchup. Getting that keyword onto the cook could be huge here. What is that blocking? I mean, of course it blocks every single ping, but is there any bigger spell that that is going to make a big difference a to go that instead of just the extra HP from Shepherd's Authority? Reroll deciding immediately that it is going to be that pot of pain, however. Yeah, it just plays so well in the later stages of the game. Reroll not tunneling on the opportunity immediately in front of him, saying it's not lethal either way. I'm missing out on what? One damage by going this pot of pain rather than the Shepherd's Authority? Just deciding that it's not worth it. Yeah, and I mean, it, it does have that future proofing, of course, right? So when Seraphine starts to double up spells, doubling up those one damage pings, well, they're still one damage pings. It's not like they're doubled at the, the moment. They're not doing two damage now. They're doing one damage twice, and that still does nothing to these tokens. Yeah, and now, honestly, this is probably the first time that Teddy has had two good discard targets for the rummage. You know, leveled Seraphine, we could see draw four here. Yep, been able to hold the rummage the whole time. Very important. We talked about hey, how he wanted to keep this rummage for the leveled Seraphine. Oh, and so Troll Chan. Up. Troll Chan is massive for these combats to save damage. That's a huge pickup on the generation. Yeah, Teddy might be able to start swinging this back now. I think a bar might still be necessary in order to get everything down, but the tough, such an important keyword to fight through, and Teddy going to have to play with the cards in his deck at the end of the day, and even if you draw a lot of one-damage spells, they won't do anything against these weapons. You know, and one of the big things is not having Suratsu being able to attack on this turn. We see Reroll starting to run very low on resources, and Teddy is going to be the opposite with the Seraphine and the potential to cast this rummage. Although, if Teddy takes too much time setting up oh, next turn, you know, maybe he plays uh, an Ezreal and a uh, back alley bar, that, that'd probably be lethal. But if <laughs> anything similar happens, <laughs> anything less powerful than that, where it takes a lot of mana, uh, Reroll could just resolve World Ender. That's true. World Ender could be solid enough, but as you mentioned, it does feel a little bit weaker. It would get a Suratu. We're still going to get him. A out Scout Suratu. Ooh. 
That's a lot of card draw. That is a lot of power. It more comes down to at that point, does Teddy just have lethal? That's oh, really song, song spinner. spinner is so big. This is the card we've talked about Seraphine decks in the past. I've we'll talked to some of the players that said, hey, it doesn't look like your deck has a win condition unless you find specifically this other champion. And they've told me, no, what are you talking about? Suttering Song Spinner with Seraphine is just a win condition. All right, there we go. Teddy wanting to take a look into the hand of Reroll. He gets to find everything. He knows exactly what he's playing against. And this is big for Teddy. He's been very methodical. He's been great against playing around what potentially the opponent has. But now guess what? We know exactly what the opponent has, so let's see exactly what the play becomes for Teddy. It's going to start with Rummage. And we've got Ezreal. We don't have Bar, but that might not matter. We've got Seraphine and Ezreal both online, but Jeral available for reroll still might be able to pump these spells up to too high of a cost for it to matter because looking at all these different pings in hand, I'm seeing three tough units on the side of reroll if this Jeral were to be played. Absolutely, and that is the leveled Ezreal, so there is a lot of pressure, but as you said, if Jeral comes through, you can't cast on the stack, so if reroll can present lethal, then he can push that through, and Teddy will not be able to push the gas on the other side. There's a Condemn. But there's a Troll Chant. We knew this Troll Chant was going to come in big, although in this case, now it's no longer available to Teddy for the next turn when you might be dying. And it's burst speed and a target, so it just pumped a ton of damage into Reroll's face. Yeah, no mana left available for the Mystic shot, though, but also no mana left available for the Jeral. Yeah, not going to be able to create that pressure on the side of Reroll. And instead, Teddy is going to be able to refill this entire mana bar. Only needs to deal 11. He has leveled Seraphine, leveled Ezreal. I mean, that's just got to do it, right? Yeah, without the open attack from the Jeral to up the cost of the Suttering Song Spinner, as well as the cards coming out of it, you have to assume that Song Spinner, Seraphine, Ezreal is just going to be lethal. I mean, it's just 11 damage. He's absolutely got to be able to get there. As you said, Song Spitter going to give you potential options to find more bursts, more targets, cheap spells, of course, because there should be new every single time you're picking through. Teddy going to think this very heavily. What can he lose to? But he knows the entire hand except for one card. He knows there's not many things that can actually beat him here. Yes, Lethal will be presented, but there are ways to answer through here. Yeah, and I'm trying to figure out right now, if, if Suttering Song Spinner only offers up slow spells, does Teddy does still... Okay, yeah, there's a burst speed spell. Throw that one out the window. One burst, and a, two bursts. Two burst spells. No targeting spells yet, though. Not that I think it's going to matter too much. And Trail of Evidence, probably a, a phenomenal pickup here. We're going to see a lot more random generation as Ezreal continues to tick down the Nexus. Teddy continuing to be so perfect on this Seraphine Ezreal list. An absolute masterclass in how to pilot and being able to survive in those early games against the pressure that Reroll was able to exert. Always checking to see, you know, what does Reroll have? This is low impact if I lose my thermogenic beam to a buff and I'll have recourse against it later. Not ending up getting punished, recognizing, okay, no catch, likely no sharp, sharp sight. What can we do from here? What can we use with that information? And Teddy being able to punish. Yeah, Teddy, from a losing position from the get-go, no back alley bar, no combo on the Ezreal Seraphine, at least for the first half of the game, and then losing the victor rather untimely, but just able to bring it back at the end stages of the game where it matters the most, being able to stall it out, reroll. Played as aggressively as he could, but Teddy just kept checking for things that reroll didn't have. Yeah, Teddy being able to also recognize that he needed to hold that rummage. It didn't matter if he had bar. What mattered is that he can draw four cards off of that rummage and by saving that rummage until the Seraphine level came down recognizing he could survive long enough was so big and Teddy turning that around. And now we are going to see the Aatrox Vein mirror between these two players. Teddy playing with a couple of copies of Quinn and only one Aatrox while Reroll keeping it nice and honest. All three copies of Aatrox. A really nice combo picked up by Teddy here to start things out. He's got Blinding Assault into Harp with Catch. So he can use Catch to actually surprise get that harp on and be able to push some extra damage with this blinding assault to clear a bigger unit. Reroll has the awesome. same thing and Reroll gonna have the attack token on too for the Valor but again no mana in order to equip that weapon no surprise factor and no units outside of this in the hand for Teddy. Champion strength for Teddy which usually you would be like this is a huge thing a huge deal for Teddy to have his champion strength is one of champion strength or I believe it's actually two for Teddy, two yeah. of champion strength here. He has one in the hand. If he can set up and win on turn five when he has the attack token, that would, we, we'd be just talking about how Teddy's walking home with the win here. But as Boulevard said, no units just yet outside 
of this Blinding Assault, Quinn helps quite a bit. Yeah, I was gonna say, this deck isn't really built around the champion strength. It feels like more of an identification that this is a strong card, one of the cornerstones of the meta. And Quinn being a champion that Teddy brought really does help facilitate this should we get it. We're not looking for it on curve here, right? We're not looking at the What Am I style of play, oh, the 4-0 <laughs> cannon into the ending the game on turn five. It's gonna come down much later on, maybe even test the waters for a world ender. That's true. It's a way to actually win out if we go World Ender into World Ender. Oh, and Repost actually right. going to blow wow. out this combo. Reroll, picking it up with a spell that there are zero copies of from Teddy. Yeah, just holding on to yet another tech card coming from Korea that's coming out big. We saw the Repost helping Reroll win earlier against Baya as well. So this is like a very big pickup. And now we see Vayne picked up for Teddy might actually have a little bit of a blowout here with the catch as well as the two challenges from Reroll. I think it would be a big trade of units, which would actually favor Teddy in the end as a big trade of resources when Reroll has no more units in hand. Teddy gets to safely drop a Quinn on the following turn. Yeah, Reroll's opening hand was looking kind of similar to Teddy's and they've both drawn primarily dead into spells and things that are not being used in the early game. But since then, Teddy has picked up both of his champions or at least the, the two major Demacia champions since you'll tutor out the Aatrox later, being able to pick up Quinn and Vayne. The power level of what Teddy has picked up has been much stronger than Reroll recently, and I think Teddy's going to be able to grab the momentum in this match. And Reroll might have to play it a little bit slower here and just kind of cycle through the weapons to find the Aatrox faster than Teddy does. Once you lose all your units, you can't, you know, continuously equip weapons. It gets a lot harder in order to do these kinds of things. But if they really want to, also we'll have a one mana Condemn available this turn. All right, so pulling on to the Vayne. We're going to just get the catch, be able to pump up the vein 1-1, one, one, keep it alive against Valor, trade up for that. Reroll can send his other challenger in to take out the vein. And this is the big question that we had, how does Reroll want to play this? Do you want to take out the vein? Do you, you can't challenge it and condemn it. You would have to just attack with the Fleet Feather Tracker, no pull, then you can condemn. But still two mana left on the side of Teddy does make it a little bit of a scary prospect. And now a unit picked up for Reroll, so important. If Reroll doesn't pick up a unit, this game might actually just be over because he's essentially skipping turn five with you know, six mana just going to the dirt. So being able to find a unit, he's at least going to be able to put something on board, but Quinn is so powerful into this. And reroll, understanding that, yeah, I, there is still a Darkened Harp in Teddy's hand. I cannot just throw down and sacrifice my unit. Pretty much exactly what Chenia did earlier in the day. And Teddy, are you going to hang on to that scout attack? Is this where you throw down a weapon? And it's just going to be go. a full wow. float of rerolls mana pool. I like this from Teddy. Yes, you can push that additional five, but here you're going to actually hurt a lot of value from reroll if you had a unit to play. The call out there is that, yes, you have a unit and you just don't want to play it into me instead of Teddy reading that, hey, you don't have any units and you fully bricked here. And funny enough, this actually isn't that big of a punish for reroll. His hand, his development was very weak, but Teddy at the high level play, you know, just saying, I think that you have things that you want to develop. I'm not going to take the risk. And it's one that actually, I think, favors reroll in this it situation. It does because he's able to get this. Oh, champion online. strength champion is resolving. Strength is massive. Just going to go for the rally. Wants to put the pressure on. Push reroll down. And I don't think reroll has the mana or time to do much about this. The You can equip the Dark and Harp to the Geral to trade onto the Valor. And then Quinn knocks you down to one HP 14. back yeah. into Teddy's attack token. Exactly, it takes 14 and then you have the immediate, this is three attacks in a row from Teddy and this should be able to actually seal the deal because you're gonna be able to open attack after this. Teddy is a, just immediately turned on the gas with that champion strength and he's gonna push himself towards the grand final. Yeah, this is what we talked about, that Quinn champion tech in so good with the champion strength. We even get to see the level up, Valor joining the party at the very end hole and reroll gonna have to move down to the lower bracket play for third or fourth place later on in the day but Teddy moving on to the grand finals amazing play from Teddy Teddy seasonal champion EU's masters champion and now he's moving on to the final of the world championships he would be the first player to ever complete a feat like that with the triple crown Teddy outstanding still flawless on that Seraphine and beautifully showcasing why the Quinn is so important in this vein Aatrox deck the power that it can provide turning that game completely into a stomp from what looked like 
very rough draws on both sides. And not just that, finally showcasing this champion strength at, at the beginning of the day, we were like, okay, is this just thrown into the Aatrox deck, sort of double down on some of the more powerful Demacian win conditions of the day? Or is there an actual strategy here? How well does it pair with the Quinn? We finally got to see it play out in the most important game of the tournament for Well, him. it's such a beautiful use case of that champion strength in a deck that uses so few units. All you need is the Quinn for it to be incredibly powerful because you get that scout attack first. So you're getting to scout rally there is so incredibly strong and it causes three attacks in a row deal 21 damage with your Quinn and just end the game beautiful from Teddy it was and now that we have done the math there's none left for the caster desk to, or the analyst desk to do but we are going to throw it back to them anyway to break down the rest of the game I'm glad we don't have to do math because because that that's just not my strong suit here I'm gonna let the players and you guys <laughs> all handle that but what an incredible game Teddy right now not only did Casanova point out that there is a triple crown on the horizon, but Teddy's also completely undefeated in the tournament so far. That's absolutely nuts. I mean, that's pretty expected for you, player. <laughs> a EMEA player. We saw another showcase of his magnificent hand reading ability. This is a skill that a lot of competitive players have said they've been specifically focusing on trying to cultivate. And once you give a signal to Teddy that you don't have a certain card, you're lacking reactivity to the plays he wants to make, he steamrolls you. I mean, especially using that Quinn to his advantage. It's not the first time we've seen her be a great one of slot in instead of saying, eh, do I really need all these Aatrox? You know, this Quinn looking really good. I mean, that was another win condition besides the World Ender, and it paid off big. As much as game two was an out of play, pretty much, uh, game one, like that was a very hard game to pilot for the Teddy mm -hmm. because the vein Aatrox matchup is really, really hard to beat with the setup in bundle and you have to just, you can't even kill there anything. All you have to do is just a rich stalemate until you draw your win cost without losing all your cards from the hand. Yeah, in that first game, a lot of Teddy's like techs came in. We had the one of Victor that forced a response from reroll and it just, you have to keep that scaling threat from taking over the game. That thermogenic beam coming in on Vayne early on gave him the read that there was no catch and he used that information to just bully down further and further. Reroll ended up stranding the Stratu on the Ranger Knight Defector trying to go all in on this tough unit to, to keep up but didn't have the extra card draw potentially. Well, we will see Teddy move on to the grand finals match with that 2-0 victory, but we're not going to say goodbye to Reroll yet because we will be playing a third third place match as well today. So we will get a chance to see reroll again. But on the other side of the bracket with that semifinals, I think that one's going to be really tough as well. Aragorn versus Chenia. We've already seen them perform in the quarterfinals so far. Well, how have you thought about Aragorn's play? I'm going to, uh, Alan, let, you can start. Oh, I'm ready for more Black Flame action. That deck is 3-0. That's crazy. I expected this deck to go 0-4 in groups and just uh, say goodbye. Meanwhile, he's cruising. Oh, yes. I, I want to see that deck go through. But I don't know if I want to give you the satisfaction of an EMEA versus EMA final. Oh, it's obvious. The, the Talia Ziggs was a deck that I was hoping would to get a respect ban. I called it, I said, oh no, the Seraphine Ezreal gets through. I think that if players have been paying attention to the other matches going on, kind of scoping out the field of these competitors, you need to maybe account for some of these stronger lists that didn't come up during initial testing and just going with your instinct of, ooh, this might be a little bit too strong and I can't handle it. I mean, if that gets through and it also ends I mean, up we'll being be the regardless. last deck with like Aragorn, I, that that just could be a finisher. It's been a finisher in all of the matches mm -hmm. Aragorn has played so far this weekend. But on the other side too, Chenia, Aragorn's opponent, been playing such a solid game so far. All right, guys, how do you feel about the finals being most likely two EMEA players and you're uh, already Porto counting him out. <laughs> I mean, and top three being just two a uh, fighting for between two APAC players, most likely. The best part about Chinia's <laughs> lineup is that if the opponent plays too slowly, it gets set up and takes over the game. If that Talia Ziggs doesn't get a nasty rock bear parade up and running, he could just get the world ender online. 
Yeah, completely. But we cannot forget about that blooming cultist. It kept finding Lethals. Mm -hmm. It kept finding Lethals in the spots yeah. where it was cr it was very unlikely to even win the game. And it just, like, against Roji, 15 damage out of nowhere. And I mean, even just in that match as well that Chenia had played to even get to the semifinals, you saw how he was able to navigate those incredibly early games from, from Smooth, too. That game number one, it looked like Smooth was off on such a great curve, and still Chenia able to pull out a win in that game one. It feels like if Chenia is getting a curveball from the game, he manages it perfectly. He has the X factor, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's, there's so many different aspects that go into making a competitive player. Throwing sugar, spice, <laughs> deck building, meta reads, hand Everything reads. Nice. And then sometimes you just channel protagonist energy and you make it happen. You get these Ws when no other player could make it happen. Silver Fuse, you got to agree with me on this one. Chenius got it. <laughs> Let's go, Chenius! Let's go! Okay, guys, come on, come on, come on. Black <laughs> Flame Energy will Prevail for zero. I, I mean, flame. the Ionia tech into Aragorn's Telia is <laughs> yes, so good. Let's go. Flame, go. Oh, I see it. We're going to let the caster talk about the bands a little bit more when we get there. But Aragorn versus Chenia is absolutely going to prove to be another just hard fought match. Yeah, that will be definitely tough for Iroh. Let's see if he can uh, do anything about EMEA Supremacy. <laughs> Okay, well, we're gonna ha you're, you're jumping the gun a little bit there, Alan. <laughs> We've still got one semifinal ahead of us, and it's time to see the action between Aragorn and Chania. Boulevard Casanova, take it away. Well, thank you, Necra, and the rest of the analyst desk. Boulevard, we have the last semifinal here. We're deciding who will face Teddy in the grand finals. Aragorn or Chenia. These two have been electrifying to watch throughout this entire tournament, especially on the back of the Black Flame, but also the Darkened Fan on the other side. Yeah, both these players have brought some incredible tech cards, specifically Ionia tech cards, yeah. which is weird because I believe this is, oh, well, there's, there's some a little, very few most, Ionia yeah. decks in the tournament, and uh, actually Chenia not being able to ever get through with the Lulu Jinx, but yeah, this unworthy soul. Not only has it played so well for Aragorn throughout the day, but I think it's going to play specifically specifically well into the two very mid-range focused decks that Chenia has left open. Yeah, if you can bounce the big boys back for three mana, that's exactly what Aragorn is going to be looking for with that unworthy soul. And the black flame on Talia as a finisher has been huge, being able to fill up the stack and not allow any defense. Yes, filling the stack against the decks that we have from Chenia is not as massive because they're not looking at a ton of removal spells, and the ones that they do have are the burst speed, but still it is important because it's just so much damage anyway. Yeah, and you know, this Unworthy Soul actually playing double duty against the decks that Chenia has left. They're both very weapon focused, and I don't think it's come up before, but Unworthy Soul actually will destroy any attachments before recalling the unit. Yeah, and that will definitely matter here against Chenia, who does have two of these darkened lists. Granted, the one, the Vein Cane, is a little bit lighter on weapons. It still matters to get rid of them as we take a look here at the ban being Lulu Jinx away, so we'll see the two Darken lists for the side of Chenia. I'm not gonna lie, Casanova, I am a little bit worried here. Chenia's decks have looked kind of shaky throughout the tournament. I've talked about how I really prefer the Kane paired with the Aatrox as opposed to the Varus, and Vayne Kane has actually consistently surprised me. Kane takes a while to ramp up, and it feels like players haven't been giving Chenia the time for that Kane to ramp up, and it's just been working out anyway. It feels like Chenia is scrapping through games he has no right winning, and then picking them up towards the end with just playing towards his outs and finding them. The Blooming Cultist was one that was called, getting that elusive and being able to just take down Roji earlier on in the tournament. And then as well, we've seen the fan bail out this Varus Aatrox deck a couple of times for Chenia. And the thing is, is that's not saying, oh, Chenia is just lucky. He's setting himself up for these spots, but it does feel like his lineup has been a little looser than some of the others. And now he's got one of the most aggressive hands you could imagine coming out of this deck. Oh, multiple copies of one drops as well as sort of, I guess, what has become his signature blooming cultist over the course of the weekend. As you mentioned, stealing so many wins with that elusive keyword. Yeah, 
nice early start from Chenia. We, we talked about, hey, the good players, the world champion caliber players in these Darken lists are always pulling the Forsaken Bakai on one. Generally, though, they're hitting a weapon, and Chenia did miss, but this is, I believe, the Bane Kane. Yes, it is. This is the Bane Kane, which does have a lot less weapons to actually hit. Okay, we didn't find a weapon, but we could hit a combat cook here. Uh, you know, we do have a couple of these cards that need to get turned on by weapons. These call these blooming cultists not having elusive unless one has already been equipped, but it will retroactively gain it. It's not an on summon effect, so you can throw it down on three, still play the cook on four, go in for your elusive swing. Yeah, and this is a very aggressive start from Genia, but missing out on the weapon actually makes it significantly weaker. It won't matter too much in the long run since he is going to need to block down against this Red Gwen. However, not hitting it on one of the cultists doesn't let him block the butler yet and the Buru cultists can't block it either. And it's interesting to see this dynamic, right? Because the hand from Aragorn, not aggressive at all. Two copies of Ravenous Flock, not what you want to be seeing in a matchup like this. We're still top decking Reckoners when it's turn three. There are a lot of great options we should have found here. And actually, Aragorn has the most aggressive Red Gwen deck in the tournament with nine one drops, the Crimson Pigeon and the Legion Rearguard. This is a terrible start for him. Yeah, only finding one of them with the host going alongside this Phantom Butler, potentially looking to just trade down. Aragorn may not need to block here. This is not a very threatening attack, only taking four damage. We'll start to go towards those Minotaurs, but you don't actually want to play the, the Ruined Reckoner because you don't want that Midnight Raid yet. You want to kind of hold that back, save it to get that power. So your turn four is actually looking incredibly soft unless you find a nice top deck. Although what Aragorn can do here is kind of test the waters with the Phantom Butler, and if Chenya doesn't block it, then it's not as bad to develop the Reckoner and just ship it in a second time. Sharp Katarina, though, that will be a little bit nicer. Changes I think going to take that instead and go ahead and play out the Fallen Reckoner after. Gives you a little bit of a better attacking turn. Try and go for that level up. The only concern, I guess, with the Katarina is potentially the crackback, right? You're playing Katarina, you swing in, you recall her, you don't have an answer, and then potentially Chania is able to slam down that combat cook. He also has some answers in hand because he picked up that single combat. No, yeah, no. might be able to just take out this Katarina right here, right now. Of course, the other option. Some of, one of my big concerns for Aragorn's hand state here, you know, kind of getting bailed out by this Katarina top deck is we, we think about what's going to come off the top of the deck for Aragorn. There's a lot of impactful ones, Eternal Dancers, Harrowing, some of the big finishers. There's also eight one drops left in the deck. Yeah, that does reduce the quality of those top decks quite significantly by not finding those early on in the game. And Chenia setting up for the single combat play by going for the Blooming Cultist, holding on, not improvising a weapon just yet. And this is scary. So there's no Mark of the Isle in the list for Aragorn. Not that it not plays too well in the single sword. combat, but you know, with the Blade's Edge in hand, you do have to be cognizant of Vile Feast. There are two copies with only two health units on the side of Chenia. The single combat might look a little risky, but the trigger has to be pulled unless you want this, uh, you know, pivotal champion to start running away with on the game with you, as we've seen it do so many times before. So let's take stock of Chenia's position if he does not use this single combat, right? He's looking against the other board. He does have the two Blooming Colt, this one, but Kai left. It looks like he's sacrificing the Buru, and then he would go into combat. Cook on the following turn. He's worried about some of the bigger bombs coming down. It feels like that position isn't good enough, so it feels like going for this single combat is necessary, and yes, Aragorn has a glimpse to answer it, but overall for Chenya, I think that's kind of what you needed to do. Yeah, and not only that, but this actually works out okay for Chenia, just keeping wider on board, not actually losing the Buru Cultist to this Katarina, while Aragorn finds the Crimson Pigeon, which probably just going to have to be used as a blocker here as Chenia continues to just steamroll this aggression, and Kane likely to come down on the next turn. Yeah, Aragorn going to just try and chop down this board a little bit. It's from five wide, being able to have that Blade's Edge to take down one of the Cultists, try and go a little bit lower, but that does mean that if you go into the next turn, you only have the five mana for the Reckoner and nothing else. So next turn, Chenia plays Kane, right? All of these cards activate. The Blooming Cultists get elusive when you attack. You know, you're going to activate these uh, other Cultists as well. So that's eight damage coming through that is cannot be blocked by Aragorn. That's a one turn clock. Yeah, and Aragorn not having enough answers in this hand to finish the game in time on a one-turn clock. He probably needs two more attack tokens to actually make that happen, and that's he's not going to get that unless he finds a way to answer the board. And Gwen does reduce this clock a little bit, you know, being able to get a little bit of health back for Aragorn on these attacks. And if we can set anything up for a ravenous clock, we could slow down Chenia. But for the time being, Kane gonna come down 
activate all of these units. Now we see the elusives that have been so pivotal in Chenia's success up until this point in the tournament back online. He's in his comfort zone. Yep, here comes the Gwen, gonna push forward that eight damage, keep the cultists back so they can continue to have that pressure each and every turn. Chenia is setting up that two turn clock. As you mentioned, Gwen will be able to buy a little bit of time, but that is assuming that Chenia can't increase that damage. And there's no Ravenous Flock available because Kane killed a unit and was able to pick it up. That Heedless Resurrection top deck from Chenia. No champions in the death pool just yet, so not gonna be able to throw that one down, but if we want to put the Kane's life in danger and, you know, bait a Ravenous Lock out of Aragorn, we do have a Resurrection available. All right, so now it's just a matter of what Aragorn wants to do at this point. We know he needs to heal with this Gwen. He generally is just going to want to slam a Reckoner and be able to start pushing forward damage, but there's so many blockers available. And that's the question, right, is which Reckoner? Because you might have to go for the Ruined Reckoner just to force a second Gwen attack and get a little bit of life back because, you know, you're looking at just the elusive damage. Okay, that's eight exactly. Chenny is five wide. They have other units to attack with, and they could even get down another unit this turn. Yeah, so if Aragorn is not actually wide enough to block, you can come in with the Cultus next time around because they've got those two extra damage on the side as long as Chenia is wider, especially since Chenia still has six mana to develop here into whatever Aragorn is doing. And it, it might be Jeral. It's looking like a pretty appealing option here. It would actually survive a trade with the Gwen, and Eternal Dancer is going to be the play. I believe this will revive Katarina, which could get a Blade's Edge set up for a flock on the following turn. But here comes not Geral, the Darken Aegis. Yeah, Darken Aegis, I'm wondering if this is just going to go on an elusive, make it a little bit beefier into potentially, you know, Blade's Edge plus Vile be something of that nature. Instead, we're going to swap back. We're going to go to the uh, Combat Cook, Combat Reel, and Pot of Pain given as the options. Not even I know what I'm cooking up. He doesn't know what he's cooking up, but it is going to be a pot o pain as we saw in the previous match against Teddy. You know, that tough key we're doing, dividends there. Not so much in this one, but will at least protect it from that Blades Edge setup. And actually, going to get very close to trading with the Eternal Dancers. Yeah, I mean, this is forcing enough damage that Chenia does have to play defensive, right? He does have to apply blocks and that means that there is only this eight damage as threat on the back foot right because kane is not going to be able to push through anybody will have to just challenge one try and get some value and it's still going to be just eight damage and the gwen healing will be enough for now does depend what chenny's draw is based on what our knowledge is and that Blade's Edge top deck so important for oh, Aragorn. Actually, yeah, if we see the block lined up onto the Gwen, you know with information available that your Kane will just go down. And then the Blade's Edge, you know, if it doesn't go onto Kane, could go onto one of these blooming cultists, and that'll really upset Chenia's lethal potential. But things looking like they might finally be swinging back into Aragorn's corner. Yeah, Aragorn's stabilizing a bit here, but still it is eight damage that is being threatened. Yes, he's got the Katarina, so now he can rally and turn the pressure around, not letting Chenia spend too much time. But there are weapons to be equipped that is going to add additional damage. That's 3-1, that's elusive, that's all the damage being able to push forward. Looks like you can take out one other elusive with the Blade's Edge, keep it at eight damage for now. It's a really tough spot here for Aragorn. Yeah, unfortunately. Oh, expense, expense protection, but there's two copies of Ravenous two Flock blocks. in the hand for Aragorn. And just enough non-elusive blockers left for Aragorn as well that the Cultists and the Kane cannot push through any additional damage. Chenia might be thinking that he has it with the Expanse's protection, but it is just not quite enough through the answers Aragorn has. It's going to be so incredibly close, but as long as Aragorn does not misstep here, overplay, tap out of double flock, which is going to be very difficult for him to do, especially since for Chenia it makes more sense to go for an open. You know Katarina's on the back. You don't have time to sit back and develop. You don't have units to really develop here, unless we go for Jeral, which could reduce the ability to do that, but then you just fire off the flocks before the attack. Yeah, it's sort of this awkward line where if you had enough time, you could actually swap the weapons around and sort of full heal your cultist. I don't think it actually works out in this exact instance because a weapon was equipped before the Blade's Edge came out. Maybe if we had gone for waiting for the Blade's Edge to be played and then equipping the weapon, Chenia might have had some different ordering to go through here. But if Chenia doesn't kill this turn, we see the harrowing off the top of the deck for Aragorn. Yeah, the power of Red Gwen coming through. That Gwen draw yeah, being so close. important to find the healing. Do get the rally, but here comes the attack. Right now, threatening 16. 
course, we see those flocks. Expanse Protection will come out to stop one, but now with the Katarina being able to be replayed, the Blade's Edge is even a way to stop the, uh, the Spell Shield. Yeah, a little unfortunate for Chenya here. You know, if you go in with the cane, maybe you can bait Aragorn into putting both flocks on the stack at the same time. Then the Expanse's protection actually does work out. But with the Blade's Edge also available to pop that spell shield, I'm not seeing a lethal here for Chenya. All right, here we are. Aragorn going to be able to turn this around. What looked so favored for Chenya with the slow draw for Aragorn, especially being on this faster version of Red Gwen, running nine one drops, but not bricking into them in the late game, finding the champions, finding the units that he needed to hold on. And though these flocks initially were just clogging up the hand, they're coming in clutch at the end of the game. And this Heedless Resurrection is something that we've seen a lot of players cut from their list, and I have to wonder if it was a different combat trick that was available to Chenia. Is this tech choice now doing the opposite of what we've seen so many do for so many players over the course of this event, and actually being the sort of a detriment here? Yeah, the Spell Shields comes down, but we know that that's going to be pinged away with information that we had from the Katarina hitting the board. So we saw Chenia think about it as, okay, what am I, what am I doing here? Am I actually playing this out? He does play it out but you know that you're likely dying to the Katarina, to the Gwen, especially with the fact that there is an attack token on Aragorn's side, and your defense is not nearly as strong as your offense. Might just end this turn, and actually we don't see the Ravenous Flock to kill the Kane either, you know, playing it very safe, not getting baited into a momentous choice or something along those lines, uh, which actually would have been a huge point here as it would have put it up to four health tough. The spell shield's already on. You would have to use the second flock to spell, pop the spell shield. It wouldn't work out. That's not the case, though. The case is going to be Aragorn looking like they're going to pick up the win. Maybe not on this attack, but certainly on the next one as we are rolling back into Aragorn's attack turn. Yeah, of course, Jenny does still have the units to slow it down, but Aragorn does get the attack token. So it's not the rally attack to finish it, but it is the second strike. And from there, Aragorn left with his clutch deck list, his finisher, his closer. He's had it at the end of every single one of his series. It has been that Zix to Leah. He has brought it out. He has yet to lose with it. And speaking of yet to lose with it, with Chenia going down a game here, if Aragorn does move on to the finals against Teddy, Casa, that's both 3-0 and o players out of groups meeting in the grand finals. Yes, it would be two EMEA players, two 3-0 and o players, two players with a deck that is unique to them and no one else in the event. These two had been playing outstanding, but Aragorn has to finish it off with his signature Zix Talia with the Black Flame. And the deck has looked so impressive. It's hard to imagine that Chenya is going to turn this around in 2-0, a deck that we have been hyping up all weekend ever since we first got to see it play, filling up the stack, the Black Flame combos, and again, just how good Unworthy Soul pairs into these uh, Darken decks. One well, the big thing to talk about for that Zix Talia as it's coming up is the fact that it doesn't feel like it has many brick draws. It doesn't feel like if you're not hitting your main game plan of Talia with the Black Flame, that it matters. It feels like you're able to go for the Rock Bear Shepherd line. You're able to go and use the Ziggs in the early game to get a lot of pressure down. You've got a lot of these units that are working for you in the early game that will buy time to you eventually hit your win condition or you'll win with Swarm and Beatdown. Yeah, the Rock Bear Shepherd, like you mentioned, impressing on the weekend. So incredible when we thought champion strength was going to be the defining card, but no, it might end up being the little rock bear who could. The little rock bear who could. We had one rock get destroyed by Chenia yesterday, but this time we've got a little rock bear trying to chug along and make it to the finals for Aragorn. This hand from Aragorn is more of that swarmy side. You get down those rock hoppers, and then you have a desert naturalist to get a rock bear and kind of create a much bigger, wider board that can actually deal with a lot of what this Vayne Kane wants to do. However, the elusives are a little bit more difficult. And while Chenia looking for a weapon to turn on the Blooming Cultist again finds that sort of dead top deck of the Heedless Resurrection, really looking for that Dark and Aegis, a combat cook, a Vayne, another cultist to tutor the Kane. A lot of options available, but luckily, you know, Chenia is going to be able to have a cane on curve, can throw down the two blooming cultists, might end up losing them if they get vulnerable, but we actually do draw a weapon as well. Yeah, and one of the big things about this rock hopper is generally the elusives of the blooming cultists is very difficult for this deck to deal with outside of things like right of the arcane. But because of the rock hoppers, these are being given vulnerable. So you're not actually going to have as rough a time dealing with them. And Chenia doesn't have too many options. His only two units right now are blooming cultists, and Aragorn is very likely to be playing down these rock hoppers. 
And Aragorn's actually already down to 12 here on turn three. That is more aggressive than you get out of some burn decks. Yeah, and I think it comes down to Fan being a bit aggressive for Chenya at this stage because Aragorn was not able to develop too much, and you don't really want to block those Dragonlings. So that's six damage that is pseudo-unblockable. You have an elusive plus a Dragonling. Here's what I'm looking at, Casanova. Follow me here for a second. Okay. I see a Furious Wielder to defend my elusive. Then I see another elusive and an Expanse's Protection to save it from an Unworthy Soul. There's an opportunity for Chenia to just win this out of nowhere. Find the first game, snap the 100% win rate of this Talia Ziggs deck. And that's been his signature move. We even see Momentous Choice offered up for a little bit of additional damage off of this prediction. We still do have mana for the Furious Wielder. I'm kind of curious how aggressively Chenia wants to play this. How much do you want to play towards this copy does. of Blooming Cultist? I think he does it. He absolutely does it. Here he goes. Here he Beautiful goes. call, Boulevard. He's looking for this lethal as fast as possible. He understands that the longer this deck goes, the more trouble he's in. He understands that his win condition is vulnerable currently with one of his elusives. And there are no blockers for Aragorn if he wants to play Unworthy Soul, which means that this Expanse's protection and this Dragonling is actually going to get through for quite a lot of damage here. I believe nine. Both cultists will be vulnerable, but then we see Aatrox come down. Yep, here we go. This is already nine damage being presented by Chenia on this attack if Aragorn does not have blockers. And the only blocker that you can send is blocking a Dragonling. You're not actually dealing with the threats and Ziggs is just going to be the slam. Yeah, Aragorn Flint, you know, sort of respecting the Expanse's protection, but more than that, I think, saying, I need the vulnerable to stay on these elusives. I cannot afford to just keep resetting these and letting Chenia replay them and beating down my Nexus down to five now is Aragorn but he's got a really strong Talia turn coming up. Yes, he has to deal with these elusives now, though, because Chenia can easily sneak five damage by with them. But without them, Chenia does struggle to find that last little bit of damage. He can get overwhelmed with the Kane. He can get overwhelmed Everybody? with the, or sorry, with the Varus, and he can with the Aatrox. These decks are very similar, but the, it is the Aatrox Varus we are looking at. But we do have to still look and see if Aragorn can put Chenia in a position where he has to find the overwhelm. And it's looking like a pretty cut and dry turn for Chenia. You either run out your other cultist or you play Aatrox. Get that online and start pushing some more pressure onto Aragorn, though, without elusives to run it through. This board is going to be very wide for Aragorn by the time the attack token comes back around to Chenia. A couple of champions, a couple of fearsome five threes. It is going to be the Aatrox coming down. I don't know if we can actually stall out until turn nine to play Pra the Breachwalker, the Darken that comes out of the fan. Yeah, the Breachwalker would be big. We've seen it win multiple games for Chenia, but at least Aragorn is able to wipe up these elusives for now. That 5 HP might just be enough to chug along. It really comes down to this Aatrox, to even potentially a World Ender needing to be played. And it's so awkward, right? Because if the World Ender is played, that will be all of the mana for Chenia on the following turn, and the Unworthy Soul could just bounce the Aatrox right back to the hand. Without the cost reduction, we might not be able to get it done. I'm starting to get a little bit worried here for Chenia because that Heedless Resurrection would look so good into a Vengeance, but that's not what we're dealing with. And finally, the Expanse's Protection. We were wondering how this was going to get used. It will actually protect a Cultist from the Ziggs to get a combat trade. Yeah, just going to be able to take the Ziggs down, slow down the return aggression from Aragorn, but that Talia is still there. The crux of this deck list, and we're having both of those landmarks pop into 5-3 Fearsomes. A massive board has just sprung up out of nowhere, and that is what this deck can do so well. And Aragorn thinking, how do I want to block this? I'm curious to see if he's actually going to finish off the Aatrox, and maybe we finally get to see some value out of this Heedless Resurrection, but Chenia probably really hoping for a third cultist top deck just another final hour bailout from his elusives that have been so pivotal throughout the world championship yep keeper of the box gonna come down for now the fan will be able to equip to that get more life steal for chenia trying to just keep him topped off but aragorn is going to be able to set up and try and look for a kill in a single turn that is what this deck has been able to do so 20 might not matter we will finally see that heedless resurrection potentially see play and I think Chenia, you know, not very far off of tutoring another copy of Aatrox. He is on the full three. So 
you know, getting access to that Aatrox spell, once you resurrect the first one, it's going to be pivotal for dealing with this Talia. Aragorn doesn't look like they have lethal now or anytime soon. It's really that unworthy soul tech coming in so big, stopping all of these big, beefy, expensive units. Yep, Heedless Resurrection comes out. Aatrox is back. We get the Varus. Another Keeper. So there's Another Cultus unworthy soul. Did not want... You did want to find the elusive one. You weren't really looking for another lifesteal. Yeah, this is not the matchup you were looking for this in. Maybe against the Red Gwen a little bit earlier. Could have played out a little bit better, but it's too little, too late. And now you can't even block the Talia with the Aatrox. Would just lose that champion. We've got World Ender mana for what it's worth, but again, this Unworthy Soul just reset the Aatrox, play it next turn, reset the Aatrox again, and then Aragorn into a clear board would just have the win. Yeah, especially since you're getting to push 8 damage here. We talked about having multiple lifesteal cultists, but realistically, they're not even pushing you back up to 20 after that. And 20, again, not safe against this deck. And it almost doesn't feel worth it to block with this cultist, right? You could It, it only prevents 4 of the damage. You can just swing back in, get another 2, or block something else with it and get another 2 on a future turn. And this is where I become critical of the Varus. We are not leveling this Varus now or really anytime soon. We just don't have the mana to sort of get down the weapons. We would need a double up spell like the Momentous Choice. It was realistically our only criticism of Chenia in this tournament because his play has been pretty immaculate. Is the choice to put Varus with Aatrox instead of Vayne and taking Varus into a deck with Pantheon or taking Varus into a deck with Akshan where we've seen such success with that Varus. Trying to split up both the Aatrox and the Vayne to get two decks with these two powerful champions. Maybe costing Genia here, but costing you in the semi-final? You're not too far, you're right? not gonna be too upset about that. You have made it quite far, and we are gonna see the World Ender cast Aatrox leveling up, going into the attack turn of Chenia. Aragorn here gonna fire off that unworthy soul. The tech card decision. Wanting to have very few Ionia cards, but the two that were picked, the Black Flame, Unworthy Soul. Both times, both of these cards being the reason this deck is so good instead of a tier 3 list like we thought. And now though, Chenia picking up a second copy of Aatrox, if you throw down this Aatrox, then Aragorn really has to Unworthy Soul immediately so that you cannot take advantage of the cost reduction. You know, you would throw down a Varus for free, you might even have the mana left to play Pra, but the Aatrox spell in response could kill the Talia. And if you kill the Talia, there still is quite a large attack from Aragorn, but it's not lethal. You're not dead, and you can look for a redevelop. It might actually be lethal with Black Flame and Desert Naturalist that will get you another Rock Bear. You'll have enough mana. It would be a Rock Bear. And yeah, the immediate Unworthy Soul not letting Chenia get down that Varus that Aragorn knows is in hand, right? It was tutored up a little bit earlier, and now the question is, do you throw out this Aatrox spell? Do. And you do, you kill the Talia. But now Black Flame into Desert Naturalist. You've healed up to 14 with the Aatrox already. You have Lifesteal on board. You're effectively 16. I think it's safe. You're, it's close. It is close. I haven't mathed it out. It, and if, if Chenia lives, Aatrox comes down. There's no answer. No answer from Aragorn left. It depends on the top deck. There are still quite a few things that you could top deck from Aragorn. I mean, we talk about the Absolver. It's only a one of in this list. It's not the all-in sort of Zigstalia that we're used to in the past. Maybe another champion. And yeah, here we see the Rock Bear come out, the uncapture happening, restoring the Devout. And enough. like you had mentioned, yeah, it is going to be enough. just shy. It is a big board, but it is not 14 big. Actually, these Keepers of the Box being able to do enough to hang on, just a little bit of HP was necessary. Yes, an Elusive would have ended the game, but at the very least, these have kept it alive for the Aatrox to potentially come back down. Absolver, you saw that coming up on the screen, looking yeah. for that buff. And this is what we big. were talking about. 13 damage lined up before you put the biggest attacker at the end. Uh, not able to get a second Sarcophagus down. So Leah gonna come down. Does this change the math? Aatrox gets to come down in response, and that really gets just more healing back into Chenia. Does Talia outpace that healing? Being able to get the healing, it is a lot of damage from Talia. It will prevent some healing as well, because you do have to put 
Aatrox I believe blocks. if the Keeper blocks the Talia and then Aatrox blocks a five attack unit, I think it's less damage than was originally presented, but I can see you doing the math there, Casanova. I don't, I don't want to. Yet. Or we could just see Pra the Breachwalker. Getting three blockers We've out We've seen it Prah. bail Chenia out before. We saw it almost come up in previous matchups in Aragorn. You know, just coming in now with just the Talia, an ephemeral unit going to be thrown in front of it, but Pra the Breachwalker, an elusive unit, Casanova. There is a quicksand in the deck for Aragorn, but there's it no reason for Chenya not to develop. It has to be quicksand for Aragorn to even survive it. Just the elusive. And it's a Talia. Aatrox comes down. Now we're going to see more and more copies come down. And the first time that Aragorn's Ziggs Talia loses, Chenia picking it back up. We've mentioned it on the desk. The fan. It has won so many games for Chenia here at the World Championship. It is a tech that only he brought. The only one to bring this weapon. Not only did we see it create early pressure with the Dragonlings, because you don't want to block them. If you do, you're losing board. It keeps him topped off. And then at the end of the day, the Beach Walker once again coming out, stopping a wide board from attacking in. And then this time, even the elusive setting up to get the lethal. There are so few Ionia cards in this tournament, Casanova, but they have been some of the most pivotal. You can't keep the pink region down. You really can't. We thought we got rid of it, but it keeps coming back this time. Yeah, it's not the main threat but its supporting characters are definitely winning best supporting actor at this competition. And now we have to ask the question, Chenya picked up a win with the Varus Aatrox, but the Vayne Kane, one that has failed to go tall enough in a lot of more mid-range matchups. Can you do the impossible twice? Can you 2-0 Aragorn's previously undefeated Ziggs Talia Black Flame? His closer, this deck, who was unstoppable in the group stages, unstoppable during the quarterfinals, but here in the semifinals, Chenia has done it, and now he has to do it once more. Bane Kane has its weaknesses, but he already has Kane, so the weapon will come out on turn five. And this is a rather good hand from Aragorn as well. We have one of our pivotal champions. We have a desert naturalist to combo with this devout, as well as the rock bear, but almost more importantly, right of negation for protection, absolver for game ending potential. All right, so things have slowed down in the early game. Couple of low drops from Chenia out on the board already. A pair of two twos. On the other side, Aragorn has an absolver. He's got the Rock Bear Shepherd to try and start amping things up. Get a bigger wide board to try and help protect against the early onslaught from Vayne Kane. Aragorn just needs a little bit of setup time, but having seven mana at his disposal, he should be able to get there. Chenia, the threat happens once he gets Kane, but it is still a little slow. And it depends on how aggressively Chenya wants to play this because the tempo can swing significantly once that Endless Devout dies and that sort of big swing with the Desert Naturalist turn is available. Chenya actually looks like they just want to go in for the attack, going to pull it back. I really don't think he likes the idea of taking the pass here, but it might be the correct play. He may need to, and it looks like he does just take it for now. Aragorn does have the option to consider. It's not really any spell that you would like to play at this stage, so he's thinking more about his next turn before he passes this back. So much restraint shown by Chenya there. I saw how much he wanted to just ship that attack, but pulling it back, and now Aragorn. Not a very clean turn five. No, it's not perfect, but Unraveled Earth is a good start, right? You've got Desert Naturalist that can turn one of these into a Rock Bear, but ideally you want to use that with the Devout once it goes down. Get the big swing, get the 5-5 five, five Rock Bear, the 5-3 three fearsome online at the same time so this does just turn on things like right up the arcane and it's also helping your zigs and now chenny actually drawing a one drop could bait out one of these roiling sands get aragorn to develop further but says hey I, i'm just fine throwing the cane out there we do have the catch in hand for a little bit of protection but now the desert natural is going to come out the rock bear coming out and actually another roiling sands off the board does mean chenia is free to play his units without fear of vulnerable yeah not gonna save up for the greedier turn of trying to get that sarcophagus out instead just gonna go for the double rock bear create the pressure now go for the kill on kane catch is there but still this is a favorable trade for aragorn this is the pressure that this rock bear shepherd has been creating throughout the weekend the reason we said this may be the best performing card for this expansion which still Every time I say it, it sounds crazier and crazier. Yeah, just not what we expected at all. And now the catch committed onto the cane. 
but no great target. We might end up being stuck in a position where the Kane spell is what Chenia tries to use in order to level up this champion, get the vulnerable off of it, heal it back to full. The right of negation available for Aragorn could mean that two Kane go out in the meantime in an unworthy soul in the predictability. Yeah, going to give you the option to deal with some of the bigger threats and also try and stop things like Tumble, stop things like Condemn from coming through. This is going to be Aragorn with all the pressure, all Repost. cards on his side. Not a bad pickup if Chenia doesn't try to send in this cane this turn. Ambitious Cultist with Retreat. Not a bad pickup, especially considering you could get that Vayne back to hand. Yeah, being able to get her back, send her back in as well, being a three cost. It's a very powerful way to save this vein, get her healed back up. And Aragorn, a lot of the economy committed to the board already. Once those rock bears go away, get traded down, then what Aragorn has left is not looking as impactful. But still a bit of card draw to go through. We've got the Preservarium and Chenia going to be looking on how can I get this rock bear shepherd off the field? I cannot let this thing stick around and accelerate what was otherwise a rather slow and predictable deck. All right, Aragorn having all the pressure right now. Look Big board, Shenia starting to Full try and build fear. towards, rivaling it, but Aragorn with the Talia, not quite drawn, but having the Ziggs in the back. We have to watch out for that Absolver as well if Aragorn's able to push damage, but right of the Arcane. Right of the Arcane Come onto Retreat, retreat return. return. One Mana Vein back online, no Vulnerable onto it, and Tumble gonna go down to one Mana once this unit is recommitted, which Shenia, if they want to pass it here, could just cut, bring it in at burst speed, but does have the attack token. Pretty likely to just take that uh, mana cheat. Yeah, the mana efficiency of this going to go for the Buru as well. Having the tumble, having the attack token. And do you just send this cane into one of the rock bears? Or the answer apparently going to be no. Maybe saving up the concerted strike or that repost that we mentioned a little bit earlier. Nine mana enough for two combat tricks. Leveled up six right when he comes down. A lot of restraint from Chenia. He needs to try and find the best way to win this board. Right now, a lot of the trades are even. I don't think Chenia feels confident in rebuilding a board after this. He needs positive trades to be going into Aragorn. He needs to find value because he will get outvalued slowly by this list. Oh, and we've got a potential for a big punish here. Chenia casting the cane spell onto the Rock Bear. Aragorn could commit the first half of an Absolver and still have Rite of Negation mana. So if Chenia commits, say, a Repost into this, then, you know, you can just write the cane spell. Now you've got a vulnerable cane ready to get taken out by a Ziggs. All right, but it looks like just the right going to come flat out, wanting to hold on to that resource of the Absolver. It's a great way to find the finisher, especially because there are a lot of these beefier units that are on the board for Chenia right now. And this could be a concerted strike from Chenia in response. Not going to be the case. Wait until attackers are committed so that that Ziggs not going to be able to take out the cane in this instance because Absolver could have saved Ziggs from everything. But now a lot of the board coming in and getting traded down for Aragorn, it looks like. This is dark and power. Here's the play through. A lot of power from Aragorn pushing 10 currently with the way the blocks are set by Chenia. And hanging back that Cultist, not trading it into the 5-2. Concerted, this is committed. So valuing that extra point of damage that can come through from this Cultist, not wanting to change it into the 5-2, losing out 5 HP, this is losing 8, this is going down to 8 HP, getting the Concerted on the Ziggs, Kane gonna level, and is still there to try and provide threat. Can Ross do enough? I don't know, Casanova. This is a tight situation. Aragorn has a second Ziggs and an Absolver in hand, and Chenia took a lot more damage than he may have needed to in this situation. But we see the cane in hand. We see another elusive in hand, that blooming cultist hanging around, and a zero mana tumble from Chenia. We Shadow Assassin! Alan said it in the last one. He wanted to have... He made a $10 bet with Skarzik and didn't get it. But this time around, Chenia seeing the line, there is no not a lot of ways for this deck to deal with elusive we talked about the rock hoppers helping out in the previous matchup 
This time around, that cane unfazed the tumbles in hand as well. There is a lot of power coming through, and this might be the way that Chenia takes down Aragorn. Not playing the Blooming Cultist first, not presenting lethal. We see the Unworthy Soul in the hand of Aragorn, so unlikely to die on this turn, but how big is the swing back? Do you need to save this Unworthy Soul for the Absolver play to actually have a shot at lethal? All I know is I asked you if Rost was enough, and Chenia says no it isn't, but Shadow Assassin might be. Yeah, Chenia going full send on this one. Not enough mana for the cheeky repost and tumble that we might have seen earlier in the day. And Cass, I think it might come down to this single combat. Are you going to have a unit large enough to stop the Zix from cracking back on the lethal? We are down into the last few turns of the semifinals, no matter which way you slice it. The repost to combo up with that single combat might be the key to victory. Yet another tech card that not a lot of players brought, and Chenia may be finding a victory with that. The one-ofs have been lethal throughout the entire event. So many one-ofs stealing so many games, and a rather weak prediction from Aragorn, not able to find a Talia to maybe secure the victory on the following turn. Now we get the full send, not even a half send, just going all the way with it, looking to trade down a little bit of Aragorn's board. Trade down the board, make your 8 HP last a little bit longer, threatening 12. We're going to, of course, see that unworthy soul bring back the cane. It's going to buy a little bit of time for Aragorn, but I don't know if he can find the victory, especially considering that repost plus single combat. Yeah, he's going to have the Rost or the Darken whatever its name is, the Shadow Assassin, <laughs> back available. The problem is, with Unworthy Soul killing the weapon, it's going to reset the attack. It's true, slows it down quite a bit, but we still have the Blooming Cultist on the board as well. That's an additional three damage, so when Kane comes down, I haven't counted that out, but I think we're still pushing over six with those two. And it depends. Does Aragorn want to play the Preservarium? Do you think that you actually have the win with the Ziggs and the Absolver? Because if Aragorn waits until next turn to play the Ziggs, Chenia can attack it with the Shadow Assassin, and the Repost will guarantee a kill onto that champion. Single combat already being committed to keep the vein alive losing this is a defensive measure this might yeah. open the door for aragorn this might be the first time we see a slight slip here from chenia trying to keep the vein yeah we don't have mana to replay our darken but yes yeah, six attack not enough to kill the zigs tumble nothing to follow it up saying Aragorn you have to win on the open attack and at the moment Aragorn is presenting lethal on the open attack there's top deck options here for Chenya one HP is all he needs but an unworthy soul is going to make an issue out of it heedless resurrection quicksand quick off sand. the top even and Aragorn lightning does not strike twice and once the absolver is committed I do not think Chenya has an answer for this the whole time Chenya has played around so many cards he's played around so many different outcomes in his matches he has won despite feeling unfavored in some of these deck matchups, but here he uses the single combat preemptively, not saving it for the defense, and it opens the door, it opens a window for the bomb to fly through. Here comes Ziggs. The repost does not give you more HP against an overwhelm. And you talked about the cheeky one of this is a single absolver coming out of Aragorn. We saw it very early on in the hand. We were questioning whether or not this was going to come up later on and Chenia not understanding the situation not respecting the one of is going to move down to the lower bracket and we have an all EMEA finals between two undefeated competitors and while Malphite didn't make it through Talia Ziggs we still are getting a Talia in the grand finals coming from Aragorn from Greece playing the Black Flame a deck that no one else was playing we all thought might have been a joke but Aragorn has taken it all the way to the final, only dropping a single game with the list. Casanova, this is going to be an insane final matchup now that we have our two finalists. Aragorn, not one of the favorites coming into this tournament, certainly underestimated the deck choices we were questionable about. Teddy, on the other hand, coming in, very pedigreed player, very seasoned competitor with decks that we looked at and said, yeah, nice, I can get behind this. It is going to be a good one. It is going to be insane. We have the veteran, the champ, who has won EU Masters. He has won a seasonal. He is here for Worlds versus Aragorn. 
Aragorn, the up-and-comer, on this miraculous run through the tournament with Talia Ziggs. I got to hear what the analyst desk has to say about that match. Thank you so much, Boulevard and Casanova. It, we now know our second grand finalist that will be moving forward. And like, I, I hate to give it to Alan. I All right, before, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. before we talk about uh, that we bring the trophy back to home, I wanted to talk about the fact that Trenia had guaranteed lethal in game one. He just didn't spot it. So the turn where he had a block uh, on Kane on the Katarina, if he blocked Gwen, so um, Aragorn would be in a choice. Either daggers the Kane to kill it. If he doesn't dagger Kane, he levels up. He can play elusive Kane and have a guaranteed lethal next turn. If he and then he doesn't get the dagger on the elusive unit. On the other hand, he allowed Kata, uh, he blocked Katarina, which doesn't matter. matter. In the in Chenya's mind, he didn't want to lose uh, the cane uh, to that dagger, but he didn't think that he, uh, he'll just uh, the Aragorn will just dagger instead and set up flock on his elusive. Otherwise, all he had to do is just block Gwen, put the weapon to one uh, tough on the elusive from the combat cook, and he had guaranteed little. There was no cards in Aragorn's deck that could have stopped that little. Well. I mean, I did <laughs> call it that Chenia did have that X factor to find a winning situation. It was given to him, unfortunately, just didn't take that extra time to analyze a few turns deeper and execute on that. Still a fantastic showing, a player that really surprised me throughout this entire broadcast. Every time we thought the lineup would be down and out, he was still pulling together these really uh, just powerful situations, right? The constant threat of the Blooming Cultist, that was certainly his MVP. Um, it's been cool to see how, like, the Blooming Cultist has really played a role. Elusive just across the board have been incredibly impactful in a lot of these series. And Chenya also did the impossible, it feels like. Actually got a win against that Ziggs Talia deck from Aragorn. How did Chenya make that happen? I mean, he drew pretty well, and yeah, it just uh, came down to that uh, Aragorn couldn't close the game. Sometimes yeah. it does come down to the pacing of that. Silver, what did you think of that match overall? I mean, I was a little sad to see the Ionia Talia lose, but it gave me a lot of hope for Chinia. I know that he loves those mid range lists, and his favorite was Vane Kane. So I had a lot of hope for him going into that final game. I thought he had a really good shot. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite able to make it. I think the tunnel vision kind of kicked in, right? The Blooming Cultist was pulling so much work that you had the elusives going, and when you play a style like that, that's just trying to race down and end the game, you run out of your options to respond to your opponent's game plan. And if he were, of course, if he were to play another set, Chenya maybe might be able to take it because it was incredibly close. We were worried that these darkened lists would be too clunky. It still was a pleasure to see that game come down to the wire. Can I just uh, slide in a quick, uh, I told you so, about the result? <laughs> I mean, I don't remember anything. I'm pretty sure I was backing the Black Flame all along. <laughs> well, listen, <laughs> told you. Uh, EMEA finals, top three, uh, APAC. Yeah, I mean, we, we still have two more matches ahead. We know our players that will be battling it out in that third place match. We've got Reroll and Chenia fighting for that bronze medal. But in the grand finals, it will be Teddy versus Aragorn. And it's all coming up after this.
everyone, my name is Boulevard and welcome back to the 2022 Legends of Runeterra World Championship. Me and Casanova had to watch Korea get eliminated from the upper bracket, but now Alan is going to be joining me to cast a Korea victory. Yeah, uh, I think uh, you'll be very happy after the outcome of this game. So there's one thing I want to ask you about, Alan. So Reroll and Chenia are two players playing in this third and fourth place decider match. Over the last couple of weeks, Chenia has had Reroll's number. Knocked him out of the upper bracket in the qualifiers. A couple of weeks later, played in another tournament, beat him in the finals. When we look at the deck list here, turning off the nameplates, who are you feeling more favored for? So considering the, the bans, I f ah, it's really t uh, tough to call because reroll bans it seems pretty obvious. Like if you want to ban Lolo Jinx, it has too big of a high roll potential, and it takes out uh, all your uh, units early if you get Lulu. So it's probably the ban. The, uh, the question is, what strategy will uh, Chenya take? Because again. If he started respected more Red Gwen, we might see the ban on it. If not, then it's most likely going to be Action Civil ban. Yeah, and we haven't seen Chenya get to play this Lulu Jinx pretty much all weekend. You know, elusives have kind of been his bread and butter. So players wanting to keep that Poro Cannon deck a little contained as it is one of the scarier elusive decks that we've seen. But it's also played very well within these Dark. And, and you know, if we take the Lulu Jinx and the Red Gwen off the table, we kind of have some pseudo mirror matches here. A lot of Dark decks coming out of these players. A lot of, you know, unforgiving cold and combat tricks, repost and all these kinds of different things. It's really annoying to attack into an unforgiving cult. Like, opponent pass with four mana, and okay, wh what am I doing? It's funny though, because, you know, Chenny actually not very big on Unforgiving Cold, only two copies in the Varus Aatrox and only one available in the Vein Kane. How did you feel about that meta call coming into this? Because there have been some matchups where it's not so great. I mean, you, it's bad card only pretty much into Seraphine and some very aggressive decks. So if he was expecting super fast meta, I could see that. But if he's expecting like the stuff we see, literally, Action Varus, Vein Aatrox, just a tall stuff, it's an exceptional card. It pushes your, uh, gives you an edge over this matchup because every single copy matters. Even if you draw three off in those matchups, once we establish board, you want to have all of them. And we're taking a look here at uh, Rerolls Red Gwen. Unfortunately, didn't see the Elise play out earlier. We did see the Iron Ballista go uh, to the moon, basically, and the Mark <laughs> of the Isle and the main not quite coming up yet. No Pigeon, but at least, you know, we have a believer here. We've got the three redeemed Prodigy. After witnessing all the games across uh, this weekend, I'm looking like Katarina, like the Katarina recall, and players uh, learned how to expose her weakness, meaning that she kills your tempo. If you don't have a strong enough board and you recall, like you spend three mana and you pretty much uh, lose that three mana for nothing, and then if you leak additional one or two points of mana, then players can expose that weakness very well, where they just end up killing the Cat Gwen before they even play their Katarina for the second time. Yeah, you know, we saw Red Gwen do very well day one, not so much day two. Even worse here in day three is we get more players that are prepared for the matchup, like Chenia might be with this Kane deck. We've been a little critical of it not going tall enough to deal with other mid-range decks, but Red Gwen keeping the health totals pretty low to the ground. Yeah, exactly. I, I think, like, the more I think, the the more I believe that Reroll might, uh, sorry, not Reroll, Chenya might actually ban Vayne Aatrox, expecting Lulu Jinx ban, and he might try to take it down with the, his uh, Dark Index. Yeah, we've got the bans here. It is going to be Lulu Jinx banned out from Chenya, and it is going to be the Vayne Aatrox banned out from yeah, Reroll. Exactly. So we've got Sivarok, Sean Varus, Red Gwen up against the only decks Chenya has been allowed to play this tournament, the Varus, Aatrox, and the Vayne King. Yeah, I'm excited to, to see how the Red Gwen will perform into those Darkins decks. Because, again, Red Gwen, historically, very good into Pantheon decks, because they go tall. You, If you get your Reconner, they don't kill you fast enough, and your Reconner takes out the units. But against those Darkin decks, your weapons uh, and uh, allows you to apply so much pressure into Red Gwen and gives you favorite traits that uh, the deck is just too slow sometimes. Red Gwen being too slow, that's crazy. It might need an extra extra help in early game. Yeah, and as you mentioned, you know, in the previous match when Chenya played against Aragorn, he actually had lethal in that game against Red Gwen. So, you know, knew the matchup pretty well, maybe it's not very well hard to spot because yeah. it's about baiting, like it's about because once you realize on your next attack that you have guaranteed lethal, if unless opponent plays flock on one of your elusives. So the way you do this, you just threaten and getting an extra elusive. If opponent doesn't kill your uh, cane, he cannot kill your elusives. So 
just a little misstep, but I'm pretty sure we'll see a flawless gameplay coming from the, this match. Yeah, these players, you know, they, they knocked out of the top four, not going to make it to the grand finals, but you do still have a game to play. You really can't let your mental get affected by it. It looks like we are just shy of getting into the game here. And honestly, I'm pretty happy not to see another Aatrox mirror. I could do without that for the remainder of the day, if I'm being <laughs> honest. I mean, he's pretty powerful and dark. All right, so we've got the opening hands up here for the players. This is pre-Mulligan, so some early drops might still be found. We see Chenia toss back half the hand, find the Forsaken Bakai to match the one that Reroll has in the opener, but no weapons available for Reroll. Just a few cards that activate once they're down. We see the one of Sevier. I'm curious if he's gonna choose to replace that or he's gonna keep that one of Sevier because it's a very strong card in combination with the weapons, but again, a reroll does play only four of weapon in that deck, so it's unlikely he's gonna find one. And on top of that, he's playing Ambitious Cultist. So he's more likely looking to get that Varus on top of that, because with Var in combination with Varus, that's six of weapon. And we actually do see the Sivir kept there, and I did want to ask about this Swinging Glaive. We don't see it in too many different decks. We've seen it in some of the Varus Sivir auctions that we've seen before, and I think you were pretty big on this deck, you know, highlighting it in Grandpa Roji's lineup, calling it a deck that was favored into the rest of the tournament. You know, does the Swinging Glaive play into that? Do you feel good about that weapon choice? It was good into the slower meta. Into this meta, I think, like, it. once you high roll, once you have a good opener where you are, in, if you play three mana weapon, you don't get punished, it's pretty good. And also, if you had a read, there won't be much heavy metal, like, for example, from TFN, which played three of even. Uh, that's a good call. And actually, speaking of the Swinging Glaive, we do see it off the prediction here for Reroll. Gonna have that weapon available with the Sivir, which honestly, for how few Sivir and how few Swinging Glaive we're playing, this is a very powerful, potent combination of cards, but Chenia has his signature Blooming Cultist. But you have to plan uh, how to play uh, the following runs, because there is no action. Uh, like, no action too makes the deck infinitely worse. I think that's why we haven't been seeing the more traditional, like, Sivir Akshan Damasi. And actually, Reroll did keep three cards in the opening hand, so not aggressively mulliganing for that Akshan. Do you think that might have been a mistake here? I didn't have enough practice on this deck, but feels like this is like the Damasia matchup, and you need to go tall. The way you to go tall is betting, getting early action, getting the World Sword going, and potentially getting plus two, plus two spell shield on all of your champions. All right, instead it looks like Chenia gonna be able to take over the early game here in the lack of Akshan's presence, getting that Dark and Aegis down, following it up with a Blooming Cultist on the following turns. And unfortunately, Kane drawn here for Chenia. You hate to see when the champions that you can tutor sort of naturally find their way into your hand and, and brick one of your draws. I mean, as long as it's like not one off, it's, it's fine. Like, uh, Kane's spell is pretty good because it allows him to just flip even when he's like 1 HP, but granted the quick attack. Similar as Katarina. It bounces him back, and the great uh, upside of the Kane is he comes back and costs zero, unlike Katarina, where she even gets plus one to the cost. We get our first bit of action here. Momentous choice used to protect the Bakai with the swinging glaive. We're actually about to get into the Sivir turn, which Chenia doesn't have a great answer for. Yes, the Blooming Cultist has been doing very good on the day, but it's it's not gonna outrace a Glaived Bakai and a Sivir. So if this is a very key moment, deciding between the plus two and Challenger. If uh, Riro realizes that on the pretty much one of his lose conditions is elusive, getting Challenger might be the key play. Actually goes for the attack buff instead, saying, I'm gonna summon this Sivir. I'm gonna, you know, my one drop is so large here. I know you don't want to block this, but you're probably going to have to. And it's actually just gonna be the open attack for another lucky find. She might have done the math on the Sivir level up. That's why he decided to go plus two. If the Sivir level up uh, is a condition he's considering into, then uh, plus two might be stronger. Yeah, actually, not only that, but this Bakai has now been taken outside the range of Kane. You know, this is just a 2-5, and the fact that it can't tell, kill a 1-drop, borderline comical at this point, but another lucky find. It looks like this one went on to Sivir, grabbing a tough keyword. Not super synergistic with Sivir. You know, you've already got the quick attack. Your units are safe in combat when you spread it around. He went more defensively, so, like, he expects Kane. He knows that Kane was too torn last turn, so he wants to protect that uh, Sivir from dying to you, too true from trading with the Kane. And we're not really looking at a great hand to deal with this Sivir now that the tough is upon her. 
Uh, you know, no attack buffs for the Kane. The spell shield's still going to prevent the Concerted Strike, the Kane spell, the Cataclysm. There's really no way through it, and the Blooming Cultist has pulled out some miracles before, but it is definitely not large enough to outrace the threats that Reroll has already presented. So I thought it might be Jural to try to get down the uh, Sivir, but no, Chenya still wants to race this one. This is a very interesting play. Considering that he's behind on the board, he's staring at uh, 11 power on the enemy's board, he chooses to, to go with the cultist. Swinging Glaive now equipped, and that is a very large Sivir, a very large cultist. Chenia, your cane does not look good here, which is why we've been so critical of the champion. I know the Vayne Kane is one of his favorite decks, but in situations like this, which have been more common situations here in the World Championship, it hasn't looked great, but he has been managing to pull it out every time. He's time on? Oh, I don't think you're going to be playing that. All your units are pretty premium. And yeah, he just took a blocker. He, this is just four mana, blo block a unit. Yeah, unfor you know, we've seen some randomly generated cards really swing the way that these games play out, but I think you're right. Concurrent timelines, not great when you only play one through four drops, and they are well statted for what they do. You'd almost be downgrading in every scenario. Yeah, but in this spot, when you have one uh, ambitious cultist in the hand and the timelines, you might be tempted to look for something like another elusive to try to find that uh, win. So something that I think might come up here, and this is actually really interesting to me, Chenia needs to deal with the Sivir. Has the Cataclysm, has the Concerted Strike, can't really sequence them onto the stack together, but you are playing against a deck that plays not just right of Negation, but the Expanse's protection as well. When you're going to pop Spell Shields, are you throwing everything on the stack at once, or are you spacing it out? I think your game plan is to just ignore uh, Sivir, jump block her, deal with the rest of the stuff on the board. As long as Sivir is not uh, finishing you off, and if There's we the look... overwhelm on the lucky find. Well, then that's a problem. <laughs> Nightmare scenario for Chenia. And we see only two copies of Absolver in the action Sivir. Usually you go to three to have that maximum amount of the threats, so Sivir cannot be just jump blocked over and over. Uh, I guess the Swinging Glaive, you know, just expecting that this card is going to stick around for a while. I can probably find the Overwhelm. I don't need the dead draws here in the Absolver. And while well, I've been talking about Chenya having Reroll's number for the last couple of events, none will be more important than this third, fourth place decider for Reroll to finally get the revenge. This is a very rough spot for Chenya. There is not many lines he can take that are winning for him. We are looking for some... Ooh! Okay, this, so I've been calling the Unforgiving Cold, Caught in the Cold, pretty much since it got released. I'm 90% sure this is actually Caught in the Cold. Yes, it has Caught in the Cold, but... Oh, and he actually could target for it. It's going for Plate on the Varus. Ah, but are you... Do you play it on the Varus, or do you pop the Spell Shield on the Sivir? It is zero mana, will Frostbite the unit and give it vulnerable if it resolves. The Expanse's protection available for reroll. I mean, you can threaten killing Varus with the uh, Kade spell as well, Cataclysm, Concerted, so I think you just go for the Kade. Uh, sorry, for the Varus. And it looks like that is going to be the option. Not quite enough power on board to kill it with any of your units. You've already equipped this Cultist. No way to get its attack up with another weapon. It's actually going to be a bit of a pushback here from the Varus as the momentous choice, getting this up to five attack, actually going to be a six attack. It just keeps going up, <laughs> going to trade back onto the cane, and Chenia not oh, no. happy about it's this. It's going to be a concerted, isn't it? Oh, that's going to be devastating. Expanse protection. Yeah, the Expanse is protection going to protect this Varus, and I'm pretty sure there is nothing Chenny is going to have left to deal with this giant Sivir open attack, spreading Overwhelm to the other units. And we even see the level up. This flipped Sivir on top. There is just nothing that we could, that Kenya can do. The only possible out, Unforgiven Cold, that pops the Spell Shield, unless he can make... Chenia playing the timelines, <laughs> understanding that the game is over, throwing up the Nocturne emote, and just a surrender, understanding that even with the Unforgiving Cult, the Varus probably too powerful. And actually, this is, yeah, this is Vane Kane, only one copy of that Unforgiving Cult in this list. Before we jump into the, another game, so what he should, like, going in the next turn, what Rero should be, should be doing to play around Unforgiving Cult, he should be bumping the Varus with the, the Varus spell, with the chain. So the Unforgiving Cult targets him, and since the spell sheet from the Severe is Aura, uh, 
it stays permanent, so Unforgiving Cold would have no effect as long as Sivir has lower damage than any of the other units on the board. Yeah, I think that's something that we've talked about, mentioned a couple times on the caster desk, haven't seen it come up in practicality yet, and Chenia denying us a chance for that, but we are right back in to game number two. Chenia still on the Vein Cane, this time has to get the revenge kill on Red Gwen. Ooh, this is very exciting. Like the Red Gwen matchups into all those Darkins, we have been going back and forth. Very excited to see how those players will approach it. We have insane opener. It's a host into the Redeem Prodigy, into another host into Gwen. This is a very, very good spot for Reroll. And Shenia, I mean, I feel like Keeper of the Box, this might be one of the matchups that you brought it for to get that lifesteal down and be able to survive. But it was actually a Darken that was, I think it was a Kane prediction, the way this Bakai yeah, got the plus one, plus one. The problem is you have no development next turn if you predict Kane here. Like, Chenya might not have fought this through yeah, for the going, next turn. And now even going for a momentous choice to protect the 3-2 Bukai. Gonna live as a 3-1 as no weapons have been played yet. Actually, been a while since I've seen a momentous choice that was not doubled up. I mean, so this is making up for the last turn because, yeah, you draw another cane, but when you are left over with 3-1, that's not really accomplishing too much. And reroll, more than happy to go down to 17. This Ravenous Flock not going to come out. And a rather weak development out of reroll also. Both these players are going to bank some spell mana into turn four, where, you know, this Gwen looking rather appealing is there are already two hallowed triggers in the pool for reroll. Oh, this is so Chenya might take a risky line. Risky line, pass, repost. Uh, but then this could get punished by Valfis, by Flock. So probably a bit too risky. He'd rather put that uh, X into the cane basket where he has three of them already. Yeah, when you know that there's Vile Feasts and Ravenous Flocks alike that could pop your barrier and really just kind of take all of the wind out of your sails when you need to get online. And we'll see what this triple cane hand can accomplish. You know, cane healing backup actually does play the, through the Ravenous Flock pretty well. But with the Glimpse Beyond as well, we might be able to deny the level up. So this is a very good play by Real if he doesn't attack because the 2-1 that just trades with the 3-5. So what he does instead, he wants to keep the flock for the cane. He, he knows there is a cane in the hand and he does. He wants to prevent that level up because that's the only way Chenya can really squeeze a win from such an amazing hand. And I'm not sure if it's going to be possible. Chenya just has so many additional canes that the spells will keep coming through. But we see the Katarina out of the hand of Reroll. And while Kane, you know, going to heal back up after dealing damage himself. But we're not going to get to Kane just yet. It's going to be Combat Cook first. Upcycled Rake an option and going to be picked up. Chenya has really loved this forged Rake with elusives this tournament. This is a very surprising play. Chenya could have had a next de developed Kane this turn, and next turn he has double Kane spell, Kane spell into repost. He had a lot of options. He just locked himself out of the options by playing Combat Cook. And it might not even get to attack, right? There is an Arachnoid Sentry in the hand of Reroll, not able to develop the Dancers this turn, but instead it's going to be Katarina. And I wonder if the pick a card is going to get used on one of these canes, maybe in the future, maybe not necessarily right now, as we look to potentially drop Kane and Repost on the following turn. I, I'm trying to figure out what was the Chenya's plan. The playing Repos now, perhaps? Because uh, a reroll doesn't have a minute. No? No, it's going to be the soft pass. Card. Okay, so I mean, not soft pass, but burst pass, uh, which doesn't exist anymore. But still, he wants reroll to pl uh, play something else to find out if he wants to pl go for the Repos and play this turn. The dagger mixed up uh, his plans, I believe. Yeah, at least, oh man, we, we've seen this Katarina Gwen combo be so potent over the course, not just of this event, but the entire meta and reroll looking to be in a very dominating position as Chenia, you know, as you mentioned, not getting down that cane doesn't have the option to start going after these champions. And once the cook was committed, reroll was safe to get down an off turn Katarina. So now that can get paired with the Eternal Dancers, which at the moment actually going to revive a redeemed prodigy, get another ghastly ban. Things looking very strong for rerolls next attack turn. I think Rios is more likely looking for the next turn to be just open swing into Katarina uh, instead of Dancer. Dancer reviving Prodigy is not that premium, but just going for that uh, uh, attack again, pretty much from the uh, attack token from the Katarina might be stronger. And you are going to level up Gwen. She has already struck once. There's about seven power dumped into that already. So on the first strike in a level, you know, get that second attack off with the Katarina. Okay. Go even bigger. Okay, there is no shot I can attack here. Like, he's going to spend, repost, 
to trade with 2-1 and then he gonna attack again and push what 7 he spends 4 resources to kill 2-1 this is the, this is the problem he put himself in a very bad spot where there is a no good play where at least before he had the play with the cane and he could have done something Okay, we pick up Concerted Strike and Momentous Choice off the top, so that will upset the Katarina plays from reroll this turn. Yeah, he's very happy about that Concerted. And that should stop the both Katarina and uh, Gwen, because he'll just repost block one and he'll uh, Concerted uh, the Katarina. And that could possibly get him back to the game. Yeah, things starting to look really good for Chenny. It is going to be all of his mana. It is going to be a momentous choice lost, but it just kind of is what it is in a situation like that. And, you know, no Vile Feast, only a 2 of in the hand of reroll to pop this barrier and actually push through a commanding position. You could go with momentous choice instead of repost. You could go for a risky play. You don't have to go for repost here, technically. But I promise you don't kill Gwen then. And, you know, it is important to note that this Gwen is at 7 out of 10, so even just the Snip, 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 not going to be enough to level her up. So future Gwen still going to be stuck at that level 1 if this one does go down to the repost. He chooses to play around 2 of Valfis right here uh, by not doing the repost play. Oh, and he actually rearranges the blockers, so now the repost play totally off the table in the face of Ravenous Flock. Yeah, completely. Again, he was too scared of the Valfis to blow him out of the water. And we're gonna say, see a perfect response with the glimpse on the Katarina. He uh, most likely reroll is looking for the Minotaur Reconner to attack again with the Gwen. So actually, Chenia here can use the momentous choice. Now it only gets you up to four. It's not gonna quite be enough. I don't know why I thought it was gonna give plus four health. That'd be insane for one <laughs> mana. I've just seen it doubled so many times. I'm like, yeah, so it gives plus two, plus two. You double it. Now it's plus, plus zero, plus four. But we are going to get the Gwen level up as a kill onto the combat cook comes out. Chenya not looking too happy about the one, that, the way this one is playing out. So he didn't find the Ruined Reconner. That's a bit unfortunate for Riro because he doesn't get much pressure this turn left. All he can do is just develop Dancer into pass. And the momentous choice used, it was fleeting. We did only have one mana left, so might as well get some additional health down onto our unit. We're still going to bank the three spell mana into the next turn. Unforgiving Cold finally picked up, but things looking a little dicey for Chenia as Regal still has many powerful top decks. Now, the question is, do you do we uh, definitely not a take down on the Gwen? If you attempt, you take down the Dancer because the Dancer would have brought the Gwen back regardless. And we see that center coming clutch. Yeah, but now the, the Drenants are going to revive the Katarina. It's not going to be leveled, but it will return to hand and give reroll a potential two rallies next turn. And it will give you dagger that cutters the repost completely, so it's off the table. Yeah, we are looking down potentially into the final minutes of this third, fourth place decider match, and it looks like reroll might finally be picking that win up over Chenia. I would be very surprised not to see a flock here, so he doesn't have to, like, on either of the targets. Still thinking it out is reroll, and it's going to just be a legion rearguard. Another non-committal pass here. Mana still available for everything. What he could do? Uh, I'm thinking of about flocking the cane, and possibly, and just passing. So on the next turn, he doesn't have any. He doesn't have to worry about potentially flipped cane to bring him the with the rust back to the game. Oh, looks like we actually are going to get a cane oh, spell in this. And there is a Valfis plus Flock to punish that play completely. Yeah. Going to be five damage. No mana left on the side of Chenny. Unfortunately, he could not hang on to that momentous choice as it was fleeting, so not going to be able to save the cane here. And that is actually going to be two copies of the champion dealt with as well. Nope, Kane going to go back into the deck anyway. Well, that uh, looks like a game will be sealed. We'll see what reroll goes for here. Even if they don't go for the open attack, I mean, Caught in the Cold is still an option, but the Spiderling going to be the one taking in these three Hallowed Triggers. You would hit Gwen, you would hit Eternal Dancers. No, you would even just hit the Spiderling. And with that, I think Chenia going to have to use it, but the Rally going to come through from the Katarina. No answer for that one, unless we could repost, move it back over to the Katarina. But as you mentioned, the Dagger. Able to pop the barrier, the quick attack still goes through, we still go back to the hand. Still wouldn't kill Ka uh, Katarina because she True, has quick yeah, attack, attack we call first. So, yeah. gonna attempt to kill the Dancer and that's not gonna work either. Uh, oh, actually, we'll kill the little. Dancer. Katarina will jump back to the field, give another attack token, and if that wouldn't be enough, she could go once more. Yeah, we get out of the game. Our final 
Katarina level up from reroll this tournament, going to be taking third place at the World Championship. Chenia, you beat reroll a couple of times earlier in the month, but reroll gets it where it matters. Top four all Korea, but the titan of reroll, the one that was talked up as the best player in South Korea for this event, proves it here in our decider match. Well played. I mean, as you guess, that's uh, the uh, one of the uh, the Korea will win the top three. I finally got to cast. Well, I got to cast some Korea wins in the top eight as well. But yes, here finally our top four all locked in to EMEA to Korea and Alan. I gotta give the props not just to Reroll, not just to Chenny, but also to you. You I mean, call okay, it all. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah. You know, is, at the start of the day, you were already behind. Like the the ratio wasn't there. We had, look at you had 30, 40 percent of the players only. But at the next stage of the day, I had 2-0 for Korea and 2-3 and three for EMEA. So I did, I did have the lead there for a second. For a second. I'll give you that. Now, although Korea has been eliminated from the tournament, it is all EMEA left, Alan, as I'm sure you are happy to hear. We're going to throw it back to the analyst desk to get into the finals action. Got to break down that match first. Boulevard and Alan, thank you so much for bringing us through that third place match and congratulations to Reroll. I mean, what a huge accomplishment too, just looking at how Reroll and Chenny have been matching up so far this season. They kind of had a little bit of a rivalry going. It always happens in Runeterra. Every community, every shard has a tight knit testing group. We knew that each player had a reputation as being sort of a hero for the server and just to show up and show up so big for the world championships you got to be proud of both of these players yeah boulevard was calling it out right reroll was down zoo t zero two in sets against chenia in recent months but being able to pick up the win where it counts here at the world championship real has to be very happy with that being able to grab third and he was the player that pegasus had told us was the best in korea coming in and he placed the best. Yep. Many years ago, Chania was crowned the king of Korea in the or king of Runeterra in Korea. But now reroll, you know, kind of said, hey, maybe that crown belongs to me now. It's always nice when players can go against one another and increase that skill. You hone yourself as a competitor by playing against very strong opponents. I mean, I can just plant the seed for next world championship that Korea is just going to be a powerhouse region no matter what. They keep getting better and better. I think APAC in general was a little bit weaker when the servers were split. I think that having, you know, the smaller player bases between those two, when they come together as one full region, they learned a lot from each other and now we end up with a power powerhouse region with two in the top four. The more players you can get together to deck test, to optimize list, and to get new ideas flowing, that's what you need to be at the top level. So you need to make sure that you work together. And as you said, putting the regions together, more players to work with and more things to learn from. These deck lineups were so cool and the way that both Reroll and Chenia had navigated not only through their group stage matches, but also in this final bracket was super inspiring and I am so excited to see what they are and going to do in the future. Yeah, Reroll had, I think, just raw power in the lineup. Great way to line up against the metagame. Chenia with that X Factor, the Blooming Cultist MVP, just kind of having consistent pressure to take games away from the opponents and at such a high level sometimes that's what you need to do and i won't forget the darkened fan tech from chenia Ooh. that came in so clutch yeah. multiple times and you just love to see these cards that no one else was really giving respect to come through and actually win so many games at this world championship for chenia i mean yeah chenia's lineup was fantastic i mean the lulu jinx got banned so much and even if it's not getting the wins, if it's getting bans, that's exactly what you want that to do. I also want to point out that on reroll, I think that the Akshan Sivervaris was a great meta call. I mean, generally, we've seen Akshan and just Sharima perform pretty well this tournament. Hopefully, players will continue to respect these regions and these deck lists. I know that Chenia and Reroll were going into this tournament with the secondary goal of establishing their server on the world stage, the same way that Yamato was able to do it the last World Championships. And we now see, after this monstrous gauntlet of EME players that were... <laughs> 
you know, they received the Allen blessing. I don't know how you could possibly overcome that. And they showed up, right, taking spots three and four, still very respectable. We know to make it to this pinnacle of Legends of Runeterra competition, it takes the best of the best. Yeah, generally we hear about EU versus NA and, of course, you know, Brazil and NA and all of that. But, I mean, APAC just said, hey, you know, you need to be talking about us now. I mean, the Americas didn't really show up, unfortunately, but APAC definitely did. It has been so cool to see all of these players from all across the globe battle it out so far, but we have whittled the competition down to two final players, and they will be battling it out for not only that beautiful trophy, but also for all the pride and glory in the Terra universe. I cannot wait to get into this grand finals action between Teddy and Aragorn, and we're gonna get to that right after this short break.
2022 Legends of Rune Terra season has led to this moment. We are at the grand finals now of the 2022 Legends of Rune Terra World Championships, where we will be crowning a new world champion. We've got two incredible players heading into this grand finals matchup, and it's been an incredible three day event to get to this point. Well, I'm gonna get boring, but uh, EU, let's go. <sighs> you guys had a head start. You had a head start, all right? There was no Korea last year, so it's their first year, third and fourth. Pretty good for that, okay? I mean, it's really impressive. <laughs> It's been very impressive to look at all of the players across the board. After two days of group stages, we found ourselves in at the final day of competition today with an eight player bracket. Single elimination has been concluded up through that third place match, where we did see Reroll take that third place. But now it is time for Teddy and Aragorn to battle it out and see who will come out on top of this year's World Championships. Alan, you already gave it to us. We had five EMEA players in this final eight bracket, and we have two left. Let's talk about Teddy first, because Teddy came in as one of your favorites into this tournament. Oh, by far the most clean player, the most accomplished, one of the most accomplished players, and such a background in the competitive gameplay. Calm, steady plays, zero shakiness, like just clean beast. He just looks for another victim. Teddy has really come out of every group of death we throw him into, right? In the group stage, we thought his was one of the harder. Then we got to the top eight bracket. We're looking at the top. It's all these seasonal champions. And it's Teddy, you know, sort of the one that came out of that bracket now in the grand finals. I mean, on top of that, he has the experience that most players don't have. He's been to EU Masters, seasonal champion. I mean, he's just looking for the, the final gym on the crown, really really could just get a gauntlet here, which would be so cool to see from this player. I mean, Teddy has been impressing everybody from start to finish with the level of execution in his plays, the patience, and also being able to find some really clutch wins with this deck lineup. And so let's go over each individual deck as we get into this matchup, and let's start with this Aatrox deck. Yeah, so this one is a little bit different than the other vein Aatrox that we've seen some of the other competitors running. We've got Quinn in here is a cool addition, which, you know, obviously synergizes with the darkened weapons, but then there's two of Champion Strength in here as well, which you look at this compared to some of the decks that are more built around it. They're very low to the ground, a lot of one drops, a lot of one health units going wide, some susceptibility to that, but this isn't the core focus of the deck. Two units, a Quinn and a Valor, as we saw earlier, is all it takes for that card to just end the game. Especially if you play that on your own turn, you do not lose that scout you get. You just get a rally again. You get to attack again. So that champion strength in combination with just Queen was really astonishing. And the Jinx deck, I mean, this one is built a little bit different than the other champion strength Jinx decks we've seen. This one has more draw than what we typically see. We see three stress testing and three rummage. So you're always able to have that consistency that a lot of the champion strength decks have lacked as well as the Rangers Resolve coming in clutch as well, saying, you know what, you're trying to clear my board, Rangers Resolve, no problem. Looking into another deck from the Teddy's uh, Seraphine Ezreal Victor, this deck has a few spicy decks, uh, starting from the Dark Bob Acolyte, no one, at least not to not my knowledge, no one ever played that card in the deck and it was very well performing for the Teddy. Overall, the strategy for the deck is survive until you get to, to play Barkeep and then keep as many cards as you can, level up as real and just blast 20 to the opponent's Nexus. We've definitely seen that Dark Bob come into play and just all of these cool techs have really put Teddy in a winning position, but he's got some tough opposition on the other side, and that is Aragorn, who has continued to impress all throughout this World Championships, and especially when uh, you, you have been kind of stating that he, he was a little bit maybe overlooked when it came to the strength coming into this tournament. Oh yeah, most definitely. I don't think Aragorn, from what I've heard, had the most prep from the players, but by looking how he plays, how clean he is, 
and with the deck choices, he looked definitely prepared. Yeah, and Aragorn actually had a pretty interesting run through the qualifiers, you know, played Trundle Timelines, the only EMEA player to do it, while it was rather popular in the Americas, so we were wondering, maybe Aragorn's looking outside of EMEA for the prep, maybe he's thinking more like an Americas player, but then comes in with more surprise decks, and it just completely throws us off. Uh, yeah, you can see the deck lineup here, and I feel like the one that everybody has had their eyes on has really been this Ziggs Talia deck that has just been putting Aragorn on the map, it really feels like Silver Break It Down. I mean, to me, this deck is a bit genius considering that he only had seven days to test this out with his new Black Flame card. And I mean, he, he understood the issue of Ziggs Talia beforehand and was able to say, you know what, this is how I fix the issue is adding Ionia and adding the Black Flame for pressuring extra damage as well as the unworthy soul too. I mean, we've seen this card come in big over and over again. It's just is such a massive tempo swing. It allows you to do something what Ezreal Cannon did before. It allows you to multiply on your champions. We've seen that Talia, uh, triple Talia pretty much attack with filling out the stack. That was absolutely crazy. I've never seen something like that in the game yet. And now we've got the Red Gwen up. I mean, this has been one of the staple decks of the event. It wouldn't be a grand finals of this without Aragorn's build here. And it's not really a substandard one. You know, this is actually the most expected deck from this player, I would say. It was very popular in the qualifiers, remained popular today. We've seen it starting to falter a little bit as we get into the later stages of the tournament, and players that are more prepared for it are finding their matchups into it. Yeah, and going to the last deck, Kane Aatrox, the new addition of Obviously Aatrox, new Darkin with the expansion, brought the top end the deck needed, extra sustain on top of the cane. And then for those cheesy win for those cheesy lethals, you have that blooming cultist, which have been shining all across all three days. And in terms of spells, we have pretty much standard with the removal being Furious Wielder and some board control with Unforgiving Cult against all those tall big units so you can trade off. With the expansion entering into the fold, these players have really had to test their limits when it's come to their preparation, as well as how they are going to approach this game. And it has been Teddy and Aragorn that have rose to the occasion and find themselves in the grand finals now. Teddy and Aragorn, an EMEA matchup. We're going to see a new champion crowned. And also Aatrox is present, almost as if the script has written itself. Yeah, exactly. What do you guys think? Who, who is gonna take it down? Teddy. I wanna see, I wanna see Talia Ziggs be able to win it out, but I mean, I have to go with Teddy too. So clean. Look, I've been I... talking Korea Ball event, but Teddy was very, very high on my power rankings. Okay, I mean, I, like, I cannot go with uh, Aragorn if I was for Teddy all the way through, and th that was my prediction. But I hope Aragorn will put up a good fight. I know he can. Will he, though? That is one question that we have to see answered as both of these players are going to fight it out for, of course, the money, the title, that beautiful trophy. And to talk us through all of the action, we've got Casanova and Skarzig. Take it away. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Caster Desk. If you're just joining in, you're high rolling because we're just about to start the grand finals of the Legends of Runeterra World Championships. I cannot be more excited, Casanova. Honestly, I feel the same. It is electric. We do have an EMEA final between Teddy and Aragorn. We've got the beast, Teddy. He took down an EU Masters. He took down a seasonal. Now he's coming for Worlds, going up against Aragorn, the young gun trying to pull it off with a signature deck list. We did just catch Skarzig. The signature list banned away from Aragorn. No Ziggs Talia in the final, and that has been the clutch factor for him so far in these series. Teddy is the type of player that isn't going to stick to a dedicated ban strategy. You have to constantly adapt to your opponents, and he saw Aragorn popping off with this list and has adapted accor accordingly. Wants to take this powerful tool away from this young and hungry competitor. And on the other side, banning away the Jinx, once again, Teddy having that Jinx champion strength, so much respect has been given to this deck because of its ability to consistently find champion strength on wide boards. Probably the most consistent version of the champion strength deck. Aragorn feeling forced into that, gonna have to deal with Seraphine Ezreal Victor that Teddy has been indomitable on. You know 
Teddy loves this fork he puts his opponents in every single time they see the ban phase. If you don't ban Champion Strength, I might steal a game for free, but once you do, I get to play the back alley bar. To start us off in game number one of the grand finals, we've got Kane Aatrox versus that Bane Quinn. Right, and we saw earlier the two of champion strength, one being used just on the Quinn to steal a game swiftly from reroll, helping Teddy march to this grand finals. These were our two players that started 3 0 in groups. They both had very dominant roads towards the final, each dropping a game today. One Teddy dropping to Maddie, and Aragorn dropping one just to Chen who was able to take down his Tilia deck. So we know these players have some weaknesses. Hopefully the, the competition is picked up on that. Teddy's going to be trying his best to exploit every possibility to take down this world championship. Already starting off with massive pressure with the double fleet feather tracker. Aragorn, because of the champion strength, is forced to play a much more tempo-oriented style to keep the board clear. Yes, and this is a beautiful answer, though, to these early challengers. Having the keeper of the box with the spear, you love love having the spear on this first attack token to get the buffs early and often, and it's being put onto a lifesteal unit that is going to help temper the early aggression and allow Aragorn to make it towards the Cane and the Aatrox. Hopefully the Darkened Spear buffing the units on top of the deck will come into play with that Blood Letter. It means a Darkened Thrall is still on the board. Teddy remains wide. It doesn't matter that this unit cannot block. It's still going to be another factor, another wide swing coming through and offsetting this lifesteal. Here we go. I like this re-equip putting on the harp instead. Now if the broad wing comes in and pulls the keeper of the box, you're at least getting the trade. With the top deck of Furious Wielder, we could see the double dip. I wonder if Aragorn is really so all in on this keeper of the box to carry the early mid game. Yeah, is he willing to utilize that large tool so early on furious wielder very important it's very strong with kane as well to help get more strikes so you generally are going to want to hold on to that it feels like the pressure is maybe not quite to the point where we need to use that especially with the lifesteal you are getting value even if this is pulled full left yes you're going to still be taking quite a bit of damage dropping to maybe 13 but Overall, I think this is safe for Aragorn to hold back, conserve some resources, and then look to reestablish a board with Kane. Teddy just having his way with this early game. The cheap equipment of the Blood Letters, keeping up so much pressure and a wide board, also tutoring the Aatrox. This build from Teddy is so devious because it doesn't need the champion strength to win. Your opponent has to keep it at top of mind at all times, but you can just play towards the Quinn, play towards Aatrox naturally covering Aragorn with no fast developments has to go all in on a big mid-range plan with the Aatrox and Kane in hand. And Teddy has curved out beautifully, right? Having those blood letters early on to keep the pressure up with those early trackers. And now he's got Quinn on curve into Aatrox. Very powerful plays that it will be difficult for Aragorn to actually deal with. And that's going to set up for Teddy to bring towards a world ender. This is a mechanic that a lot of players underestimate Casanova. Being able to develop two units in one play, so powerful. And Aragorn forced to make one big development of the cane. Has the attack token, but the stats don't line up quite enough. We can get kind of a freebie on the Dark Enthrall, but from this position, we need a little bit more reactivity. Kane only has two base attack. The Furious Wielder isn't going to be hitting the stats you needed to. And exactly. We're looking at Aragorn developing a big unit with Kane and looking at a turn six that feels like it's likely Aatrox. We do have the Ranger Knight Defector, which would leave open some more mana for some more flexibility. But Teddy, having the Quinn into the attack, into the, the Aatrox potentially as an attack, or things like Condemn, things like these combat tricks that we've got in hand, Teddy will be able to set up for 
even more. Might even be able to threaten to put Aragorn to sub-5 HP on the next token. Teddy already sensing that Aragorn is lacking pressure, just stacking this Bloodlighter. The Dark Enthralls are so beefy. A lot of damage coming through even without the Quinn development. With three mana up, you can play the Quinn. Is Aatrox going to take down the Valor? It doesn't matter. You still have a four wide swing alongside the Broadwing. All right now, Teddy, he's developed this wide board. It slows down to Aragorn. What can the decisions be on turn six to defend? He can immediately go for Valor. This was one of the options that is afforded to him by holding the attack token for so long and forcing Teddy to develop first. You still want to play this Quinn on curve. But now there's the opportunity to open attack and pressure through with 11 damage straight away, pulling Kane to the side. If this does go through, Teddy has so much consistent pressure. Now, if uh, Champion Strength comes through, if we find a way for Quinn to scout, keep up that pressure, Aragorn isn't going to be able to keep up. When you drop down to that low of HP, you can't block every possible attack from a wide swing. Aragorn has to somehow find the cane carry with this Furious Wielder. So many weapons in hand, but no one to wield them. Yeah, and Teddy, is now looking at two options. Open attack can threaten 11 damage, set Aragorn to two, barring any tricks, combat tricks, spells, things that happen with the nine mana that Aragorn has. Or he can look to blinding assault into Aatrox, try and develop a full lethal swing going into Aragorn and saying, hey, you're not going to have enough answers, and even if you do, it will set you far enough behind that I should be able to close out the victory. And now, Casanova, the skill that Teddy has showcased over and over again, he has the hand read, knows Aragorn cannot respond to this six drop. I can tap down under all combat tricks. I'm coming for you. Aragorn has a 7-7 seven, seven Aatrox thanks to the Darkened Spear earlier. This will likely be pulled to the side, though we have that blinding mm -hmm. assault there for two mana. Comes down, able to use the Broadwing plus Valor, pull the two blockers away, and now you have a lethal swing coming through. You would be pushing 17, there's only 15 remaining for Aragorn. Yes, there is three mana remaining, but that is not enough to play out Unforgiving Cold to stop it. It's not enough to play out the Furious Wielder. These are not things that Aragorn has access to here at three mana. And Teddy passes. doesn't take the attack, doesn't want to give any sort of leeway, says, now that I have this wide swing, I want to go into next turn with even more mana. We see the Condemn in hand. Because he has the read on Aragorn, he knows there's not really too much that he can do from this position. Here comes the World Ender on Aragorn's side. And Teddy playing cautiously, knowing that if he plays Blinding Assault, he can't follow up the next turn with World Ender. So instead, he holds back. He knows this World Ender is massive for him, and he should be able to close it out regardless of if Aragorn plays his own. This is where Teddy is thinking, and I think that it should be enough considering these cultists are going to be bring down Jelani. Teddy recognizing that if the mid-range deck, sure, I have a massive swing, I set you down to two, three, four HP, but if I can't seal the deal, Aatrox comes down, heals for two, strikes, heals for more. If you've got Deathbringer Sweep, you're healing for a ton and stabilizing. If Aragorn pulls off a big world ender into Jural, this thing can spiral out of control. Yeah, this is a pivotal moment in this matchup and this series between the two. Furious Wielder going to be cast through trying to take out the Aatrox. You have the 7-7 trying to exert the force instead of going for a World Ender because you know if you pop World Ender now and Teddy answers, you are losing. You have to find other ways back in and Aragorn's initial decision is going to be this Furious Wielder. I love backing off of the World Ender play going for this line instead rather than going all in on something that is vulnerable to getting disrupted. You're going to go for a lower mana play. Try to keep the board under control. Aragorn still aware of the potential of champion strength. Teddy has the catch in hand to put plus That's one, plus one shadow. on this Come Aatrox. It's not going to be enough. Yes, in this spot, how these players use the resources can decide the course of the series. Aatrox going to be allowed to be killed off by Teddy. He does have the weapon available still, so he can resurrect it via World Ender. Gonna play down just a one drop. It looks like he will develop weapons into looking for a big world ender open on the following turn. It's just about trying to hold on to as much of a board as possible. 
with Aatrox now taking down his doppelganger. It looks like he's cleared a path to safely strike in this matchup. When you don't have the stats to compete, you have to take a back seat and use your Nexus health as a resource. Teddy with just 7% to draw the champion strength and convert this small board into a game winning one. Yeah, it would be really nice to pick that up just below 7%, being able to buff up this entire board. Trying to push that in, Dark and Scythe destroyed. And there's going to be... That's pretty funny, yeah, because the hand damage. is full after Kane yeah. bounces back to the hand, but it is an auto-equip. He's just going to recreate the Scythe out of thin air, so we now have Kane online with Rost. That's even more potential healing that Aragorn is going to use to stabilize this position. Now Teddy recognizing the implication here, throws down the Valor, going to continue to go wide, hoping for this champion strength to seal the deal before Aragorn claws his way back into a stable position. Yeah, the Bash Bros of Darken, Aatrox, Rost, trying to continue to help heal Aragorn up against this. But you're not too worried about healing, you're worried about dying in one fell swoop. And that's what we're looking at to set up for Teddy. Bloodletters once again, just looking to create the most massive world ender we have seen, trying to put down that darkened sword as well onto the Valor. If this does go through, Teddy has a beautiful split decision. If I draw champion strength, awesome. If I don't, I can still world enter to assimilate these darkened weapons, get my Aatrox back into play. Aragorn already used that Furious Wielder, has the Deathbringer sweep in the far left side of the hand, and if this Aatrox stays bit small enough, it can still snipe out these units before the world ender resolves. Well, here is the moment for Teddy. Can you cast the World Ender? There's a large hand for Aragorn to Furious try and defend. Wielder also Furious top Wielder has the interaction. Up. Here comes the World Ender from Teddy. He's looking at it for now and it's committed. How can Aragorn respond? Can he do enough? Can he stop enough of these Darken from unleashing? Devastation on Rune Terra. Both the Deathbringer Sweep and the Furious Wielder knocking down these units so that their darkened forms cannot shine through. Keeping the board under control, Aragorn has done it. Stabilized. Teddy couldn't find the champion strength when he needed. Aragorn had the buff on the Aatrox. His was bigger. That Furious Wielder allowed him to stop Teddy in his tracks. The darkened spear making a huge difference, being able to draw that Aatrox with the buff that it was granted early on in this game. We have seen these weapons make huge differences in the game. The choices of the weapons, the techs. We saw the fan with Chenia. Here, it's the spear with Aragorn being able to help create a differential in stats between the Aatroxes in this game. And now Teddy's still going to create a big board with World Ender, but not getting the Aatrox back. You can see Teddy's really not phased by this. Even though this looks bad, he's the type of player that's going to stick to his lane. He's constantly calculating, what can I do to keep up the pressure from this point? Still sitting decently healthy at 13 HP. The Dark Enthrall can't block. It's getting pretty dicey, Casanova. The difference made by plus one, plus one. Zolani still able to pop out from the remaining units. Yes, but we still have these sweeps coming through. You can take out Vayne. You can even sacrifice Aatrox to take out a Zolani, trying to continue to utilize everything from this Aatrox champion spell and push through Teddy's board. Stop what looked like maybe the biggest world ender to maybe it's a small world after all for Teddy. The sweep every single part of it gets cheaper. Now, Teddy trying to force with Catch, a card that he had held earlier before to buff up the Quinn so that Aatrox trades down. This covers the momentous choice, and if it's used, that means he can't use the third sweep to clear us, uh, Zolani. So now we have 18 damage worth of Overwhelm about to come through onto Aragorn's Nexus. Yeah, board's still going to be towards the favor of Teddy, but the hand size for Aragorn will allow for some redevelopment. Of course, these Darken costs so much to play. It's gonna be tough for Aragorn to match what Teddy has already created. If this attack isn't lethal, we could see Aragorn dip all the way down to one or two Nexus health re-equip the Darkened Blade. We've got an incredibly inexpensive World Ender now at five mana. Heedless so then we can revive well. the Aatrox. We have Heedless Resurrection as well in the hand for Aragorn. 
So Obviously plus the HP on the through. Aatrox does survive here. Holding now, Teddy thinking about his next turn, thinking about this attack, pushing forward with Shalani. Without the mana here to re-equip the Darkened Blade, Aragorn is incentivized to keep the Aatrox alive, but with the rest of the board going down in order to save the Nexus, especially with that Challenger on the Zolani, massive here, we can't get a big assimilation turn. Is a 10-10 Aatrox going to be enough? Yeah, you can create a Scout Zolani potentially, but also the Spear. Maybe you look for the Hyrule to pull more out of your deck, but you already have so many of your weapons in your hand. It's unlikely that you will be able to find more, but the Unforgiving Cold can be a matchup decider as it will allow for favorable trades for Aragorn. So Aragorn's looking at perhaps equipping the Darkened Harp here. This, with the assimilation of World Ender, makes a Scout Straw 2. This is going to draw many cards and discount them. With Unforgiving Cold, Aragorn can swing in. Seven mana perfectly calculated here. No worries whatsoever. Aatrox stabilizing another seemingly lost position. And Aragorn may have turned the corner on this match exactly as you said. World Ender for three. You've got the freeze for four. You'll be able to set up for an immensely favorable attack in Suratu with Scout, going to be able to refill the hand, find every other answer you'd want at a discounted rate. The discounts are going to come raining down in these mid-range matchups. When it comes to a stalemate grind, the player that can find these extra resources will come out on top. As the clock is now ticking for Teddy, the board is getting narrow. The champion strength isn't enough. Straw to an 11-7 scout. Quick attack. These attacks are free, Casanova. Absolutely free, and you can see it on Teddy's face. He's realizing there's not much for him to do. It looks like he may just be looking for a pass. There's Ooh, the surrender. And the he surrender. understands. Aragorn wouldn't even need the Unforgiving Cold. Can just bully his dominance on board and have the Unforgiving Cold for the crackback swing. Teddy knew that he was down and out. Teddy understanding that there is no way back onto that board after that Storatu comes through. He knows there's still mana on the back for the Unforgiving Cold, but even without it, the quick attack was enough and there's not enough answers in Teddy's hand to deal with it. So now he's going to have to 2-0 a Red Gwen, which does is a deck that has those high rolls. It has the ability to just beat you no matter what you do. So we're looking at Aragorn to pick up a curve here that can find the win. Aragorn was on the more aggressive version of this with nine one drops and he finds Legion Rearguard with the attack token. He's curving out into turn two with the butler. Teddy, however, has a fantastic early curve of his own. We saw this in the last game, Casanova, where he had the wide board and the champion strength didn't come. Even if it looks like Aragorn's about to stabilize, there's always that constant threat. With only a Quinn in play, the champion strength can end it all. We triple Phantom Butler hits beautifully into these broad wings. Yeah, perfect. One will clear away with the broad wing once it's given Challenger, but until then it can't block. Fearsome, very good counter into Formidable. Yes, it got three power, but it doesn't have three actual power. It comes from the toughness. And now we find a one drop that's going to curve out great. You're not going to want to actually use the Crimson Pigeon to use its effect, but still having a one mana 2-2. Two -two. We get the open attack instead from Aragorn instead of full developing into this turn. Yeah, I was wondering if he would greet a little bit with the second butler. If you analyze Teddy's mid, like lower curve, there's really nothing that can block the fearsome, but he's just going to get that free damage. We know the phantom butlers are great for the early game, but he's already thinking, I'm not trying to beat down. I'm just going to get whatever damage I can for free and already try to set up for the late game harrowing play. He also holds back the Pigeon in this case. This does leave the option open to cast this Fervor and still develop on this turn. It may be an opportunity for Aragorn to do that. As of now, though, it looks like it's just going to be some Challenger trades into these Butlers. I like this a lot, being able to force down trades you normally wouldn't be able to get, right? If your Challenger can't block Fearsome, you say, well, I'm just going to take the trade. And if Aragorn's board is empty, no attacks are coming through. The uh, Hallow stacks aren't going through. Teddy wants to keep the board alive, also playing for a long-term condition with the champion strength. Yeah, Teddy trying to play slow. He's got the Quinn, which can help 
quite a bit in the mid game. If he can work towards a Quinn level up, that can be massive in this matchup. But also, we saw the power of Quinn into champion strength. If he's able to develop it here and then go champion strength on six with the attack token, Teddy can look to close out this game immediately. So holding onto a big board, playing to his outs. This is beautiful play from Teddy to set up for a potential very high roll draw of that champion strength. So I think Aragorn seeing the writing on the wall is going to go incredibly wide, incredibly aggressive. Teddy doesn't want to block, wants to keep the board alive and preserved for the potential champion strength. Got a beautiful swing here to push through damage. If Teddy doesn't find the champion strength, Aragorn will have dealt so much damage that maybe there's a possibility for a lethal. Katarina is very nice too because it's going to open up this blade's edge to try and take out the tracker or take out Valor. Valor the better target of course because of those blood letters on the tracker currently. But there is a catch in hand for Teddy. He can There's play that out. Catch. There's <laughs> always a catch. And he has one in hand that will still allow him to play Champion Strike next turn if he plays that catch here. Absolutely everything lining fish up fight. for Teddy. Pulling a fish fight from the hand to respond to the Katarina. This is where Fervor can still come into play. It can be used to get value and deny the fish fight from being a full blowout here onto the cat, but Aragorn at the end of the day can still start to respond with the Blade's Edge, try and take down this Fleet Feather Tracker. Catch still an option, but we've already tapped out a Champion Strength regardless. Yeah, the Fleet Feather Tracker goes down, so no Challenger, but because that was equipped with a Blood Letter, we still get a Dark Enthrall. Teddy four wide. We have nine damage coming through. No Hallowed Stacks yet. And Quinn is just going to take this value trade. This is a little risky. Aragorn over here on three copies of Ravenous Flock. Yeah, but still going to want that value trade from the Quinn. You don't need to go for the level up condition, especially losing your uh, some of your board here. Mm -hmm. You know that you need to preserve some HP, right? And so having the Quinn be a beefy blocker with that five health is going to be incredibly valuable. As we come back to the attack turn, no champion strength is going to be available to be played, and it's not drawn here. You want to find more units anyway. Mm -hmm. You want to draw at the turn you're going to play it. Yeah, Teddy went for the fish fight there to just keep the Katarina contained. Overall, we've been hyping up this win condition for Teddy, but he's not He's playing towards it incidentally. You get this beautiful early curve. You get the scout attacks with the Quinn in this wide development. But he's trying to just do a generic beatdown strategy, which is the most consistent way we've seen these world's qualified players to take down Red Gwen. Yeah, and so Teddy is still looking for that wide board. He's got the attack token to Valor. So he will be able to scout attack with that if he wants to come forward alongside the Quinn. Still setting up for some follow-up challengers. He'd love to sacrifice the Broadwing now that it cannot block anymore. Was given the immobile condition by that Reckoner. Aragorn on the other side, though, having the Gwen on the follow-up is going to still be able to exert a lot of pressure onto this low health total of Teddy. And because he has the Noxian Fervor in hand, not going to develop that Crimson Pigeon, can get a nice trade here using the Fervor, maybe taking down the Quinn. Nothing Teddy can do to protect this. And you know that he's thinking, do you have the Ravenous Flock? Teddy really hasn't had the opportunity to go for the style of early plays that he has been become known for. Taking a big risk testing for a certain spell or interactive point and once he gets the read that my opponent doesn't have it he automatically locks down the game looking to just push damage with quinn right away testing the waters not going to bring valor in just yet for these pulls with the challenger allowing aragorn to select any trade that he wants here if he wants to block at all red gwen still wanting to keep that wide board but these hallowed units when they go down he can still set up for bigger plays in the future if, because the Broadwing is definitely going to take down the Reckoner, we get four damage. Aragorn just going to stay wide. If you aren't swinging, I'm not going to react. I still have this fervor. If this uh, Reckoner goes down, then it's going to be another can't block put onto the board. The Dark Enthrall is already uh, unable to block, so it's going to select the next weakest unit. Coming forward, Teddy. Going to get rid yeah, Teddy of actually Broadwing. the Broadwing. Reckoner alive, has a nice one-for-one -one trade to get this off of the board and knows the implication. If I let this thing get revived by a Harrowing, by an Eternal Dancers, my small units that I want to chump Hallowed with 
aren't going to be that strong. Attacking once again with the Quinn. Aragorn comfortable taking eight because he knows this Gwen is going to stabilize, as you said, Casanova. Yeah, he's got a very powerful turn and attack here with the Gwen coming through. Vile Feast alongside that, going to keep healing him up and also potentially clear the way of some of these blockers. But there is only Quinn to be able to block the Fearsome as well. So that is one of the blocks already spoken for. We have units with HP now, Casanova. This Crimson Pigeon could come through just to siphon a little bit, get some value. I don't know if Aragorn's going to take a more aggressive stance with the Legion Rearguard. Vile Feast is going to be so powerful. And Teddy has been sitting on this catch the whole game. Aragorn's been trying to respect it, but it might be too little too late. Once the chips are down, if he's forced into a play to test for catch, and Teddy has it, it could spell trouble. All right, Dark and Aegis going to be played. That's going to tutor Aatrox. This is a way to start healing mm. up, defending the board. Teddy now having that big boy to come down, try and help end the world alongside the rest of this board. So Aragorn going to threaten this attack. 16 coming through with this swing right now before the blocks come out. There's a lot of blocks to choose from. It looks like everything is under control. Teddy bringing Aatrox into the hand forces Aragorn to go for this attack now instead of developing a wider swing. Once Aatrox comes through, he'll heal the Nexus for two. He can swing in very comfortably versus this Gwen and the Reckoner. Yeah, Teddy gonna have to be careful. We know this fervor is in the deck. It is a one of from Aragorn. We have talked about one ofs throughout this entire tournament, how powerful they've been, how many games they've stolen away. And if Teddy ever gets greedy, dropping to three or below, this can come out and seal the deal. It can find the victory for Aragorn. It can crown him the world champion. Teddy setting up the blocks currently, only blocking down to three, which is the magic number for this fervor. Ooh, throws Teddy. the Quinn down, safety blocking around that one of fervor. Teddy keeping everything in focus now. Has to make sure that he does not fall to that danger point. It is the only threat to kill him right now, and he has Aatrox coming down to help heal him back up. The issue is these Reckoners for Aragorn. This hand has been fantastic. He's got his extra reach. He's got a lot of overwhelmed threats coming through, but the fervor is going to be potentially used. Mm. Sending it upstairs, Aragorn thinking about this fervor. Fortunately, not giving too much away. Teddy now getting a read. Okay, is that the fervor that's probably Vile Feast? Maybe Ravenous Flock is going to take that into account. If you send the Noxian fervor now to face, you're doing it when your opponent isn't potentially going to have enough interaction. But decides to let it go. Keeps mana open. Has that Risen Reckoner in hand. Being able to set up more non-blocks for Teddy. The heal from Aatrox. Rear guard going to be the play. Could be double one drop coming through for Aragorn. Has enough mana to also uh, uh, equip one blood letter, if I'm not mistaken, to just go all in on the world ender next turn. We're going to have Aatrox getting overwhelmed and Zelani being assimilated to a big lethal swing. Legion rear guard cannot block because the Katarina was answered earlier with the fish fight. Aragorn doesn't have the oppressive rallying play. You need to come from behind in a position like this. Yeah, the pigeon also going to be just a blocker, giving you some two extra HP against some of the overwhelms. It may be the map that is needed against this 14 health that you currently have going into Zolani and Aatrox, especially with that World Ender coming through. Teddy having the opportunity. Draws Vayne, but this is the World Ender Snap turn. Cast. Here it goes. World Ender. Teddy has already seen the line. Knows there's not much that Aragorn can do. We do have Noxie and Fervor to try to take down one unit before this goes through, but Aatrox himself is still a gigantic threat. Here it comes, the Aatrox leveling up. We'll see the Zelani come through, unless we want to utilize this fervor to clear that away right now and stop it from being that powerful overwhelm, but instead just the Vile Feast onto the Valor. Vile Feast on Valor to take down that unit, but now the rest of the World Ender comes through, and that's a Zelani, a 10-9 and a 10-10 Aatrox. Is there enough HP to stop this, Casanova? Yeah, currently there's six on the board via the Gwen and the Crimson Pigeons, 20 coming through. That is just enough to survive past that overwhelm, but then how do you win? How do you come back? The Risen Reckon are not gonna have enough damage to punch through an Aatrox. 
It, the Risen Reckoner just coming down. Look, and this means that Aragorn is playing towards the Harrowing. I can stop. It. I have enough to block down on this turn. Has thread the needle from the second Gwen to sacrifice this Reckoner to take down Jeral. Jeral with Challenger would have been able to manipulate those blocks to push through the overwhelm damage. Yeah. Aragorn looking for Harrowing on this upcoming attack token to take this game back. Aragorn finding a good opportunity there. That would have been enough to kill him off being able to challenge and pull away the Gwen. The beefiest body on the board would have put it at exactly 15. Teddy would have been finding that victory. Looking for that harrowing, as you said, when that attack token comes back, if Aragorn has it, that's the way he can win. Unfortunately, with that threading, he had to put another Gwen back into the deck, diluting the odds even a little bit more than he already had trying to find that harrowing. But at this point, the percentage points are so slim, it's going to be rough either way. But Aragorn in a tight spot here, needing the harrowing off the top. Teddy in control of the match unless that happens for Aragorn. 7.4% chance to draw the harrowing. Aatrox can swing in here pretty freely to heal for two more. This Teddy sitting at a comfortable a 10, but if that harrowing is cast, Aragorn's not going to be able to clear the board. We're, lo we're missing two slots from the rear guard and the spiderling. When all is said and done, there's only a few hallowed stacks as well, so maybe this attack isn't looking as nice as it would appear at first blush. Yeah, Teddy, considering that harrowing as he does not have a lethal swing, he's able to push Aragorn down to one. He's just going to do it. He's just going to take it. If he had one more mana for this catch, it would have been enough to push through. But he was not able to hold on to that because he had to get the blood letters down to get Solani. So now he knows. You see it on his face. He is it harrowing? Teddy. Teddy or thinking if I don't Aragorn. attack, then the board is too full for harrowing to matter as a top deck. Find the not. fallen reckoner. Dark and no blocks. can't block. Zolani can't block. Aatrox can't block. We've got three wide. Teddy with one development. Aragorn has the Noxian fervor. Is this enough? This Viewers at home, do some math quickly. This might be enough. Only the Bane comes down. Aragorn gonna full send. That's 12 right away. Looking to see if there's anything else he can do, but there's nothing left for you, Aragorn. You have your one of fervor, the extra reach you put in your deck to make sure you could go over the top. You're pushing 12. Vayne going to come through and block, but it's not enough. Even with the catch, it's going to put you down to three, and there is a Noxian fervor ready to go, ready to finish the day. Are there any answers from Teddy that Aragorn has to think about? Teddy plays the tumble to send Aatrox in. Has the read that this last card was some sort of spell. Was it a draft? gonna do card, it! But has the Here one it is. Noxian Fervor! The Noxian Fervor comes through! There's no response from Teddy! And Teddy is going to have that last gem he wanted for the Triple Crown. Ripped away and given to the true king. Returning and coming through to pick it up. The world champion is Aragorn! Aragorn! the young gun taking down Teddy the Beast, a hero rising up that we had never heard of before, playing clean, keeping to his awesome deck lineup, even though he had no access to his signature to Leah Ziggs, still made it come through when everything mattered. All down to the line, it was coming to a draw, we thought it had to be harrowing, but no. Reckoner was enough to do it, enough to push through. Only one legal blocker. You can see the emotion on his face. He just won the world championship. He just won $40,000, but more importantly, he won the beautiful trophy, Skarzig. And he's won my heart. Big congratulations to Aragorn for such spectacular play over the course of this entire event, and Teddy also bringing the heat. We need to just take some time decompress, talk about this a little bit. His signature deck, the closer, the Talia, it was undefeated all the way through until Chenia took it down, but he was not allowed to play it here in the final. He is brought down to Kane Aatrox and Red Gwen. Kane Aatrox, not even bringing Vayne, deciding that this was the right way to go. We saw so many Vayne Aatroxes fall to the wayside with Aragorn marching through with Kane instead. 
the ability for Rost and Aatrox to work in tandem to get some extra Nexus healing to stabilize is so important in these matchups because if your opponent can't finish you off, the World Ender comes through. All of the Darkened Squad comes through for these massive swings. When your opponent can't burn you over the top and you're forcing them to block even if they survive, once you get that big swing through, their board is done. There's nothing you can do. Red Gwen, a deck that's been brewing ever since the Bard meta has risen up through the World Championships and has the versatility. You think you answer the Katarina, you think you're fine. If I cover Harrowing, I think I'm fine. But at the end of the day, it's also the Reckoners. When you can't block, there's nothing you can do, even against a minuscule amount of Hallowed Stacks. And what a final test to become the World Champion. Taking on Teddy, the beast. He's been perfect throughout this tournament. He has played so flawlessly, looking so good on the Seraphine, looking so good on the Vayne Aatrox, but Vayne Aatrox falling short in the final hour against Aragorn, not able to push it through for that third championship, having EU Masters, having a seasonal, trying to get Worlds, but it is taken away by Aragorn, who is so deserving with how he played as well. One of the other players we constantly were highlighting with just immaculate play throughout the tournament. So Aragorn taking it all. What a fantastic game. So proud of all of our competitors today. We're going to get a little more analysis of what we just saw. I have to take a break, Casanova, and we're going to head back over to the analyst desk. Huge, huge, huge congratulations to Aragorn for taking home the trophy, the money, the title. Alan, you've been in this position before. You saw the emotion on Aragorn's face. Like, what could that possibly mean? I mean, it goes all over. You can't believe that you are there. Like, uh, I remember myself. It's just, uh, it's surreal that uh, you just won the World Championship. It's congratulations, Aragorn. But that was uh, very well played. Grats for bringing a very unique deck with the Black Fire Man Worthy. Got even a band in the final, final game. And that was an undefeated run from Aragorn. 3-0 in the groups, makes it all the way through, has to play Teddy, the other undefeated player yeah. from groups. So just one loss for Teddy at the World Championship, but unfortunately it's in the Grand Finals when it matters the absolute most. But Aragorn, absolutely insane. One of the underdogs defeating the Titans from the upper bracket. Yeah, if we consider the last game, Teddy had a lot of outs to defend that final lethal. We had an extra catch. We could have seen Sharp Side. We could have seen Condemn. We could have seen Aegis. All of those cards were an extra out, an extra vein which would provide Condemn. All of those cards would have saved Teddy and allowed him to go for lethal next turn. But that was until the Reckoner top deck. I mean, we were thinking Harrowing, he needs the Harrowing. But the Reckoner was just enough. I mean, just seeing how close that second game was though, right? Like even that first game, Teddy saw that he didn't really have a way to overcome that aggression from Aragorn, but also in that second game too, it really did come down to the wire. I mean, in the game one, he just got out grinded by the Aatrox. The, the three of Aatrox came clutch in that game. I mean, that's been the story of the World Championship, right? We've seen so many very low single-digit Nexus life totals and an exact lethal in the Grand Finals. It's the fitting way to end the tournament. But the respect also that Teddy played towards Aragorn Ziggs Talia deck, that was one that I think shocked a lot of people to see in a lineup and also for a grand champion. That's absolutely wild. I mean, that's a recognition that those uh, grumpy rock bears can just <laughs> give you a punch. Oh my gosh, the rock bears. Oh, but I mean, it was the Ionia tech as well that we saw just play such a big role throughout the entirety of the World Championships too. Uh, well, you know, whether it was that Black Flame, but also even just taking a look at some of the other deck lists that these players had brought, we just saw some incredible innovation from everybody this tournament. Like the tech of Unworthy Soul allowing you to play defensively. You can destroy a weapon. You can uh, recall the big Overwhelm unit. Also, it allows you to put push the final damage when you draw it alongside Absolver to go for that lethal when there is a big unit defending in front of it. 
We had three incredible days of competition, two full days of group stages and a single elimination top eight bracket to bring us to that grand finals. And of course, Aragorn as your new Legends of Runeterra world champion. Holy moly, $40,000, the title, the trophy, all of it for Aragorn. Yeah, big congratulations. That definitely deserved title. He played extremely well, brought unique decks, and yeah, looking forward to what he's gonna accomplish in the next months. And something really interesting is he was relatively unknown before this, and that's just one of the really cool things about Runeterra is it's pretty free to play friendly. That's something a lot of these players have said, hey, that's why I got into the game. I love the Runeterra lore. I love being part of the game and it's free to play. And the fact that in top 700 masters, you can go play for seasonal points. It allows almost anybody to pop into the game and start playing competitively. We were due for an underdog story after last year, you know, we had a storied <laughs> player dominant. coming into the World Championship beating up on all the little guys. So thank you, Aragorn, for giving the underdogs a chance here and crowning yourself a world champion. I mean, at the end, like, we have to remember, it's still a card game. Anyone can make it through. Anyone can make it through, but Aragorn still showed up with an incredible deck lineup and incredible play. What an expert performance by this player throughout the entirety of the season. And of course, where it counts in the World Championships as well. I mean, I can't believe it's over. I, this has been such an incredible weekend. I want more. I, I know. <laughs> Me too. Come on. Day can we do four. it again? Day four. Day four. <laughs> Just what run it back. <laughs> run it back again. Come on, Aragorn. Give us the full performance once again. But there have been some incredible moments throughout the weekend. What have been some of your favorites? Still the same as uh, today morning. <laughs> the the vain matchup against Leona, the Teddy piloted. Still, I'm going to remember that game for a very, very long time. Very memorable. What about you, Silverfuse? I mean, I just love seeing the players react. I mean, you know, there's so much on the line. The intensity is there and how much it mattered to them, whether it be winning or losing. It was nice to see that emotion and just so many memorable moments for that reason. I loved every time Chenya found an elusive. <laughs> every single time Blooming Cultist was in this player's hand, you knew there was a shot that Lethal was going to get stolen away from someone. Hey, move over, Aatrox and, and everyone else. It's all about the Rock Bears and the Blooming Cultists in this. I mean, that was absolutely wild. I mean, Not even champion strength really showing up. Yeah, there was a lot of those small MVPs that no one expected to shine that bright in the, all of those games. All right, guys, which one of the decks you've seen recently uh, on those three days where you're a favorite and you're looking forward to test on the ladder? I mean, for me, it's the Ziggs Talia deck. I've talked about it over and over again. But also oh, another close one is, yeah, the Teddy Jinx deck. I think that's the way that you're supposed to be building champion strength. I just can't get over the amount of pressure you put, the amount of draw that you have. It feels like it would be incredibly consistent. And that's why we saw it get banned pretty much every match. I would love to take the Teddy cha uh, Champion Strength Jinx the ladder, but I feel like since, you know, I'm getting in like five days in, people have maybe found the answer. So I'm looking at that Kane Aatrox, that double Darken, double Rune Terra build. Love that. All right, guys, I'm getting something straight. When I'm going to get home, I'm going to get a warm buff and I jump into race. I'm going to play Rise until Master <laughs> and until top one. I'm not letting that bad boy go. We haven't seen any Rise here because the meta was a bit too fast as expected for the tournament. But on the ladder, oh boy, it's going to be a <laughs> treat. I mean, of course, there's still some development to be seen. This is just in the early days of this new expansion. But I, I got to throw it back over to, to Casanova and Scarza. Give us your final Final thoughts too. You were the ones that casted over that grand finals match. This was such a magnificent event. The production, the pomp and circumstance, all the players, as we talked to them and heard from them throughout this broadcast, were just so ecstatic to be part of this monumental occasion. They loved to showcase their love for the game and their favorite decks for all the world to see. The fact that I get to do a show with metal. Let's go. First of all, that's big. I absolutely love it. But secondly, I mean, the the favorite moment for me is just being able to stamp Aragorn into the the history of legends in Runeterra. Someone who is somewhat unknown to us coming in and having that just rise throughout the tournament. Us recognizing from the first day he played 
how insanely skilled he was and still questioning him because of this deck that he took all the way through until the final day where we're like, all right, this is the truth. This guy has it. He's going to take this and he took it over Teddy. Just an amazing day. And we're going to head back over to the desk. Thank you so much for allowing us to share our final thoughts with you. And big shout out once again to all the viewers at home for sticking with us throughout this awesome broadcast. Well, of course we have to get their final thoughts. We've got to get everybody's final thoughts here because what an incredible event to wrap up an exciting year for Legends of Runeterra. We've already crowned two world champions so far in this game's history, and I can't wait to see what's going to happen next. Thank you so much for talking us through all the action. Alan Boulevard, Silver Fuse, of course, Casanova and Skarzik as well. It's been such a pleasure to work with all of you. And thank you so much to our production staff and, of course, our players for putting on such an incredible show. I think we're all very inspired after what we've seen from our World Championship play this weekend. And thank you so much to all of our viewers at home as well for sticking out with us and crowning a new world champion. Can't wait to see what happens next. Thank you so much, and we'll see you guys next time. Well, let's get into this one. A surrender from Maddie 24 Mayo means Teddy will be moving on to the semifinals. Of and wow, reroll, what a game, what a series. No playable cards from Biotech means reroll gonna take it 2-0 over one of the favorites from the EMEA region. South Korea knocking out one of the EMEA competitors. We're seeing classic Shuriman mid-range beat down. Here comes the swing. Yeah, smooth still, so humble, glad to be in this position regardless, and Chenia celebrating, locking in that spot. It must feel fantastic for the Rost to actually make an appearance. Norm Teddy has just immediately turned on the gas with that champion strength, and he's going to push himself towards the grand final. Yeah. And Chenia not understanding the situation, not respecting the one-up, is going to move down to the lower bracket. And we have an all-EMEA finals between two undefeated competitors. And we've got the beast, Teddy. He took down an EU Masters. He took down a seasonal. Now he's coming for Worlds, going up against Aragorn, the young gun, trying to pull it off, stop what looked like maybe the biggest world ender to maybe it's a small world after all for Teddy. The sweep, every single part of it. Sin Fervor comes through. There's no response from Teddy. And Teddy is going to have that last gem he wanted for the Triple Crown, ripped away and given to the true king, returning and coming through to pick it up. The world champion is Aragorn.